بلشت دكتورة راحت الصورة هون هسا رجعت بس اوكي اه نبلش طيب قديش دقيقة هو بس اوكي نص ساعة خلص مش مشكلة بدون تايمر خلص بس اوكي بس اوكي نبلش يلا جود افترنون بروفيسور اوكي Uh, good afternoon, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, tonight, we would like to welcome everybody in our conference, second day. Uh, our distinguished speaker is uh, Professor Sven Becker. Uh, Professor Sven Becker studied medicine in uh, Mays in Germany, Paris, Madrid, and Tokyo. After retraining in pathology at Munich University, he completed op and gynae residency at Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital in Baltimore, USA. Uh, since two, 2012, he is the professor, uh, uh, director of Frankfurt University Women Hospital, as well as the division head of gynecological oncology and advanced gynecological surgery. He has a particular uh, interest in the uh, uh, surgical teaching and advancement of surgical training all over the world. He has been, uh, he has lectured uh, in over 20 uh, countries and performed lift surgery in Germany, United States, Greece, Belgium, Norway, Finland, Russia, Egypt, Sudan, India, and Philippines. Uh, his clinical focus uh, is, uh, is in advanced uh, laparoscopy and minimally invasive surgery. Uh, Professor Sven, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, can you start? The, yes. talk, uh, the talk, sorry, the talk is about FMI in ovarian cancer. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, very kind uh, introduction. Um, as you uh, heard, uh, I'm a GYN oncologist, so you know I treat patients with ovarian cancer. Uh, one of the uh, one of the pillars of treatment is is surgery, but uh, and we we you know we we've uh, seen a lot of advancement on that side. However, the more more exciting uh, um, advancement and improvements in our care for ovarian cancer patients has come on the medical side. So I know that a lot of medical oncologists are listening, and I do know that in, the, uh, in many parts of the world, including the Arab world, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the person most responsible for the treatment of ovarian cancer patients is actually the medical oncologist. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm very honored to be able to share some of this knowledge. I know a lot of these things you uh, already know, and you know, I'll try to summarize a little bit what the situation is, talking about genomic profiling in ovarian cancer. Um, I, I'm giving this lecture on behalf of Roche. Um, I do not own any stocks, uh, but I do work closely with the Roche company, simply because it's a great company. They do a lot of uh, exciting research, and they have helped us by introducing really uh, exciting medication. So let me continue with my talk here. As usual, it takes a little while for the first slide to move on. We should have tested that. Here we are. So this is a disclaimer from Roche. 
Let's talk about ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is generally not considered a very common cancer, certainly less common than breast cancer or, or lung cancer. But uh, there is a real uh, risk, a uh, lifetime risk of 1.3%. So, you know, it's less than 2%, but it's still there. And you can see looking at the different age ages that the probability uh, sort of increases with age, but it already at the age of 50, uh, 40, there is a real uh, age. Now, what's particularly important, I think that this is now really important because it can touch anyone uh, out there. If you have a first degree relative who has had ovarian cancer, your own risk of having ovarian cancer goes up by 50%. So if your mother has had ovarian cancer, if your sister has had ovarian cancer, you know, it automatically means that your risk goes up uh, to a 50, um, uh, uh, you know, by 50%. And uh, if you have a first degree relative with breast cancer, your risk also goes up, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, much less, uh, much less than that. Or it doesn't mean that your risk is 50% of having this cancer, but it does go up, you know. So we do know that there is a hereditary component in this. And by now, we already know that in many, many cases, it's the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations that are actually behind this. And, you know, obviously, you're familiar that these um, uh, cancer genes were diagnosed in the 90s as uh, being responsible for families that cluster breast cancer and ovarian cancer uh, risks. Now, our understanding of ovarian cancer up until this point still is based mostly on histology, which is, you know, pretty amazing considering this is a technology that was developed over 100 years ago. We're still basing our, our uh, assessment on what this cancer looks like on an H&E uh, coloring. You know, we gain tissue, we, we give it to the pathologist, and he or she tells us what's going on. And uh, when we talk about ovarian cancer, we really should be more precise. What we're really talking about is epithelial ovarian cancer, which is 90%. There's some other very rare cancers, and, you know, we do have a hard time treating those because there are not a lot of studies about that. But there are a lot of studies on epithelial ovarian cancer, which then, you know, can be subdivided into serous, endometrial, mucinous, clear cell. These are the main four types. Again, serous epithelial ovarian cancer is the most common type. And then serous, like in almost any other ovarian cancer, we distinguish between the low-grade tumor and the high-grade tumor. And there's some pathological theories about where these ovarian cancers come from. The low-grade, we believe it could originate in the fallopian tube, uh, um, epithelium um, um, and uh, it's uh, classic uh, in its appearance and then you know we have the most aggressive which is high grade serous which if you talk about ovarian cancer you know you should out of ovarian cancer most of the time you're talking about high grade type 2 serous epithelium ovarian cancer now um, stage at diagnosis and survival varies but the truth is if you look at it here i think this is the most important part of this slide 51 percent is diagnosed at stage three 29% is diagnosed at stage four. As we look at the slide, you know, we should pause for a moment to, to remember that the most common cancer of all cancers, really, um, 100 years ago was cervical cancer, okay? And uh, people didn't live long enough to get any other kind of cancer, and cervical cancer really touched young people. And, you know, you can see, at least, uh, you know, in, in uh, my country, in Germany, that the introduction of screening uh, and hopefully, you know, looking at it prospectively, the introduction of HPV vaccination will have made cervical cancer, uh, you know, a historic cancer. It's almost a historic cancer just based on screening. And it will continue to be so. So, you know, we, we've we had some major successes against cancer. But going back to ovarian cancer, there's no screening for ovarian cancer. There have been huge trials involving you know, 50,000 patients and more, and there's just no way we can screen. And unfortunately, most of the time our patients present, they are presenting at an advanced stage. That's again, true for high-grade serous ovarian cancer, whereas the other cancers are usually diagnosed at an earlier stage. So what, how do we treat this? This slide is a little bit busy. Let me take you through it. Uh, once there's initial suspicion, very often, again, it's an internist who will see the patient, you know, she will complain about non-specific problems, GI problems, CT scan is being done and something is being seen. And then at some point she's being referred, hopefully to do oncologist or gynecologist. The NCCN guidelines then say, okay, do imaging, do tumor markers. CA125 is a very, very good marker for ovarian cancer, but can also be elevated in other situations. Take a family history, uh, and consider BRCA1-2 status te testing, you know, 
Um, all these are preparatory measures, but at the same time, the true next step is evaluation of the disease stage, at which time you will then decide about primary treatment. This is what I do every day. The discussion at this point, looking at the patient, the age, the ECOG status will be, what are you going to do, surgery first? or uh, uh, followed by chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery followed by neoadjuvant chemotherapy and you know that there's a huge discussion about this germany has a very focal gyn oncologist community they always say do surgery first unless there are exceptional circumstances however our esteemed colleagues from france whom i know very well you know, they tell me, you know what, 70% of our ovarian cancer patients are being treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy first. So either way, this is what you have to decide with the patient. Chemotherapy is still the backbone of the treatment. So pathologic staging uh, is required, and then that is followed, and this is international standard, by platinum-based therapy. Usually it's carboplatinum with paclitaxel. And uh, that is in most or in many countries, but not in all countries, uh, used to be uh, complemented by bevacizumab treatment. And bevacizumab obviously is a medication from Roche. After that, and these are the exciting, uh, you know, new developments uh, of the past uh, five years, or really the past, you know, 24 months. There is now available, other than bevacizumab uh, maintenance therapy. Uh, based on the Paola trial, you can give uh, um, bevacizumab together with Olaparib, a PARP inhibitor, uh, or, or depending on where your patient falls, and this is what we're going to talk about, you can also uh, um, add um, Niraparib. Both of them are PARP inhibitors. And these PARP inhibitors really are at the core of why we are meeting and why we're discussing this, because, you know, we haven't had a lot of options for our ovarian cancer patients other than the well-established platinum containing chemotherapy, but that has completely changed over the past five years, and indeed, some of the you know, results are spectacular. So, BRCA1-2 testing has been well-established, at least in uh, many countries, even though it remains tricky. And even for me, you know, in, in Germany, it's very expensive, it's not uh, you know, it's not a simple blood draw, but it does require some, you know, some management. And on the other hand, complementary molecular testing is, you know, advancing. And this is part of what we're going to be talking about. Now, we look at what's being recommended with regard to, to you know, not just staging surgery standard treatment, but looking at genetic risk, BRCA1, 2 testing or other molecular testing, because all this has been triggered now by the thought process behind PARP inhibition therapy. We see that different guidelines, NCCN, ESMO, ASCO, NICE, which is the Great Britain, uh, you know, they uh, they vary, but most of the time they recommend genetic risk assessment, family history, most of the time they recommend BRCA1 or 2 testing. With regard to other testing, the, there are differences, and, you know, we'll see how Roche with the Foundation 1 test can uh, aid in that particular area. I've already told you that the big new thing for us making a true impact on our patients so amazing that I can actually see it at an individual as is PARP inhibitors, okay? Now, what are we doing with PARP inhibitors at this point? What is the most up-to-date treatment recommendation? NCCN guideline says in the frontline therapy, meaning surgery has happened, chemotherapy has been completed, Maintenance therapy, they recommend Olaparib plus or minus Bevacizumab or Niraparib as a, a maintenance therapy, stage two to four. However, in the ASCO guidelines, they are reluctant to recommend for stage two. Okay, that already is an interesting point, which sometimes, you know, I face when, when uh, counseling patients. But again, since most patients are stage three, everyone recommends the treatment for stage uh, three. Okay. So the ASCO guidelines are a little bit more specific. They say Olaparib, those with germline or somatic pathogenic or likely pathologic variants in BRCA1 and 2, whereas Neuroparib can be given to all women. I'm very happy, hopefully, to answer some questions with regard to why there's this distinction. ESMO guidelines uh, say, you know, give Olaparib, Neuroparib, Brucaparib as maintenance therapy uh, in the recurrent situation. And here, uh, um, uh, Olaparib, Rukavari can actually be given as monotherapy to patients with BRC1 or 2 mutations. So, looking at recurrence now, 
situation changes, we have one more PARP inhibitor, which is Rucabarib. Uh, and those are the three that we have at this point that are being used or have been evaluated in ovarian cancer. Again, the primary situation, we have Olaparib plus minus Bevacizumab or Niraparib, depending on the genetic testing that we're going to talk about. Whereas in the recurrent situation, we have all three. Olaparib and Rucabarib are actually, you know, ha have been approved to be used as monotherapy, which shows how strongly they work uh, as monotherapy, uh, even without a chemotherapy. Just a sort of a glimpse at, at the ever-changing and more complex world of treatment. So what about, what you know, what's this all about? Ultimately, this is about DNA damage repair. And when, when you know, just as, as uh, lung cancer treatment or melanoma treatment has been revolutionized by immune checkpoint inhibition, and we have not seen that same effect in ovarian cancer, uh, on the other hand, PARP inhibition is something that is particularly effective for ovarian cancer. So the question comes up, why is that? You know, the, and at the heart of that is that uh, is DNA damage repair. These pathways are heavily mutated in epithelial ovarian cancer, not so much in the cancers that I just mentioned of breast cancer. Okay, now what are we talking about? The um, Nobel Prizes for this were actually handed out only five, six years ago. So I think it was 2015, uh, and, um, and in recognition of of the impact that the understanding of DNA repair has had. Uh, in therapeutic terms. So let's go over these pathways because for anyone dealing with medical oncology, you know, they're going to become more and more important uh, as we add other medications like PARP inhibition, you know, to help us uh, in, in, in weakening DNA repair in tumors that are already weakened. So let's talk about this. BER is basic scission repair. And uh, in basic scission repair, PARP uh, um, uh, the, the PARP enzyme is actually a key player. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of ovarian cancers exhibit polymorphosis and altered expression of BER components. Just to show you this, that you know the scope of how important this is. This is why uh, ovarian cancer is susceptible to PARP inhibition. Then we have non-hololose end joining, which is a treatment of double strand breaks, whereas Basic scission repair obviously is a treatment of single strand breaks. You know, we do have to go back a little bit to our DNA to cell molecular biology. Now, then we have homologous recombination, which uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a key uh, and it's going to be a focus of the remainder of the talk. Uh, and in and, and this particular part, it's BRCA1 and 2, very, very old genes that are at the heart of the homologous recombination repair mechanism and also at the heart of what we call homologous recombination deficiency, HRD. There are other, um, see, I changed this, should have done that. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay, so, no, let's go back, hold on. So 50% of ovarian cancer have a dysfunctional homologous recombination system. And again, uh, you know, that is a key point. And then uh, we uh, have um, um, the uh, nucleotide excision repair uh, as a different mechanism. And then we have mismatch repair. Now, why am I showing you these different uh, mechanisms? Because resistance towards treatment like PARP plays mostly on the cell's ability to find different ways to repair DNA. Okay. So even though a cancer cell might be weakened in one way and might be doubly weakened, that's what we call synthetic lethality, uh, there are other ways to repair DNA. And as we know, if there are an alternative pathways, then resistance works to activating alternative pathways. And this is where multi-targeted uh, uh, ther uh, therapy, multi-agent uh, 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 multi targeted therapy will, I believe, play an important part. And this is where we can already see now that an understanding of where we find mutations that could be potential targets will be the key in future trials and future treatment of ovarian cancer. So cytotoxic chemotherapies induce particular forms of DNA damage, and these trigger sp uh, specific repair pathways. 
this is what's happening in uh, ovarian cancer. And the reason why ovarian cancer is so susceptible to platinum containing chemotherapy is precisely because platinum also weakens DNA. So in a system where DNA repair is weakened, platinum is particularly effective, which is why platinum is such an important part of the treatment of ovarian cancer. So cancers with DNA repair deficiencies show increased sensitivity to certain meaning platinum containing uh, chemotherapies. DNA repair, targeted therapies exploit DNA repair defect in cancer cells. You know, that's what I just said. If the cancer cell, which we always see as very strong and aggressive, uh, it's actually a flawed cell. It has defects, it must have, because you know, it does contain mutations and important genes. So if this cell is weakened in terms of DNA repair, then you know, weakening the DNA repair generally will lead to a better oncologic uh, outcome. And that's what PARP inhibition does, basically. Let's go back to the three PARP uh, inhibitors that we have for ovarian cancer, olaparib, rucaparib, nuraparib. And you can see that depending on the studies that they came with, they have uh, different um, uh, uh, indications by FDA or EMA uh, or EMA. What does PARP do? I already told you, we talked about basic decision repair. PARP inhibition can disrupt DNA damage repair, particularly in cells that are homologous recombination, homologous repair deficient. And these are classical cells with BRC mutation, but not only. Let me show you graphically what this is. And I'm sure all, you are all familiar with it, but I found that, you know, you need to reflect about it a little while to, to be sure that you actually, you know, understand it. So you have a normal cell without PARP inhibition, a, a single strand break will be uh, uh, repaired by PARP, you know, the enzyme, the repair enzyme. And uh, then, uh, you know, through basic system repair, the cell will be corrected and will survive. Now we add PARP inhibition to the system PARP inhibition doesn't work, basic system repair doesn't work, the cell looks for another way and finds it in BRCA1 and 2 uh, repair, so that's homologous recombination repair, the cell survives. What's the situation in the cancer cell? We give PARP inhibition, meaning that, you know, basic system repairs cannot be repaired as efficiently. Now, if our cell also has a BRCA1 and 2 mutation, and we've already seen that that is the case for many ovarian cancer cells. If, you know, then that the cells attempt to repair these PARP uh, uh, placed defects is also impaired and the cell dies. Okay, so I cannot stress to you how important this part is because what you realize is that PARP inhibition actually leads to an accumulation of single strand breaks, which then eventually, you know, if you have enough single strand breaks, you're going to end up having double strand breaks. And these double strand breaks in the classical ovarian cancer cell cannot be repaired, leading to what's called synthetic letality. However, it also leads to the major side effect, because as you know, there's a small group of patients which will develop a leukemia after being treated with PARP inhibition. And, you know, I'm happy to answer questions about this. So, BRCA1 and 2 alterations are the most well-known homologous recombination deficiency etiology. So anything that impairs the complex process of homologous uh, recombination, homologous uh, recombination repair, uh, um, will lead to homologous uh, repair deficiency. And what are these genes? That's what we're going to focus on now. BRCA1 and 2 alterations remain the strongest markers of PARP sensitivity. 40%, 70%, you know, of patients in this court are not going to respond as well as we would hope. Why is that? Because there are several mechanisms of resistance involving DNA repair pro proteins, such as, and, you know, unfortunately, these are names that we need to remember and recognize, ATM, ATR, uh, DNRPK, mRNA complex, RAD51, and then CHECK1, CHECK2. All of these are part of the homologous recombination complex, as we shall see, and you know they are genes that are um, uh, able to to also provide uh, you know resistance. This is a busy slide, but it's worth looking at it. Okay, it just shows us a little bit how you know how ovarian cancer, high grade serous ovarian cancer, that is, is divided up. Let me take you through it. We have homologous recombination deficient. Most of these are BRCA1 germline mutations or BRCA1 somatic mutations, BRCA2 germline mutations, BRCA2 somatic mutations. 
than their BRCA1 promoter methylations. This just shows you, just this shows you how complex the world of BRCA mutation really is. Then there are the genes that I just mentioned, CDK1-12 uh, uh, mutations, RAD51C promoter methylation, then there are um, uh, you know, homologous regulation uh, DNA damage gene mutations, and these are, you know, all of them lead to homologous recombination deficient cells. Possibly, you know, we have P10, we have MC, uh, these are possibly homologous recombination deficient. Then we have uh, others, which might be through other mechanisms, um, um, uh, have a de deficient uh, RNA um, mechanism. We can see the uh, uh, the uh, NER mutations. Uh, sorry, let's go back. Uh, others, and then we have a group that is uh, bigger than you know 25 percent, which uh, is uh, interesting in that they don't react to PARP inhibition at all or hardly, and they are exemplified by a, a cycling E1 amplification. And this, you know, there's a lot of research going on in that group because these are the ones that have failed to really benefit from our advances. So let's talk about homologous recombination deficiency in epithelial ovarian cancer. You know, five years ago, I probably would have been able to pronounce homologous recombination deficiency, you know, for ovarian cancer, but now it has become the heart of what we actually um, do. We already see we have proficient, we have uh, deficient, and, you know, how do we tell the difference? First of all, if you look at the frequency homologous recombination deficiency coronary histologic subtype, we see that again, Ceres, you know, will be our same mutations, loss of hyperversigosity in about 45%, homologous recombination gene mutations, 27%, uh, and 30%. And that is sort of top of the line. If you look at mucinous, you see that this is why mucinous doesn't really respond to PARP inhibition all that great, neither does uh, endometriate. They are just, they just do not have the same scale of mutations in that particular. Homologous recombination deficiency, PARP inhibition, epithelial ovarian cancer. So what do we need to know? There are many. What do we need to know? And this is why a test like, you know, uh, the um, uh, Foundation One test offers a, sort of a, a peek into the future and even a step into the future. Um, there are currently many therapies in preclinical and clinical development that target certain DNA repair related proteins. So we're not just talking about PARP inhibition. Um, um, we are talking about inhibitors that target other ways of DNA repair. And I think I've tried to explain to you why that is essential because we hope that this will complement PARP inhibition and also help uh, uh, us against their resistance. This is basically the principle behind it. We have a homologous regulation deficient tumor. Then we have PARP treatment. Remember, you know, how that uh, leads to increased amount of, of uh, single strand breaks that are not being repaired. However, pre-existing or acquired resistant cells survive. And this, we hope, is the future. This is not the reality yet. This is the future. There's studies, phase one, phase two studies looking at this. If we could also target resistance causing mechanisms, MDR1 inhibitors, HR inhibitors, radiotherapy, uh, ATR, ATM inhibitors, uh, that, you know, hope is that we uh, can pick up the momentum created by PARP inhibition and actually, you know, uh, create uh, even uh, better benefits. And that's where Foundation One comes in, because to identify these other genes that are potentially um, uh, mutated and that can add up to the diagnosis of homologous recombination deficiency, you need, you know, a solid test able to look at, at hundreds of, of uh, genes. And these two genes, uh, Roche asked me to, uh, to uh, these two tests to, to, uh, to introduce your foundation one. I'm sure you're familiar with this. And then, you know, obviously the holy grail of oncology, the ability to actually make a, do a genetic analysis based on the blood sample, because we do know that there's a lot more tumor DNA circulating than we thought. In addition, both assays, assays allow for screening of alterations in genes involved in DNA repair pathways such as, you know, ATM, ATR, and RAT51. And this is why this is part of our lecture. How to evaluate homologous recombination deficiency and identify patients that will benefit from PARP inhibition therapy. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, alterations in homologous recombination genes other than can lead to homologous recombination deficiency. And that can confer, based also on the studies that we've seen, uh, sensitivity to PARP inhibition. Uh, the term that's being used, other than homologous recombination deficiency, is BRCA-NAS. You know, 
We used to use that term. I think Brakanas has been substituted mostly by uh, the, the more generic term, uh, general term, homologous recombination deficiency. So this can be tested on germline, you know, germline uh, and or somatic uh, changes, uh, evaluation of what's called a genomic scar. Now, what's a genomic scar? Basically, if you look at the genome, uh, loss of heterozygosity, if you find that a lot of defects, visible defects of DNA are not being repaired, obviously that's a surrogate marker for a def deficient DNA repair system. And then finally, uh, homologous recombination deficiency score needs to be calculated and that there's a big you know discussion about who should do that at least in Germany and uh, there are different tests that are uh, so-called companion di uh, diagnose diagnostics that are being uh, proposed. FDA interestingly always um, uh, um, grants uh, um, uh, you know a permission for one specific companion test whereas the EMA is never specific on this. So Foundation one can detect loss of hydrosugosity, and then they use a cutoff, which is, you know, based on the studies that they have, loss of hydrosugosity high, meaning more than 16% of cells involved, suggests the presence of homologous generation deficiency. And obviously, you know, BRCA1 and 2 are also known. Let's skip ahead just a little bit. Here we go. So BRCA1 and 2. Now, this is something that's important to remember. It's a little bit tricky. We have to remember that um, survival is better in patients with BRC1 and 2 mutations. Okay, so you know, in a way, it's strange to say that you know because the mutated cancer gives the patient a better prognosis. But if we think about it, you know, the uh, BRC1 2 mutation within this, be it germline or be it somatic, weakens the ovarian cancer. Uh, because the ovarian cancer, like every living thing, relies on DNA repair. And you can see here how different the, uh, the prognosis is. And you, we have to be careful not to mix up the effect that our treatment has with the uh, subgroup that has a better survival um, anyway. Let's talk about some specific studies where the Foundation 1 test was involved. It was not involved in all the studies. It was not involved in the Paola study, uh, which explains why they have a different testing system for uh, for uh, within that context. So uh, Rucaparib was tested in the RL2 and RL3 trials, uh, and um, these were international classic trials, uh, start first in recurrent ovarian cancer. And I do want you to to pause for a moment and take a look here um, at the uh, you know at the difference. Uh, BRC mutated. Um, you know, loss of hydrosy high, loss of hydrosy low. And uh, over response rate here, uh, you can see, you know, is quite a difference. Let's take a look here. Higher efficacy of rucavirucin, BRCA1 demutated, low highlighting the importance of analyzing homologous recombination deficiency status. So this is basically the outcome of these uh, studies. And for this study, the foundation uh, medicine test was uh, used. Now in area three, we see a uh, you know um, a phase three study looking at basically at the same uh, story. And uh, what is uh, uh, remarkable, you know, is that you can see the uh, difference in in uh, in survival in these groups. So Rucavirib maintains through proof pro progression of survival in all patient groups, but the magnus through the benefit correlated with the loss of hydrosugosity. Okay, so we see that PARP inhibition works. There's a small subgroup where it doesn't seem to work at all. There's a group where it works really well, and then there's sort of the middle middle ground. Okay, that's basically that. That's what what we see. Let's take another look at different study. The Nova studies look at niraparib in the uh, uh, um, maintenance treatment here uh, of recurrent ovarian cancer. So you see they changed it, mutated, uh, wild type, homologous recombination positive, homologous recombination negative, and I think here, you know, it's the, 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 this is really maybe the most impressive slide because it shows you know what we're um, it shows you what we you know what we're looking at. You look at this here in the in the germline breast cancer BRCA mutated near upper rib group median progression for survival was twenty one months versus placebo five point five months. So this is the effect that PARP inhibition really has. And if you think that, you know, I've been a little bit too enthusiastic, I mean, how can you not be enthusiastic when you see 
you know, numbers like that. And this just goes down. Uh, even in wild type, we have an effect, but the effect is much, much more pronounced in uh, in uh, in uh, those cells that are particularly suitable for that. And here in wild type or somatic mutated and homologous recombination def uh, deficient, again, you can see a tremendous improvement of progression-free survival, which are also has been translated into um, disease-free survival. So neuroperp maintains therapy improved in all patient groups, which is true. But again, you know, most uh, the pronounced effect was seen in uh, the homologous recombination deficient group. So, you know, how are we going to define that? Characterization of HRD and paired primary recurrent uh, serous ovarian cancer. So, you know, we can see high HRD scores in all tumor samples with mutations. And these were more prevalent than mutations of BRCA1 and 2, suggesting that HRD testing allows for the identification of more tumors with possible deficiencies. Okay, so when we talk about homologous recombination deficiency, I think the key thing is to understand, sure, every BRCA1 or 2 mutated cell, be it wild, you know, germline or somatic, has automatically homologous recombination deficiency because BRCA1 or 2 are just at the heart of homologous recombination uh, repair. But, you know, there's a much bigger group that is defined by loss of hydrocygosity, but also by the presence of specific mutated genes that also, uh, you know, support homologous recombination. And these genes, again, are being detected by huge uh, uh, tests, such as, you know, GCP, comprehensive gen genomic profiling test. And that's essentially what foundation one uh, is here. NGS, that's what behind this. I wrote next generation profiling, but that's not what I mean. I mean, next generation sequencing. And of course, you know, Holy Grail already talked about this liquid biopsy. So this is being tested in many, many cancers. And, you know, the ability of a, a liquid biopsy, meaning just drawing blood of the patient to detect these mutations, obviously would solve a lot of problems. Because in oncology, very often in a certain situation of recurrence, I want to know what's going on with the tumor. But it's not as easy as it sounds to get tissue um, um, and uh, to find a way to do this in a liquid based, you know, I think Roche needs to be recommended to spend tremendous amounts of research money in, you know, finding that, which I believe everyone knows is going to be the future, but again, methodologically is, is still uh, being uh, developed. So, um, NGS has become the gold standard in a way to um, detect these mutations. Uh, other tests, loss of hydrocygosity, they are indirect tests. So, you know, knowing which genes are mutated is really, uh, really a uh, key. So we need to test for other DNA repair related to genes. And basically that's what, uh, you know, you need a, a, a test for that uh, offers comprehensive genetic uh, profile. Let's look at the details. The mechanism underlying BRCA are varied. They include germline somatic alterations in other DNA repair genes. I think we've said that a couple of times, but I think it's also important in a lecture like that to have a certain sense of rep uh, repetition. The spectrum of alterations includes RAD51C, RAD51D, BART, BRIPUL, PULP2, MLH. You know, these are the mismatch repairs. So you can see all of a sudden we are entering a world where we need to familiarize ourselves with these genes. Sometimes I wonder whether we can do it. Honestly, you know, because uh, the there's just no end to this. You know, we look at 50 genes. We sometimes sit in the tumor board and it just, it gets so tired. Look at the gene. What does the gene mean? Are there any trials? Are there any specific, uh, you know, inhibitors that are uh, out there? All of this, obviously, outside the context of uh, FDA or EMA um, uh, approval. But these are options that our patients have if we know about them. And uh, the way to know about them is to test for these alterations, okay? So even though we might not have a BARD inhibitor yet, or we might not have, you know, a PALP2 as a target treatment, that's clearly where the future is, uh, is uh, headed. And if you see how much difference a single target therapy like PARP inhibition can actually make, you know, it really, you realize that, you know, something that we've known, this is the way uh, to go. So what about uh, loss of hydrocygosity? Well, it's an indirect test, and you know it can be due, and and uh, it's a uh, uh, genomic profile. It can also analyze these aspects. Um, 
but you know I, I can sense that you know we are sort of reaching the end of what you know can we, we can reasonably learn in one lecture so um, homologous recombination efficiency of ovarian cancers they act similar to ovarian cancers PRC related alterations so basically I've told you already that you know there's a strong link between those uh, two kinds so a high number of ovarian cancer patients harbor genetic alterations that are not related to DNA repair pathways so you know while we we exclusively talked about DNA repair pathways there is another murky world I should say where you know we look at different genes uh, um, uh, that uh, you know can be detected again only through comprehensive genetic profiling and there's a big debate going on particularly among medical oncologists you know who are at the forefront of, of advancing treatment does it make uh, sense to uh, um, does it make sense to 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 sequence more? Uh, do these molecular tumor buds make any sense at all? And I'm going to jump ahead to this slide here, where you can see genetic alterations. Okay, and I, I was going to say um, you know, it's the Sofitel trial because here I'm at the Dubai. I'm right now in Dubai attending a conference. Um, as I talked to you, um, uh, there was the, uh, um, the tr trial that was not the Sofitel trial, but the um, um, Safi trial, and they looked at, you know, do does knowledge about these different mutations, and you can see many of them, this is 25%, many of them occur in a very small subset. Does knowledge of these mutations alter our treatment, and could it potentially alter the prognosis? And the first, you know, signs are there that that actually could make a, a difference. But here, obviously, we're not talking about something that's already been established, which is PARP inhibition, uh, homologous recombination deficiency testing, uh, and, and the use of these three medications, olaparib, rucaparib, and, and niraparib. But this is really the future. But the future is based on us knowing what's going on inside of these uh, tumors. Uh, Professor, we are, come, we are uh, almost we're finished with time. To the end. I'm, all, I'm, I'm for, getting to the end. Um, uh, oh. Testing for, let me just finish. Testing for microsatellite instability is another aspect. That can be detected from these uh, comprehensive tests. Pembrolizumab doesn't work really well for ovarian cancer, but maybe it's just because we don't know any of this. However, again, genomic comprehensive genomic profiling can help for that uh, also. And actually, I think that this is my last slide. You know, uh, on behalf of Roche, uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, uh, again, um, it's been a great pleasure here to be invited to lecture to you. I'm, I'm you know, I'd love to be in Amman myself. Uh, some of my fellow doctors are from uh, Jordania, and it's always great working with them. And uh, with that, I conclude. We started a little bit late, so I actually am finishing five minutes before my time. Um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer those. I hope I gave you a, a good overview of ovarian cancer treatment. You know, uh, where's PARP inhibition? Why do we need to, you know, do gen uh, comprehensive genomic uh, profiling? And also. Uh, uh, you know, where the foundation medicines te test uh, come, comes in for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for this excellent talk. The floor is open for a few questions. Uh, please raise your hand if anybody has any question. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very comprehensive talk. Can I um, uh, ask about uh, the protocol in your center. If uh, somebody responded well to to platino, uh, platinal containing uh, uh, treatment, so if we want to maintain uh, patient on olaparib, so if it is uh, BRCA one, BRCA two negative, we can. Yeah, uh, this is according to your. Uh, we can maintain it with BRCA1 negative uh, patients? So you're, you're talking about, the, that's a very good question. I mean, you, yes. if you talk about the primary situation, your patient has had a diagnosis of high-grade serous ovarian cancer, you've done a primary debulking uh, or a neoadjuvant event concept. And, you know, then you need to decide, you know, does the patient have uh, BRCA1 or 2 mutation, either germline or, or, or uh, somatic? If the patient does have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, you know, you can treat that patient according to the Paola uh, um, um, setup, 
with bevacizumab and olaparib. And I have to say, you know, I didn't show the slides here because Foundation One wasn't used as the test here, but, you know, the, the survival benefit in that group is extraordinary. We see patients on this combination, maintenance therapy, olaparib uh, and bevacizumab, you know, for three years without a recurrence. It's pretty amazing. Then, you know, you can also, if they are BRCA1 or 2 negative, somatic and germline, you can do another test, and this is where Foundation 1 comes in. You can look at homologous recombination deficiency. Defining homologous recombination deficiency means loss of heterozygosity or mutations in specific genes. If you find that, uh, that you know, patient has homologous recombination deficiency, you can also give bevacizumab and olaparib. Okay, now I've... I've covered 50% of my high-grade serous ovarian cancer patients. Now, if I, you know, if the patient does not fall into any of these categories, I have a choice. I can either treat that patient with bevacizumab, or I can say, you know what, I believe bevacizumab is good, but not as good as a PARP inhibition. And for those patients, I can give niraparib, because curiously, niraparib was not tested together with bevacizumab and did not distinguish between the SPRCA1, 2, or homologous recombination deficiency stats. Okay, so these are the options that I now have. And a big question is why would we use the, why do we see an, an effect of nirapareb in, in a population where we didn't see an effect with olaparib? You know, there are a lot of theories about that. So that's the situation in, in my institution, uh, reflecting the situation in Germany. Uh, I think the time is finished. We would like to thank you, Professor, for your uh, precious time and for you joining us. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you very much. All the best to you, Congress. Hello, Dr. Jesus. Uh, are are you with us? Dr. Jesus, are you? Hello. Jesus, Coral. Dr. Coral, are you with us?
دكتور كورال أرود أص ولا ما أنا آه آه الله يخليك شكرا الله يخليك يا فندم
Hacer. Ah, uh, good afternoon. Sorry for the technical problem. We will be uh, delaying uh, the talk a few minutes. So we are contacting Spain with Dr. Carol. So we hope in a few minutes to start the Pfizer symposium session. Uh, don't Hello. Okay. Yes, uh, Doctor Carol, are are you with us? Yes. Yes. Sorry about okay. that. It has been impossible for me for my own computer, and the problem is I don't have the presentation in my computer from the uh, clinic, but I can. Uh, so it's okay. We can we start? Are you uh, uh, ready? Uh, we can start the session. Yeah, but someone can, you hear can us? share so, my yeah, someone so, can share my presentation. You, okay. 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 Uh, we'll start, uh, Dr. Carol. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we'll start the Pfizer uh, symposium. Uh, it's uh, our pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Jesus Carroll from Spain. He's a medical oncology consultant uh, at University de Navarra uh, Thoracic Center Unit, Madrid, Spain, and also he's an associate professor at University San Pablo, Madrid, Spain. He had his medical oncology degree and master degree from Spain and his master in biomedical research and clinical trials and drug development at Royal Marsden, UK. And also he trained at MD Anderson Cancer Center, USA. 
He's an active member of many societies, medical societies, national and international, and he's an author of more than 50 papers in, in high prestigious journal, 14 books and more than 100 uh, national international meeting abstracts focused on thoracic uh, malignancy, diagnosis and treatment. His talk will be a new EGFR targeted therapy enters the non-small cell lung cancer treatment landscape. So Dr. Carol, uh, welcome to start your talk. So thank you very much. It's a privilege for me to, to be part of this Jordanian Society of Hematology Congress. Uh, thanks a lot, Pfizer, for the kind invitation. I'm going to share my uh, screen. Um, yes, sir, please, uh, just to press on this here. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. My screen now, yeah? Yes, yes, okay. So, uh, I'm going to talk about a new EGFR target therapy in the non-small cell lung cancer landscape. And this is my disclosure slide, and this is the background of the presentation I'm going to follow during the next minutes. Uh, as an introduction, uh, you know very well the prevalence of the EGFR mutation in Caucasian people is around 10-15% and is up to 40-50% in Asian population. Uh, all you know very well the clinical and pathological characteristics of this kind of patients. Basically, in the clinic, most of them are female, never a smoker, uh, adenocarcinoma histology in stage 4. And it's very well known the radiological pattern or disease with a bilateral lung nodes, bone meds, and between 20 and 25% of the patient have asymptomatic brain metastasis. So it's so important in this population to include at baseline a CT scan or MRI of the brain to eliminate the possibility of brain metastasis. 90% of the EGFR detected by the standard of diagnosis, the PCR, are localized in exon 19 and exon 21, and that's called the sensitizing or common mutation. It's very important to make the difference between the exon 19 and exon 21 at the diagnosis because we are going to see along the presentation how the prognosis of our patient is going to be completely different if a different exon 19 or exon 21 independently of the treatment you choose. And we are going to see patients with exon 21 have a, a poor prognosis in terms of PFS and overall survival. We are using actually the NDA in the diagnosis at baseline, and we have learned two important things with the NDS. The first one is EGFR mutation can coexist with another targetable alteration, for example, our translocation, cross one, and that's a problem in the clinic because we don't know very well how to treat this patient. And the other important point, and it's going to be important along the presentation, EGFR mutation can coexist with another commutation with a prognosis value, and that's going to be important in the near future in the selection of the treatment for our patients. Here you can see in this slide how is the landscape actually in non-small cell lung cancer EGFR mutant patients. We have seven available treatment options, actually two first-generation TKI, Jefitini and Nalotini, two second-generation TKIs, Dacomitini and Afatini, and one third-generation TKI of Simertini, and the options to combine first-generation TKI with chemotherapy based on platinum and first-generation TKI with antiangiogenic agents, bevacizumab or ramuzumab. We are going to focus the presentation in the options available in our countries, the first generation, the second generation, and the third generation TKIs in the first line. From my point of view, and I think it should be the three objectives to consider to treat this population, the main objectives to treat EGFR population should be the first one, use drug, increasing the progression free survival as compared with the standard of care. The second objective should be try to improve the overall survival using a sequence, a biological sequence of treatment. 
And the third one, very important one, to use drug with a tolerable toxicity profile and no detrimental effect in the quality of life of our patient. Based on the three objectives, we're going to analyze what happened with the new EGFR-TKI second generation dacomitinib. Dacomitinib, you can see, is a second generation irreversible EGFR-TKI that produce a preclinical inhibition different from first generation and third generation TKI. You can see on the right of the slide how dacomitinib produce an improvement in the uh, uh, inhibition in preclinical model and cell lines in exon 21 EGFR mutation as compared with first generation TKI or third generation. And it's very similar the potential inhibition in exon 21 as compared with first or third. Another important difference with the committee is not producing an inhibition of the T79 TN mutation. The only inhibition is with osimertinib, I remember osimertinib was designed to make an inhibition of the resistant mechanism when you use first on set or second generation at first. Another important point in the preclinical profile of the committee is the inhibition of R2 and R4, and that's probably related when you compare first generation versus second generation, the important benefit in the PFS and the duration of response. And the last important point from a preclinical point of view is that committee as a second generation TKI and very similar what's happening with afatinib produce higher inhibition in the wall type portion of the EGFR uh, mutant. So that's related with a higher toxicity we are going to see with the second generation as compared with the first or the third generation TKI. Here you can see uh, Two trial, two phase two and three trial with preliminary results uh, with the uh, committee in unselected and selected patient. Uh, up front of the slide, the ARCH1009 trial was a trial in unselected population, no EGFR mutant people, pretreated population comparing directly the committee as second generation TKI versus Arlotini. And you can see how the committee was identical in overall subalba versus arlotinib in unselected no EGFR patients Newton. The arch 17 trial is a phase two trial in the first line setting using dacomitinib in selected population EGFR Newton, 49 patients in the first line setting and you can see how the committee in this scenario get an overall response rate of 75 percent with a PFS of 18 months and a median overall survival of 40 months. That was the rationale to design the all known uh, trial RCH1050 trial. The phase three trial in the first line setting comparing the committee versus first generation TKI Jefitini. Inclusion criteria patient with non small cell lung cancer, stage four, no CNS disease no prior chemo or EGFR TKI, patient with ECO01 uh, 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 and no TKI before. Patient were randomized to dacomitinib 45 milligram OD until intolerance or progression of the disease versus yefitinib 250 milligram OD. Stratification factor are very important because we are going to analyze the endpoints according to that and it was raised uh, comparing ASEAN versus non ASEAN people and EGFR mutation type, exon 19 versus exon 21. Primary endpoint, PFS. Secondary endpoint, the key one was uh, overall survival. And we analyzed as well overall response rate, duration of response, uh, safety, and quality of life. Here you can see the primary objective, the PFS published in Lancet Oncology in 2017, and you can see how the committee improved uh, the pre-FS as compared with Jefitini with a hazard ratio of 0.59 and a median of 14.7 months versus Jefitini 9.6 months. And you can see on the right how the benefit in PFS 
was in all population, including the stratification factor, independently of the race and independently the benefit of the type of mutation. This is the secondary key endpoint of a survivor published in 2019. And again, you can see how the second generation TKI that community produced an important and significant improvement in overall survival, 34 months versus 27 months with gefitinib, with a hazard ratio in this case of 0.75. And you can see on the right how the maximum benefit of dacomitinib was in patients from Asia and patients with uh, exon 21 mutation. When we analyze the overall survival, it's important to know how is the mechanism or resistance of our treatment and as well, how many patients go ahead with second or further lines. You see, and you can uh, know on the left on, in the slide, the main mechanism of resistance with the second generation TKI that committee is so similar uh, as compared with the first generation and afatini is the development of the t 1798 mutation in about 50% of the people. And you know the result of the AURA3 trial comparing in patient developing the t 1798 mutation or simertini versus chemotherapy with a benefit with osimertinib and a median PFS of 10 months. On the right, you can see how, how many patients go ahead with second line inside the ARCH1050 trial, around 55% of the patient go ahead and about 20% of the patient developing the T1790 mutation and go ahead with osimertinib in the second line setting. It's incredible from my point of view how when you use the comitinib in the first line scenario, patient develop the T1790 mutation and use osimertinib in the second line, how the overall survival in patient with exon 19 was not reached and it was almost 45 months in patient exon 21. Remember, in overall population was 30, 34 months and is more than 10 months in patient with the poor prognosis exon 21. Another secondary objective was overall response rate and duration of response. You can see here how the response rate between dacomitinib and gefitinib was identical, but again, the duration of response probably related with the inhibition of dacomitinib in R2 and R4 different from gefitinib is longer, 14.8 months versus 8.3 months with the first generation TKI. Here you can see the toxicity profile and say before, according to the uh, preclinical uh, profile of the comitin, the toxicity with the second generation is higher as compared with gefitinib, around 50% of grade 3, 4 toxicity as compared with 30% with the first generation TKI. Toxicity profile between the comitin and the other second generation TKI is so similar with afatinib and is mainly based on diarrhea, mucositis, uh, rust, and paronychias. On the right, you can see how is the chronology of this toxicity along the treatment. Most of the toxicity with the comitin is going to happen during the first month on treatment. The first toxicity we are going to see is the more frequent and the early toxicity is the diarrhea and is the second cause of severity and is around the first week on treatment. It's followed by stomatitis and the main one because it's going to be the more severe and the main cause of uh, those reduction is going to be the rash. The rash is around the second week on treatment and we are preparing actually an abstract is going to be presented in the next World Lung Cancer Congress, how there is a correlation between the toxicity with dacomitinib, patient developing grade two or more toxicity with DACO, they have more PFS and more overall survival. Finally, the last uh, toxicity we can uh, present with dacomitinib at the later one is going to be the paronychia and it's going to be important because that is different from first generation and third generation TKI and paronychia in our 1050 trial was the second cause of those reduction in this population. 
Overall, in the RT1050 trial, 65% of our patients need a dose reduction from 45 mg to 30 mg and from 30 mg to 15 mg. Patients developing the uh, toxicity and needed their dose reduction, you can see on the right how the dose reduction was correlated with a lower incidence of side effects and there is no a detrimental effect in overall survival independently of the patient need a dose reduction from 45 milligram to 30 or from 30 to uh, 15 milligram. And you can see in the last update analysis in overall survival how independently patient need a dose reduction, the overall survival in patient with exon 19 was not reached and it was at 40 months in patient with exon 21. There is so controversial uh, why if patients improve survival independently, they need a dose reduction from 45 to 30 and from 30 to 15, why not to start with lower dose of dacomitinib from the beginning? Here you can see how uh, some confidential data from Pfizer and how the maximum biological dose producing a more inhibition in preclinical model was with 45 milligram, and that's why it was the dose election uh, in, in, in the scenario of the RCH1050 trial. And we know actually a phase two study uh, promoted by the Singapore Cancer Center, they are using a dose starting with 30 milligram, and after one month of treatment, they uh, randomized patient to continue with 30 milligram or increase to 45 milligram. And they are going to analyze the toxicity and the efficacy with the two level of those. Another important secondary point is the quality of life. If the secondary point that committing it is more toxic, that's related with a more uh, uh, incremental in the quality of life or not. You can see here how the, the quality of life between the committee and uh, Jefitini was identical independently of the higher toxicity related with the second generation. And on the right, you have the update analysis of the quality of life published last year in Future Oncology. And you can see how longer is the use of the committee, longer is the benefit of the symptoms related with the disease, and the longer use with the committee is correlated with the benefit in quality of life as compared with Jefitini. The result of the ARCH1050 trial have included the committee in all the clinical guidelines, the NCC guideline, the ESMO guideline, and on the right, you can see the national Spanish uh, guidelines. And in all the guidelines, the committee have the same level of evidence category 1A. Is the committee the only options we have in the first line? No, we have first generation TKI, Jefitini and Erlotini, and we have another second generation TKI, Afatini, and we have a new third generation TKI of Smartini. So we have direct comparison between first and second generation, and we know second is better than first, and we have direct comparison between first and third generation, but we have, we don't have direct comparison and we don't have clinical trials comparing second or third generation. So we are going to analyze the data about efficacy, sequence and toxicity and quality of life according to the different options we have available in Jordania and in Spain with the first generation TKI, the second generation and the third generation. Here you have the data in PFS we have with all the available options we have in our countries. Remember, first generation erlotinib and jefitinib were compared with chemotherapy, demonstrating an improvement in PFS in terms of 10, 11 months and a hazard ratio of 0 0.5. Afatini was compared with chemotherapy with the same level of evidence in Laxland 3 and Scans, and it has been compared with the first generation TKI Jefitini in the Laxland 7 trial with an improvement in PFS, in this case with a median of 11 months and a hazard ratio of 0 0.75. Remember the data with DACO, improvement in a comparison with Jefitini, in this case with an improvement in the PFS about 
15 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.6 and osimertinib in the flora trial was compared with gefitinib or ermotinib with a median of 19 months and a hazard ratio of 0 0.46. So if you review the PFS and all the options we have available, it's very clear. According to PFS, second generation is better than first generation, uh, uh, afatinib 11 months, Dacomitini 15 months, and as well, osimertinib as third generation is better in PFS as compared with third generation with a median of 19 months. What happened with the overall survival? In overall survival, only two drugs have demonstrated an improvement. Dacomitini 34 months has a ratio 0.75, Remember the data from the RCT50 trial we reviewed before, and you can see on the right, Flaura trial as well, demonstrating an improvement with osimertinib comparing with gefitinib or lotinib, in this case with a median overall survival of 39 months and a hazard ratio of 0 0.8. So if we analyze our second objective to improve overall survival, only two drugs should be considered in the first line scenario Dacomitinib versus osimertinib. What happened when we analyzed the overall survival and the resistance mechanism? Again, remember if you use first or second generation, the main mechanism of resistance is the T1790 mutation. About 50% of our patients develop the mutation. And you can see on the slide uh, how the T1790 mutation resistance mechanism have a better prognosis as compared with another mechanism of resistance we can see, metamplification, amplification other mutation, for example, KRAS, or obviously a small cell lung cancer transformation. That's obviously what happened when you use osimertinib in the first line scenario. When you analyze the flower trial and what happened after osimertinib, you can see how the mechanism of resistance is completely different and probably is more aggressive as we uh, a worse prognosis. You can see on the right slide how 40-50% of the patient progressing after uh, osimertinib, the mechanism of resistance is completely unknown, followed by met amplification and followed by other mutation. And 10% of our patients are going to develop a small cell lung cancer transformation. The mechanism of resistance with worse prognosis as compared with the T1798 mutation development. When we compare the different trials with the different options we have available, first generation, second, and third, approximately 50% of our patients go ahead with the second line. However, when you go ahead with second line after osimertinib, the standard of care is going to be chemotherapy because there are no options available unless a clinical trial if you detect a mechanism of resistance. And if you use the first or obviously the best drug in this scenario, the second generation TKI, you have the option in 50% of our patients to do the sequence of treatment. And that's incredible, the results you consider and you uh, uh, show with the sequence. When you can use the sequence afatinib, T1798 mutation, and osimertinib, according to the Laxland 7 trial and the retrospective GeoTAC study, 90% of our patients were alive with the sequence uh, after three years of treatment. And again, remember, when you have the options to use dacomitinib and osimertinib, after progression with the T1719 mutation, patient with exon 19 no reach the, the, the survival in the last update analysis, and the median for patient with exon 21 was 45 months. If we review the toxicity, it's very clear second generation TKI have more toxicity as compared with first generation or third generation TKI, but However, the quality of life was identical between afatinib and gefitinib and between dacomitinib and, and gefitinib. For me, it was so surprising how the discontinuation rate in the pivotal study was different. You can see how it was 10% when you use first generation or second generation, but increased to 15% when you use 
theoretically a better uh, uh, option with less toxicity uh, should be uh, osimertinib. And that's probably related because osimertinib can produce less diarrhea, less, less rash, less paronychias, and less mucositis, but however, have a different toxicity profile. You remember during 2020, uh, FDA published an alert because osimertinib can produce pneumonitis and some toxicity uh, according to the Q2 prolongation and cardiac events. And that will be related with a higher discontinuation rate with the third generation TKI. So, from my point of view, uh, we have to take the decision in the first line setting. We have available first generation, second generation, and third generation between the two best options according to survival the comitinib versus osimertinib. It's obvious uh, our decision should be taken according to our availability in our countries, according to our experience, and obviously according to the cost. It's not the cost of osimertinib versus the second generation TKI. But I think we, we need to look for the future. And for me, it's so important to consider a repersonalized treatment approach in the near future according to the type of mutation. We are going to see how patients with exon 19 and exon 21 are completely different disease. Uh, we need to consider a different treatment decision according to the present or not TNS disease, and finally, according to the commutation. Here you can see Sorry. how Sorry. exon Dr. 19. Corrad. Dr. Yes. Corrad, you have like two minutes, three minutes, uh, uh, because we were delayed in uh, the session. Okay, okay don't okay. worry. I can, I, I can finish it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, you can you. see here how the uh, type of mutation have a different prognosis. You can see independently of the type of, of drug you use, patients with exon 21 uh, live shorter as compared with exon 19. And that's probably related because exon 21 have more resistant commutation, for example, P53. The representation of patients with exon 21 is representation more pleura and more CNS disease. And the risk of development of the T1719 mutation as the better uh, resistant mechanism is less as well with exon 21 as compared with exon 19. If we have two different uh, diseases with two different prognoses, why not to use two different treatments? You can see here how uh, the, the subgroup analysis of the overall survival in ARCH1050 trial on the left and in FLAURA trial on the right and how the maximum benefit in overall survival with the committing it was in exon 21 and opposite result in the flower trial with osimertinib in this scenario. Here you can see the second scenario, the CNS disease, the best drug when you have a patient with CNS disease or leptomeningeal disease, according to the flower trial and the bloom trial should be osimertinib. We have some data with the committing because remember in the ARCH1050 trial was an exclusion criteria to include patients with CNS, but we know the second generation prevent of the CNS disease as compared with gefitinib, and we have some preclinical data, some case reports, and say, some case series according to the potential benefit with the second generation in this scenario. Finally, there is a phase two trial in patients with EGFR mutant CNS disease running, and we have to wait for the result to use the committee in this scenario. And this is my last slide. In the near future, when you use the NGS incorporation, probably we are going to see different strategy of treatment according to the commutation associated to the EGFR. And you can see in the first line and in the second line scenario, when the EGFR TKI coexists we met R2 amplification, RB1, P53, P10, or M MDM2 mutation, the probability of response of the different drugs is lower as compared with this. Last slide, two case reports with two very similar patients with two different diseases. On the left, a patient with a stage 4 adenocarcinoma of the lung, EGFR mutant exon 19, on the right, a 
Pavlov has done. Same treatment, uh, different clinical presentation, different prognosis, different survival. On the right, the committee would respond PFS1 44 months independently of two dose reduction, T1798 mutation development, and patient actually alive after osimertinib in second line more than seven years. On the right, more aggressive situation, pleural disease, same treatment, very good PFS, but shorter as compared 28 months, no development of the T1798 mutation, different uh, uh, options of second and three lines, and different overall survival. Very good overall survival, 46 months, but shorter as compared with patients with Exxon 21. Finally, EGFR mutation treatment landscape is actually widespread. Three main objectives should guide our treatment decision, survival, sequence, and quality of life. The two options to consider in the first line in scenario should be the committee versus uh, osimertinib. I consider a repersonalized treatment approach according to the type of mutation, the CNS disease, and probably in the near future, according to commutation, a new treatment algorithm should be designed in this setting in the near future. Thank you very much. Sorry by my problems in the connection. I'm happy to answer any question you have. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Corral, for this excellent and comprehensive talk. We have two questions, please, uh, if anybody can. Can I ask you about the CNS if uh, uh, you have to have a stable CNS or active? Uh, can you give the drug with active CNS or you have to, sub to stabilize the CNS uh, metastasis? And then. Yeah. So in, in the trial uh, where the Dacomitini demonstrated the benefit in PFS and overall survival, was an uh, exclusion criteria to include. So the, the, the only evidence uh, that committing it, it could be effective actually could be in CNS disease is according to preclinical uh, models and uh, case reports. There is a phase two trial actually running in that scenario to demonstrate if this drug is efficacy or not. Uh, my point of view is if you have available or simertinib in patients, not in your patient in the clinic, and patients have CNS disease. The standard of care should be osimertinib. If you don't have this option available, we have data, retrospective data uh, from Afatini and Dacomitini. Uh, the second generation TKI is better as compared with first generation in patient independently they have or not CNS disease. So my consideration, if if you have CNS disease and the third t generation TKI available, osimertinib is the standard. But if you don't have the third generation TKI and you have only second or first generation, my option should be second generation TKI. Thank you, Dr. Corral, for this excellent talk. And we conclude uh, again, we thank uh, Pfizer for this uh, symposium. Thank you very much, Dr. Corral. Thank you. Thank you. We hope thank to you see you in phase next year. So thank you. Bye. Hi, good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening, everybody everywhere. Uh, it's um, uh, my great pleasure to welcome you at the myeloma session at the JSH. Uh, me, uh, Rosanna Alfar from King Hussein Cancer Center, I am myeloma and BMT uh, physician. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Ali Swanmini from King Hussein uh, Medical Center. Uh, our talk uh, will be about the updates in the frontline settings uh, in the multiple myeloma. It will be presented by Professor Philippe Monroe. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Philippe Monroe. He he is a professor of clinical hematology and head of translational research program in hematology and oncology at the University of uh, Hospital of Natus, France. Professor Monroe's clinical interests are focused on my multiple myeloma. 
Professor Monroe is the chairman of IFM, and he has several international randomized phase three clinical trials in the novel agents of multiple myeloma uh, that were uh, published in several uh, important uh, journals. Uh, please, Dr. Monroe, the talk uh, is you. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, you for your uh, invitation. And uh, we are going to speak about cure uh, for patients with multiple myeloma uh, through uh, daratumumab uh, use uh, in the frontline setting. Um, when we are speaking about curing multiple myeloma uh, patients, we had to consider that the definition of the cure rate is when the life expectancy of patients uh, is identical to that of the general population without multiple myeloma. And as well, when thinking, discussing of the idea of a cure that is the permanent end of the disease, we also have to consider that the patient is not receiving any uh, treatment since in many cases uh, for patients with multiple myeloma, we are quite often proposing treatment until disease progression or continuous treatment. <clears throat> so currently, what is the life expectancy at the age of 65 in Europe, in the US, and in many parts of the world? At the age of 65 years, your life expectancy is 20 years. So we have to propose to a patient with multiple myeloma a life expectancy of 20 years when he's 65. And for those patients that are 75 years of age, for example, the residual life expectancy is above 10 years and uh, in some countries even 15 years. So this is the goal, in fact, of our treatment. And what about patients that are not eligible for hydrotherapy and autologous stem cell transplantation. What is the frontline treatment for those patients? When we are looking at the EHA and the ESMO, the European guidelines, when patients are not eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation, elderly patients, the first options are the following. DRD, Lendex, Daratumumab, VMP-DARA or VRD, uh, the combination of lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone that is uh, very, very popular. And with VRD, uh, according to the SWOG study that did compare prospectively Lendex RD versus VRD, in fact, the study was updated quite recently, the uh, median overall survival by age uh, with VRD in patients in yellow above the age of 65 years, this um, median overall survival is something like 65 months, so something like five years, in fact. With VMP plus daratumumab, the DVMP combination based on the randomized phase three Alcione study, DARA VMP was compared prospectively with VMP alone, but in the DARA arm of the study, patients also received DARA maintenance until progression. There was a huge improvement in progression-free survival with DARA VMP followed by DARA Tumumab with a median PFS of 36 months. And you see that there is really no plateau, in fact, on the PFS curve with DVMP. And this benefit translated into an overall survival advantage as well. And you see that uh, the study was updated uh, in the Lancet by Dr. Mateos in 2020. For overall survival with DARA VMP followed by DARA, uh, we can uh, think that the OS, the median overall survival, will be 72 months. It means that the overall survival will be, the median OS will be six years. So that's better than VRD alone, but probably the best combination that is now available for elderly patients uh, is the combination of Lendex plus Daratumumab, the DRD 
regimen. This regimen is now approved uh, and is reimbursed uh, in uh, quite a lot of country uh, now. Uh, this uh, combination was established on the, based on the Maya study that did enroll more than 700 patients. DRD was proposed until progression and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. You see clearly that the median age at the time of diagnosis was 73 years and more than 40% of the patients, 44% of the patients were older than 75 years of age. So definitely a true elderly patient population. The study was published, uh, uh, updated uh, recently uh, last year in the Lancet Oncology. And there is a huge progression-free survival benefit. You see the PFS at the top of the slide with DRD, the median PFS is above 60 months. And when looking at overall survival, there is also a significant overall survival benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.68 in favor, in fact, of DRD versus Lendex. So this is statistically significant. And when looking at the median overall survival, the median OS will be probably above eight years. So definitely the best combination that is now available for our patients, knowing that the median age at the time of study entry was 73. It means that many patients uh, will uh, be older than 80 years uh, when the treatment will fail and some patients are not going to die from multiple myeloma, but from other causes. So to conclude this first part of my talk regarding patients not eligible for high-dose treatment and autologous stem cell transplantation, the cure is unlikely. You saw that with VRD, the median OS is five years. With DARA VMP, six years and probably with DRD, eight years. But with DRD, many patients will not die from multiple myeloma, and that's a very important point. What about now patients eligible for high-dose therapy and autologous stem cell transplantation? If we want to cure those patients, we need to reach the best response, but also this response has to be sustained. And when looking again at the uh, European EHA and ESMO guidelines, the first option for those patients that are eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation as induction treatment are either VRD or VTD plus daratumumab, a quadruplet combination, including a CD38 antibody. And following this induction phase, patients are receiving stem cell transplantation prepared by MEL200, followed by lenalidomide maintenance that is the standard of care. So you see here that we are proposing two different induction regimens, either a triplet combination or a quadruplet combination. So what is best? Is it a triplet or a quadruplet if we want to uh, reach the deeper response? In fact, VRD is very popular and VRD was well established based on this French randomized study comparing VRD alone versus VRD plus autologous stem cell transplantation. And in the two arms of the study, patients did receive lenalidomide maintenance during one year. 700 patients were randomized. The study was recently updated with a very long follow-up, and you see that uh, stem cell transplantation is associated with the best progression for survival and a significant benefit in terms of PFS. But uh, after seven years, only 
30% of the patients are disease-free. When looking at the Spanish study uh, that used also VRD six cycles before stem cell transplantation, and this study was published in blood uh, two years ago, in fact, on more than 450 patients, the study uh, looked at VRD, stem cell transplantation, VRD consolidation, two cycles, and maintenance. And our colleagues looked at minimal residual disease, MRD negativity. And half of the patients were able to reach MRD negativity, 49% of the patients were MRD negative when they had a standard risk disease. And a lower rate, 37% of the patients were MRD negative when they presented with poor cytogenetics. And in fact, the outcome is totally different. When patients are reaching MRD negativity, both for progression-free survival and overall survival, the results are really outstanding. It means that the goal of our strategy now is to reach MRD negativity, and in that case, it was with VRD as induction. But maybe we can do better, and we have tested a quadruplet combination incorporating daratumumab into the Cassiope study, we did enroll more than 1,000 patients and we did compare prospectively bortezomib thalidomide index, VTD, both before and after stem cell transplantation versus VTD plus daratumumab, a quadruplet combination, same number of cycles, both before and after stem cell transplantation. And when we looked at MRD negativity rates, 10 to the minus 5, in fact, uh, in the intent to treat patient population, on the whole group of patients, more than 1,000 patients, before maintenance, you see that the MRD negativity rate is much higher uh, with DARA VTD versus VTD. 64% of the patients did reach MRD negativity before maintenance and after consolidation versus 44% of the patients with VTD alone. And this depth of response, the quality of the response with DARA VTD translated into a better progression for survival. And you see on the left hand side, the update analysis of Cassiope uh, with uh, DARA VTD, the median PFS is not reached after a median follow-up of 44.5 months versus 51 uh, months with VTD alone. And uh, there is already a trend for a better overall survival with DARA VTD versus VTD alone. So definitely a quadruplet combination is better as compared with this triplet VTD regimen uh, into the Cassiopeia study. And when we are looking at the outcome of patients that were able to reach MRD negativity before maintenance, you see on the uh, top curve, in fact, that patients MRD negative with DARA VTD are really enjoying an incredible uh, progression for survival uh, that is uh, really outstanding in this study. So the goal is to reach MRD negativity also with a quadruplet combination uh, to reach the best outcome. We looked at cytogenetics again into Cassiopeia and the use of daratumumab on top of a triplet is not able in fact to overcome entirely the risk of poor cytogenetics. And you see in yellow, the DARA VTD arm for standard risk patient, and in green, the outcome of DARA VTD for high risk disease. So DARA is increasing the response rate, improving the progression-free survival for both subgroups of patients, 
standard risk and high risk. But nevertheless, the two curves are not uh, identical, in fact, suggesting that, well, poor cytogenetics is remaining a very difficult subgroup to treat. Into the study, we looked also at MRD negativity after induction, after four cycles of VTD or four cycles of DARA VTD before stem cell transplantation. The rate of MRD negativity was higher, in fact, uh, in the DARA arm of the study, 34% versus 23%. And when we looked at the uh, prognostic factors for progression-free survival, a multivariate analysis into this uh, very large Cassiopeia study, two factors were really important to predict the outcome of patients for PFS. The treatment group, obviously, and it is better to receive DARA versus no DARA upfront, but also reaching MRD negativity after induction, post-induction, is a very important prognostic factor. So the goal is not only to reach MRD negativity before maintenance, but also very early and after induction, if patients are MRD negative, 10 to the minus 5, you may predict a better outcome for your patient. And this is the uh, landmark analysis uh, after induction of patients reaching MRD negativity, yes or no, and the higher rate of MRD negativity is achieved with VTD DARA. So definitely a quadruplet seems to be really important for our patients. So should we use VRD or should we use VTD plus daratumumab? In fact, these two regimens are uh, the uh, better options according to the uh, European EHA and ESMO guidelines. But we will never have a head-to-head -head comparison of VRD and VTD DARA because we will never do this phase three study, obviously. But we were able to uh, propose a matched, adjusted, indirect comparison. We have compared the outcome of patients treated with VTD DARA into Cassiope with a matched population of patients treated either with VRD or with VCD or with VD alone, a doublet combination, into different trials. And when you are looking at PFS, in fact, you see the hazard ratio with the quadruplet combination when comparing VTD DARA and VRD, that is really in favor of the quadruplet. So with the quadruplet for a matched patient population, that's not a prospective study for sure, but it seems that a quadruplet is better than a triplet. This is true for PFS, but this is also true for overall survival. So that's why in many countries we are favoring a quadruplet combination versus a triplet, uh, including a CD38 antibody. And you know that in Tucasiope with VTD or VTD-DARA, there was a second randomization of maintenance with daratumumab single agent or no maintenance. It means that some patients did not receive any maintenance into Cassiope. And this is probably suboptimal because the standard of care is definitely lenalidomide. And you know that len maintenance was approved based on a very large meta analysis on 1,200 patients. And we did compare the lenalidomide maintenance versus placebo or no maintenance. And the overall survival was in favor of lenalidomide uh, maintenance with a benefit of more than two years for overall survival. So len is the standard of care. And recently, our colleagues from uh, New York in the US looked at MRD negativity during maintenance. And maintenance was proposed during a very long period of time for up to five years. And minimal residual disease was assessed during this maintenance phase, 10 to the minus 5, 
after one year of maintenance, two years or three years of maintenance. And when you are looking at the outcome of patients treated with lenalidomide maintenance, you see definitely that those patients MRD negative during maintenance, and that's the figure B here, MRD negative patients have a much better PFS as compared with MRD positive. But also, when patients have sustained MRD negativity and they are remaining MRD negativity, MRD negative during a long period of time, that's the bottom figure, figure C, you see that those patients with a sustained MRD negativity are enjoying an outstanding uh, progression for survival. So again, this concept of sustained MRD negativity is very important. So how can we improve on lenalidomide maintenance? Maybe with the combination of len plus, for example, daratumumab. And this is the goal of this ongoing Origa study. Patients treated with stem cell transplantation, all of them MRD positive, will be randomized to lenalidomide or len plus DARA up to 36 cycles, three years of treatment. So the goal here is to uh, reach MRD negativity and to have a better outcome, definitely the hypothesis is that with two agents, LEN plus daratumumab, we are going to improve on progression for survival, on MRD negativity, on sustained MRD negativity rates, and potentially on overall survival as well. So do we have some data of the combination of the best regimen potentially the RD plus daratumumab, stem cell transplantation, and the combination of LEN plus daratum daratumumab maintenance. In fact, we uh, have one study looking at VRD versus VRD plus daratumumab during induction and consolidation. And in the DARA arm of the study, patients also receive a maintenance phase with len daratumumab. This study is the Griffin study, that's a phase two trial uh, that was uh, published already in blood in 2020 uh, from our colleagues from the US. But the study was also updated at ASH 2021 a few weeks ago. And if you are looking at the uh, um, maintenance phase uh, with LEN and daratumumab versus LEN alone. In the DARA VRD uh, arm, you are seeing that the MRD negativity rates are increasing over time after the first part, the induction phase with VRD DARA, and then after consolidation with VRD DARA, then after one year of maintenance and after two years of maintenance. And definitely, there is a gap, a huge difference when comparing uh, the threshold of 10 to the minus 5 or even 10 to the minus 6 for MRD negativity rates. And definitely, we are reaching 10 to the minus 6 for a very high number of patients in the DARA arm of the study and 10 to the minus 5 as well. When we are looking at this concept of sustained MRD negativity lasting more than six months or lasting more than one year, in fact, in the DARA VRD arm of the study, the rates of MRD, sustained MRD negativity is much higher as compared with VRD alone. And this depth of response translated again into a PFS benefit and with now a long follow-up, with a median follow-up of more than three years into this phase two uh, trial, we can see that the progression for survival with DARA VRD is really outstanding. And the three-year PFS rates is almost 90%. So probably with DARA VRD, stem cell transplantation, and LEN DARA maintenance, 
we have a high rate of sustained MRD negativity and some patients potentially will be cured. Importantly, in this study, the duration of maintenance is a fixed one and the treatment was stopped, in fact, after two years of maintenance. So this is the concept of cure, to use the best treatment as possible for drugs, including a CD38 and a very good maintenance as well, to reach MRD negativity, to have sustained MRD negativity, and then to stop the treatment. So the concept of sustained MRD negativity is very important. And at ASH 2021, we have also updated the Cassiopeia study with DARA VTD and stem cell transplantation. And we looked at the subgroup of patients who was able to have this sustained MRD negativity concept during more than one year, in fact. And you see that the top curve for progression-free survival uh, with this uh, uh, red arrow is the one uh, with DARA VTD and sustained MRD negativity. And you see that the PFS rates is very uh, similar to that it's rich uh, into the uh, Griffin study with DARA VRD. Uh, interestingly, uh, at ASH, um, uh, we have heard as well about the uh, MASTER study. The MASTER study is one of the first trial looking at MRD negativity to drive the strategy and to decide yes or no to stop the treatment. In fact, into this phase two study, patients did receive a quadruplet induction with KRD plus daratumumab. MRD negativity was uh, uh, evaluated after induction, but also after stem cell transplantation and also after four cycles of or eight cycles of consolidation with KRD DARA. And when patients had MRD negativity twice consecutively after induction and stem cell transplantation or stem cell transplantation and consolidation, the treatment was stopped, in fact, based on this sustained MRD negativity after two phases of the strategy. It was quite interesting to see that after induction, 40% of the patients were MRD negative 10 to the minus 5. And after stem cell transplantation, 73% of the patients uh, were MRD, negativity, uh, MRD negative 10 to the minus 5. And the study was updated at ASH and published uh, in the GCO a few weeks ago. And you see that the progression for survival and also the overall survival of patients MRD negative when the treatment was stopped, the, 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 the outcome is really uh, outstanding, especially for those patients with no uh, cytogenetic abnormality or only one uh, cytogenetic abnormality. But when patients had two or more cytogenetic abnormalities, those patients with a ultra high risk, even if you are reaching MRD negativity, MRD negative, you see that the PFS is not that good and there is also some death uh, uh, and uh, the outcome is really totally different. So this is introducing the concept of sustained MRD negativity and a strategy that is adapted according to this uh, important uh, biomarker. And just to close my talk, I would like to show you the uh, uh, design of the ongoing French study. We are treating patients into this MIDAS study. The, the uh, um, MIDAS means minimal residual disease adapted strategy. We are using a four drug induction, a quadruplet induction with KRD plus isatuximab targeting CD38 six cycles and we are systematically looking at MRD uh, negativity yes or no uh, after induction and those patients that are MRD negative the standard risk group 
patients will be randomized to stem cell transplantation or no stem cell transplantation and a consolidation based on the quadruplet. And in the two arm of the study, we will propose a fixed duration of lenalidomide maintenance during three years. So this is the uh, study that is going to show yes or no, if we need to use stem cell transplantation, yes or no, in the setting of a quadruplet uh, induction. And uh, we are thinking that we will be able to reach 70% of MRD negativity uh, with uh, stem cell transplantation and a quadruplet combination. And potentially, we are going to cure half of the patients with standard risk disease. This is the aim of this uh, uh, study. So to conclude, I would say that for patients eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation, yes, we can think of curing patients, but I would say only patients with standard risk disease. You saw that patients with poor cytogenetics are enjoying a poorer uh, PFS. So those patients with standard risk that are reaching MRD negativity very early after induction, and also those patients with standard risk, MRD negative, that are remaining MRD negative during a long period of time with this new concept of sustained MRD negativity. And I thank you for your uh, very kind uh, attention. Thank you, Dr. Philip, for this uh, valuable information. We have time for one or two questions. Uh, if anyone uh, have a question. Please raise your hand. Any question? Dr. Khalifa, you have a question. Sir, in this thing, uh, uh, in your maintenance of treatment, what's your cut value? Is there any cut value for the MRD that we can continue our maintenance treatment? So th this is this is a very important question. Can we stop maintenance? Yes or no? According to MRD negativity, I think that. The threshold is 10 to the minus 5. In fact, if we can reach 10 to the minus 6, it will be better than 10 to the minus 5. But 10 to the minus 5, that's the minimum. And then what is the optimal duration of maintenance? You, you know that, um, for example, in the very recent European EMN study, uh, LEN was supposed to be proposed until progression, but the median duration of lenalidomide into the study was three years. So we are considering that uh, something that is feasible, in fact, optimal, could be maybe three years of maintenance. And if patients are remaining MRD negative during three years, potentially they will be cured. Another question from Dr. Khaled Halahli, please. I cannot hear you. Dr. Khaled has a question. Can, yes, yes. Can, can you mute me? I cannot. Yes. Uh, you're hearing me now? Yes. 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 Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but it seems uh, you're controlling the, the to be muted. So thank you, Professor Mora, for your presentation. Excellent. We're very happy uh, having these results with the quadruple and, and, and with the direct homo based therapy. But again, uh, regarding those patients, high risk patients, and ultra high risk patients having two cytogenetic abnormalities still pfs is not so good so we at our center we are we're doing the, the tandem transplant for those patients but again i don't know how much of benefit from the tandem because there is only two trials one is supporting and the other is not so how you would approach such a group of patients with i would say ultra or high risk patients uh, given the fact that Dara is not doing much in this subgroup of patients. Thank you. Yes, that's a, that's a very good question indeed. Um, uh, I think that we have some data showing that the tandem stem cell transplantation may improve on the outcome of patients uh, with poor cytogenetics or ultra high risk based on the EMNO2 study. Uh, but uh, the study was uh, demonstrated that tandem was better in terms of PFS and also for overall survival. But the study was not performed in the context of a quadruplet combination. It was performed in the context of a triplet combination. So 
in many centers, we are using tandem for patients with high risk disease. I'm not sure, I'm not 100% sure that uh, even with the addition of, of daratumumab and the quadruplet combination, the outcome will be improved. So definitely we need to find something different and maybe that will be the role of CAR T cell therapy or bispecific antibodies. Maybe with new immunotherapeutic approaches, approaches we will be able to following uh, stem cell transplantation to reach MRD negativity. Because when those patients with high risk disease are reaching MRD negativity, uh, their outcome uh, is improved. So I think that we have to design new strategies and you're perfectly right. Okay. The last question regarding the uh, effect of the daratumumab, especially in combination with the Revlimid as a, an, in the upper front setting before autologous stem cell transplant uh, for the stem cell mobilization. Yes, in fact, that's, that's a very important question. Uh, we know that, uh, and we demonstrated this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, important uh, point, that with Dara plus LEN, we are reducing uh, the number of CD34 positive stem cells, in fact. But nevertheless, in Tucasiope with VTD-DARA, and recently in another study looking at VRD-DARA into the Perseus study, all patients were able to proceed to stem cell transplantation, and the uh, hematopoietic reconstitution was totally good, in fact, although the number of stem cells was decreased. We know that we can use Plerixa 4, in fact, for those patients uh, that are, uh, uh, well, poor uh, mobilizers, for example. Thank you again, Dr. Philip, and now we reach to uh, finish the session. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Ahmad Tulfah, consultant medical oncologist at King Hussein Cancer Center. It's a great pleasure for me to moderate with my colleague, Dr. Ghadir Abdin, this uh, evening session. So we have a very distinguished speaker, well known for uh, most of us, uh, Professor Nadia Harbik. Uh, Professor Nadia Harbik is head of the Breast Center Oncological Therapy and the Clinical Trial Unit and holds the Chair for Conservative Oncology at the Department <coughs> of Obstetric Gynecology, University of Munich, Germany. From 2009-2011, she was head of Breast Cancer uh, Breast Center at the University of Cologne, Germany until 2009. She was an associate professor and head of conservative uh, sinology at the Technical University of Munich, where she obtained her specialty degree on obstetric gynae in 1998. In 1989, she received her medical degree from the University of Munich. Uh, professor Harbick is a member and uh, expert panel issuing the yearly updated evidence-based Germany working group for gynecological oncology guidelines for breast cancer therapy. She is executive board member <laughs> of the European, <coughs> I'm sorry for that, organization for research and treatment of cancer and scientific director of the Western German study group that focus uh, on early breast cancer trials with a strong translational research program. She is the principal investigator or steering committee member of numerous national and international clinical breast cancer trials, focusing on trial using novel targeted compounds. She currently co-chairs the Trans-Alto Committee. Her translational, translational research focuses on prognostic and predictive factors in breast cancer and other solid tumors. Uh, Professor Harbick has author, uh, authored more than 300 papers in peer-reviewed journals 
and coordinating editor in chief of breast care for her clinical translational research. She has received a numerous awards, including the 2012 Claudia von Schilling Award, the 2002 Ago Schmidt Medicine Award, and 2001 American Association for Cancer Research Award, and the 2001 American Society of Clinical Oncology Fellowship Merit Award for the highest ranking abstract submitted. Professor Harbick was invited to give the keynote lecture at the 2008 Congress of the German Cancer Society and Emmanuel van der Schirn lecture at the 2008 European Breast Cancer Conference. Professor Harbick co-chaired the third impact meeting and the erotic meeting on molecular markers. She is also a faculty and panel member of the International Conscience Conferences on Breast Cancer in Young Women for advanced breast cancer as well as for the St. Gallen meeting 2015. Professor Harbick will talk about triple negative breast cancer update. So floor is open for you for the next 45 minutes, Professor Nadia. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me all right and you can see my slides. Yes. Perfect. Thank you for this kind introduction. I, I will talk for about uh, half an hour or so, and then we have some time to also discuss um, the issues that are uh, important to, to the audience. So my topic is triple negative breast cancer, an update on the early and metastatic situation. And here's my potential conflicts of interest. And what I've done is sort of, uh, to look at the important issues and where we have novel ideas in early triple negative as well as in the metastatic setting, talking of course about immunotherapy because that is a new um, step forward. We have new registrations here. We will talk a little bit about uh, the germline BRCA mutation carriers and also in the metastatic setting about the ADCs, which are novel and which um, will certainly enrich our um, clinical practice, and then I think we have enough time for any questions. When we look at early triple negative disease, and this is from the Munich Cancer Registry, we see that um, this is the uh, uh, subtype with the worst prognosis overall, and also um, on the lower right hand side, if you look at local relapses and distant metastasis. So, a really aggressive tumor and which uh, warrants a lot of our attention and is an open medical need um, for a lot of our patients. Uh, with regard to therapeutic standards, I think over the last couple of years, we have all agreed on internationally that we should uh, take this to a new adjuvant approach just because we now have options to modify therapy um, after um, PCR or non-PCR so we can individualize treatment and it's important for the patient also to see what her chances uh, for cure are and that is quite well correlated with um, the PCR status. And uh, there's only two um, subtypes where there is such a clear correlation. It's the HER2 positive and their particular the hormone receptor negative situation and then the triple negative tumors where we have quite a good correlation between PCR and outcome. So obviously because the uh, prognosis is rather poor for a lot of the patients, there have been a lot of efforts to um, improve therapy in triple negative disease. And one idea was to change the taxane and this is from the um, Gepaceptu trial where our colleagues uh, from the GBG were able to show that there is a higher um, likelihood of PCR with triple negative disease with NAP paclitaxel, about double than that with weekly paclitaxel. And this um, higher likelihood of PCR also translates into survival where uh, patients with NAP paclitaxel instead of paclitaxel actually do better. Unfortunately, there is no registration uh, worldwide to sort of follow up with these data. The second idea was to add platinum. And uh, we know that 
this will increase the PCR rates. And the misconceptions in the beginning were that this is particularly true for the um, patients with BRCA mutations. But uh, as we saw in the GBG data on the right hand side, in reality, the, the additional impact of carboplatinum is actually greater in the BRCA wild type carriers, most likely because BRCA mutation carriers have very chemosensitive tumors and you cannot see the additional impact of the platinum as well as you can see this in BRCA wild type uh, carriers. I personally never understood why there was so much reluctance in adding platinum, which is completely inexpensive to um, neoadjuvant therapy in order to improve PCR. Um, because the toxicity may be there, but then you can always modify dose or even stop the platinum. But if we all agree, it increases PCR. So I, I think uh, was never under, uh, understandable to me why uh, colleagues, particularly also in the US, were so reluctant to add a, an, an inexpensive medication in order to increase the chances for cure. And uh, since the brightness study was presented by my colleague Sibyl Leubel from uh, Germany in, at ESMO 2021, we now know that platinum actually also impacts outcome. There were before some conflicting data from the US and from the GBG trials, but here in the brightness study, which had a completely different idea, it wanted to see whether viloporib um, adds um, to uh, the standard chemotherapy uh, being a PARP inhibitor, but actually it proved that um, carboplatinum improves outcome. So what do we do for patients with non-PCR? Here we have the CreateX trial, um, which showed that adjuvant capecitabine improves survival in patients with non-PCR. So this has quickly taken, uh, been taken up around the world because again, it's not an expensive drug and patients, if we find the right dose, usually tolerate it quite well. And then lastly, we also have the Olympia study showing that patients with a, a triple negative high risk disease, be it by non PCR status or larger tumors or node positive, if they'd be treated in the adjuvant setting, if they uh, receive one year of Olaparib um, in BRCA mutation carriers, they actually um, have a survival benefit here seen very nicely by the primary endpoint of the trial, the invasive disease free survival, where the likelihood of a relapse was about half by adding Olaparib in these high risk patients. So a number of options to individualize after a PCR. But obviously the question is since triple negative disease is genetically unstable, highly proliferative and very aggressive, what um, about immunotherapy, which has worked so well in, in other diseases and also in metastatic um, triple negative disease. So um, here we have two studies, the Impassion 031 study um, with atezolizumab, napaclitaxel and an antracycline in the neoadjuvant setting and Keynote 522 um, with the standard regimen, antracycline, paclitaxel, platinum, and then add addition of pembrolizumab. Both studies, I will show you the designs in a minute, add the immunotherapy in the um, neoadjuvant as well as in the adjuvant phase. Uh, the studies have reached similar um, incremental benefit regarding PCR improvement. Um, and both studies also showed that this is not dependent on PDL1 positivity. And with that, I would just like to concentrate on the Keynote 5 to 2 study because Impassion 031 has not yet been able to present follow up data. This is still being collected. Um, so we will concentrate on the study that already has an approval in the, the US. Keynote 5 to 2 is a study. Um, with added pembrolizumab in the neoadjuvant and in the adjuvant phase, and the neoadjuvant chemo was the strongest chemo we have with paclitaxel, carboplatinum, and um, antracyclines. Patients were able to enter this trial if they had um, a disease larger than two centimeters, uh, any nodal status, or um, patients uh, with node positive disease were also allowed to enter, and um, there was no um, a PDL1 status was not a prerequisite for 
uh, study entry. And here you see the primary result. The pathological complete response was improved by adding pembrolizumab by about 14% numerically in the overall population. And you can see on the right hand side that this did not depend on PDL1 positivity, but patients with a PDL1 negative tumor. And you know that for pembrolizumab, it's the CPS score that's important. So 10 and higher. Uh, these PDL1 negative tumors um, have just had a lower chance of a PCR beat in the control arm or the pembrolizumab arm, so they were not as chemosensitive. The reason that this um, regimen received FDA approval was that it not just showed PCR improvement, but also a statistically significant and clinically meaningful benefit regarding outcome here, event-free survival already at one of the interim analysis with about um, an 8% difference at, at three years favoring the pembrolizumab arm with a hazard ratio of 0 0.63. Um, the interesting thing was in an exploratory analysis, we looked at uh, the data uh, by PCR status, and you can see that if you have a PCR, uh, independent of which study arm the patients were on, they did extremely well. If they didn't have a PCR, um, the pembrolizumab patients still did better with about a 10%, even 11% difference at three years. So, um, interestingly, the patients with the higher risk also here derived the more benefit. And this is also uh, seen in the EFS subgroup analysis. Basically, everybody benefits, um, note negative, note positive. I think this is important. Any stage, um, pre- and postmenopausal patients, um, so very homogeneous benefit among the clinically relevant subgroups, which also led to a, a improvement in distant progression free or recurrence free survival with a difference also about uh, six to seven percent at three years. So clinically very meaningful data. And if we allow ourselves to take a peek at the overall survival, we see that this is going in the right direction, although patients are still doing fortunately very well and so we will need more follow-up in order to say something definite about overall survival. So very exciting data for our patients. And the question in the curative setting is always, um, what do, what's the trade-off? How can we um, inform our patient about the side effects? And if you look at the combined phases, you can see that um, the, the green bars, which are the PEMBRO um, treated patients, they don't have more side effects overall um, sort of eyeballing this uh, compared to patients with chemotherapy. There is slight differences in some of the side effects, for example, rash, but um, overall um, the chemotherapy um, also has a lot of side effects. And uh, so it's not visible that there's a major difference. If we look at the immune me mediated side effects, we have to tell our patients that there are uh, some side effects. They're very rare, mostly um, thyroid dysfunction, infusion reactions we see here and the very severe side effects like adrenal insufficiency, colitis, uh, myocarditis, they're very rare, um, but they do exist. So we have to inform our patients accordingly. But based on the um, very impressive uh, difference in event-free survival, the FDA already approved this regimen um, in summer of um, 2021. So what are we waiting for? We're waiting for data um, from uh, the other trials that are still ongoing from the Impassion 031 study for the follow-up data. This is an interesting study because after surgery, um, treatment was actually left to the investigator. The patients and the atezolizumab arm could still continue with atezolizumab, but also capecitabine could be given in case of non-PCR. So we will have data from this trial looking more at also a combination um, of different therapeutics after surgery. Then there is a solely adjuvant trial, the impatient 030 trial, um, looking at atezolizumab in the adjuvant setting with chemotherapy and then continued for the duration of a year. And then we have um, another study looking at neoadjuvant, the neoadjuvant setting with paclitaxel and carbo instead of um, the NAP paclitaxel that was used in the 31 study. 
And then obviously there is one negative trial for atezolizumab so far, but the primary endpoint has not yet been reached. But we did not see an improvement in PCR rate in the neotrip trial with um, atezolizumab and the taxane. Um, but we should not forget that in this trial, antracyclines were given after surgery. Um, and we know that antracyclines are quite immunogenic. So um, we should wait for the primary endpoint of the trial and, and keep that in mind and maybe um, discuss once we have all the data in front of us. And then obviously we have a lot of um, open questions. What about uh, the adjuvant combination of um, immunotherapy and capecitabine? Uh, does adjuvant immunotherapy have a role at all? I mean, there's also data uh, from the Japan Neuro, Neuro study with uh, Dovalumab, where they only gave um, the immunotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting and still had an improvement in outcome. And obviously, Ateso and Paclitaxel, that's a story that we need to watch very closely. So, in summary, for the early breast cancer setting, a triple negative disease, I think uh, neoadjuvant chemo with anthracyclines and taxins is our standard. There are some anthracycline free options. If you don't want to give anthracyclines, for example, if the patient already had a breast cancer on the other side and was treated with the standard regimen, then docetaxel cyclophosphamide or also docetaxel carboplatinum are evidence based and very effective. We know that napaclitaxel may be a better taxin based on the Gepraceptu trial. And we know that platinum increases PCR and patient outcome based on brightness and that PCR overall is correlated with favorable outcome. Non-PCR, we need to do something about that. Um, there is data to um, escalate therapy with the adjuvant capecitabine based on the CREATE-X trial and in patients with a BRCA mutation um, we know that olaparib improves um, disease-free uh, survival in these high-risk patients. And obviously, in the context of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, risk-adapted interdisciplinary management is essential. And we've discussed this my last um, talk before the pandemic started two years ago was, uh, was to your country in, in Jordan. And I still remember the vivid discussions how to manage patients in the neoadjuvant setting. And I think that this is a concept that we all uh, agree on very well. Immunotherapy with con uh, has very consistent data. PDL status is not important in the early breast cancer setting. It is important, as you will see in a minute, in the metastatic setting. We have data for pembrolizumab improving PCR and outcome and um, have a um, FDA approval. This was wishful thinking. We're waiting for the EMA approval and um, in the Impassion 031 study showed that atezolizumab improves PCR almost in the same um, range that uh, pembrolizumab did that in the keynote study, but we don't have any outcome yet. And as I said before, there's many open questions regarding immunotherapy. Also the question, does everybody need immunotherapy? Um, can we find out for patients that may just do well with chemotherapy alone? I think this will be subject of the next generation of trials. So in the metastatic setting, um, I think we also internationally agree on what the data shows us, what the best um, evidence would be um, the chemotherapy is the backbone here, and we have immunotherapy for the first line setting. In this case, only in PDL1 positive tumors. Um, we have um, the germline BRCA status that tells us whether we can use a PARP inhibitor. And then we have uh, chemotherapy with, with bevacizumab is registered in Europe, used a lot in some countries in Europe in the first line setting with a taxane or capecitabine. And again, in the metastatic setting, triple negative disease is dismal. Uh, patients have very poor outcome. And you can see on the right hand side that actually the outcome hasn't become better uh, between the last 10 years and the 10 years before that. And on the left hand side, you can see that um, triple negative is not just a high risk disease, but also there are certain um, metastatic patterns that are just more frequent and they're very aggressive, like uh, the brain tumors.
unfortunately here we you have to turn your head a bit sideways i'm very sorry about that i'll show you the data in more detail in a minute but um i use a mac and sometimes uh Pages don't come up the right way if you switch to another system. But again, here checkpoint inhibitors in the first line uh, setting um, have quite similar data. The quality of the study is a little bit different, but the overall survival benefit observed in Impassion 130 with um, Ateso and Kino 355 with pembrolizumab numerically is almost the same with the, about a seven months um, a difference here. But the studies are different, and let me just quickly uh, go through them. Impassion 130 used again the backbone of napaclitaxel with Ateso um, with the idea that you don't need any pre medication, so no steroids are involved, which may help the efficacy of the immunotherapy. First line study, and you've all seen the outcome um, in PDL1 immune cell positive tumors. Um, Ateso improves PFS, but only by a small margin by about two months, but it improves overall survival in an exploratory analysis by about um, seven months median, but only in PDL1 immune cell positive patients. And here's the overall survival analysis, the last last one, the longest follow up. And you can see there is quite a substantial difference. And it's really meaningful for patients. So I said PDL1 status is important. Um, here we have different scores, and and uh, those of you who treat other cancers, for for you that's uh, just common knowledge. But for people who just treat breast cancer, we just have to learn about this. And the immune cell staining is something that is important for atezolizumab, whereas the combined positive score staining tumor cells and immune cells is actually important for the um, for pembrolizumab. And another thing is important, it's maybe the site of the metastasis or where you do the PDL1 staining. And this is data from the Impassion 130 study. And you can see that people have used primary tissue as well as metastatic tissue for uh, the inclusion of patients in the trial. Um, once the tumor is PDL1 immune cell positive, um, atezolizumab works, and uh, the positivity rate is even a bit higher in the primary tissue. But for the metastatic tissue, it's important to point out that some organs may not have such a high PDL1 immune cell positivity, like liver. We have only 13% of staining here compared to about over 40% in the breast tissue. So if we have for example, a metastatic biopsy in the liver and it's negative, it doesn't hurt to also look at the primary tumor. The reason that um, there was a withdrawal of the FDA um, approval by the manufacturer, they, uh, they did not go for full approval, was that there was also a negative trial. Um, the Impassion 131 study looking at paclitaxel plus um, atezolizumab and uh, didn't see a benefit uh, neither in PFS nor in overall survival, um, although the control arm in, regarding overall survival did much better than expected. So there are some uncertainties about this trial, but because there was no um, confirmatory trial, the conditional approval for ATESA was revoked in the US. In Europe, we still have a full approval and as I shown you, a seven month overall survival advantage although in an unplanned exploratory analysis. So I think um, if you have access and if uh, the drug is available, it's a, it's a very good regimen together with NAPACLI, but we cannot use um, ATESO with any other chemotherapy unless it's evidence-based. The second study that gained approval and now has full approval by the FDA and also by EMA um, last year is the Keynote 355 study looking at pembrolizumab and plus chemo versus chemotherapy plus placebo in the first line setting in patients with PDL1 positive tumors. And you can see here that the um, progression free survival, particularly in the population with the CPS score 10 or higher, is um, prolonged by about four months median, which is very strong effect. But more importantly, we have a survival advantage with regard uh, to overall survival benefit in the population CPS uh, greater or equal to 10. 
and uh, you can see here that this is quite meaningful with about seven month median in difference. If you look at the uh, subgroups, which is clinically relevant, we see that it's a bit problematic in patients with a very fast relapse after um, their initial adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy. Here we don't see a substantial benefit. But the nice thing about the Kino 355 study is that it looked at different chemotherapies, NAP paclitaxel, paclitaxel, but also carbogem. And you can see um, that all of these um, uh, chemotherapies did quite well. And there is a slightly less efficacy with gem carbo, but on the other hand, that was the regimen that patients got when they had a very fast relapse. So there may be an interaction there. Also in the metastatic setting, um, compared to the time with chemo, there isn't really much visible um, difference between um, the two um, arms. Again, the PEMBRO arm in, in green, but you can see that the bar is about the same height all, all the way through. If we look at immune uh, mediated events, again, it's the uh, thyroid uh, dysfunctions that are most frequent here and the um, severe side effects are very, very rare. So we, regarding uh, chemotherapy, um, again, in triple negative disease, we do have uh, several chemotherapy options. There's no particular chemotherapy that is uh, very effective uh, in triple negative disease. Uh, people like to use aribulin a lot, and um, platinum if it hadn't been given in the early breast cancer setting, capecitabine. And as I said, in some countries, we do have a registration for bevacizumab in, in Europe, so in some countries this is still given in the first line setting. With regard to later line settings, we do have a study pembrolizumab monotherapy versus monochemotherapy, and this study did not reach its primary endpoint of superiority, the green arm being the pembro arm, but you can see in highly immunogenic tumors actually um, PEMBRO performs better than monochemotherapy, CPS score 20 or higher. So this could be an option for patients where, uh, who did not have the chance to have an immunotherapeutic before because they've been long time on the first or second line setting uh, treatment and then um, haven't seen immunotherapy because uh, they had their relapse before there was an approval. But this is not going to be a lot of patients. We've used it sometimes while there was an approval for pembrolizumab, but now I think most patients with triple negative disease get their immunotherapy in the first line setting if they qualify for it. And here you can see the um, immune related the side effects overall, and you can see that the green bars are actually shorter than the red bars, showing that the Monochemotherapy in some instances even has a higher side effect pro rate than um, immunotherapy by itself. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that we have a registration for PARP inhibitors and in triple negative disease in patients with a germline BRCA mutation. Um, the, they prolong PFS, but not overall survival, at least not in a pre planned statistical analysis. And we have a registration for olaparib and talazoparib in this setting. There is some hint from the Olaparib study that if you give it early enough in the first line setting, it actually does have a survival um, benefit, as you can see on the lower right hand side, with about eight months difference between the arms favoring the Olaparib arm. But again, this is an exploratory analysis, so hypothesis generating. But in general, if you have a PARP mutation, um, this, uh, these drugs, PARP inhibitors, should be given early. The last piece of news is um, saxituzumab guvitican, which is an antibody drug conjugate and was uh, evaluated in the ASCENT study, which is a phase three study looking at saxituzumab guvitican in patients with two or more lines of therapy for the advanced uh, setting versus physician's choice, which was the, uh, the usual suspects of monochemotherapies, and you can see here saxituzumab is an antibody drug conjugate with um, SN38 as a chemotherapy um, that is linked to, to an anti-TROP2 antibody. And you can see that it has a very high drug to antibody ratio, a ratio with about uh, 7 to 8 and very potent um, payload 
which is more potent than the uh, parent compound irinotecan. So very interesting uh, drug and the SEND study was positive and not just positive, there was a statistically significant but clinically extremely meaningful difference in overall survival, about um, doubling overall survival in the succituzumab arm with a hazard ratio of 0.48. And the only question is, what is TROP2? Is it important? Um, and, and the answer is, um, there is benefit from saxituzumab independent of TROP2 expression. So um, we don't need to measure this in order to decide who gets saxituzumab. So in summary for the metastatic setting, I think chemotherapy is standard. It's the backbone in PDL1 positive tumors. We add immunotherapy with a checkpoint inhibitor and here it differs according to the PDL1 um, positivity. Um, in PDL1 negative tumors, uh, we still have an EMA approval for PACLI or capecitabine plus bevacizumab or any other uh, chemotherapy um, that you feel is appropriate. And then BRCA mutation carriers and PARP inhibitors pro, uh, prolong progression free survival. And we should try to give these compounds as early as possible. And second line and beyond, saxituzumab um, improves overall survival, and I think that is a very important point, and it has received EMA approval just recently at the end of last year. And regarding the molecular subtypes of triple negative disease, that is something that is not of clinical therapeutic consequences at the moment. And obviously, um, therapy trials are um, very important for our patients. And here you see the uh, most recent ESMO guidelines for metastatic breast cancer published by Dr. Genari and a um, number of international experts. And we see here again in metastatic triple negative, we go by PDL1 status, by BRCA mutation, and then we sort of put the patient in, into one of these uh, three different um, therapeutic options. In second line, saxituzumab is already. Uh, the standard, and then we can use some chemotherapies. And maybe for some of you who are interested, we did not specifically mention gemcitabine as a monotherapy in these guidelines anymore because the data is really not that good in breast cancer. There, uh, I know a lot of people like to use gem because they use it in other tumors, but for breast, the data is just um, miserable. And I mean, the guidelines, we published them in October, but if you've seen the press release from the Destiny Breast 04 study um, looking at um, trastuzumab deruxtecan in her to low um, metastatic breast cancer, the press release said that this drug has reached, a study has reached its primary endpoint and prolongs PFS and overall survival in her to low um, tumors, I think we have to start rewriting the guideline already, and we're going to do that um, with a living guideline, which can um, adopt to change uh, data uh, quite easily if the drugs are available and uh, registered. So with that, I would just uh, like to close. Thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I think we have enough time now to uh, talk about these therapeutics that I mentioned and answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Herbeck, for this nice, excellent presentation about treatment of triple negative breast cancer. We have 10 minutes actually for a few questions from the audience. Do you have any? Uh, the mics are open if anybody has any question. Dr. Khalifa? Yes. Mike? Thank you for your excellent presentation. I would like to ask, do you tailor your treatment if the patient has oligomits or versus a crisis, visceral crisis, for example, in your approach? I think, I think in the um, triple negative setting, um, the therapies wouldn't differ so much if there is a life-threatening disease or uh, just a few meds. I think uh, even for oligomets, we would need to have a good response to systemic therapy before we um, embark on any local measures. But obviously, and we have a whole um, algorithm uh, in 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 the guide in the ESMO guidelines 
depicting that for the oligomets, we need a multidisciplinary approach where we see whether we can add some radiotherapy, some surgery in order to maybe get the patient um, tumor free and in a long lasting um, remission. But I think the initial therapy would be a chemotherapy based in any case. Thank you. I have one question, Dr. Herbeck, uh, regarding, do you consider certain features, for example, like achieving pathological CR to decide if you want to continue uh, adjuvant PEMPRO or any immune checkpoints inhibitor, if you use it in the new adjuvant setting, do we have the features to consider which patient to continue new adjuv or adjuvant uh, PEMPRO and immune checkpoints? Like we know there is difference in the response between patients who achieve the pathological C uh, CR versus no uh, CR. I think for the time being, we have to go with what the data shows us. And if you have availability and the resources and the patient is um, tolerating uh, pembrolizumab well, then I would continue in the adjuvant setting just because that's the way the trial was built. And, and we don't know what would have happened to the PCR patients um, if we hadn't done that. In, in the trial, but obviously, given also the Jepaceptor results, uh, we do have some questions here. And and I think it's all what, what we see, if you have a new therapeutic standards, the next uh, generation of trials tries to find out who can do um, without intensified therapy. So I don't think every and triple negative patient needs immunotherapy. If you think about what we saw in the ADAPT trial, where we had just with 12 weeks of carb, carbo and napaclitaxel, we had over 40% total PCRs, and these tumors did not have a better outcome if patients had additional chemotherapy. So. Um, I think maybe what we're going to end up in the future is an induction chemo. And then if there is a PCR, maybe no immunotherapy at all in patients who don't have a PCR escalate the therapy and also escalate the immunotherapy. But for the time being, I think we have to um, continue in the adjuvant setting and, and until we have trial data in whom, whom we can stop. Okay, another question, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nade. Do you have or do you uh, combine Olaparib with Pempro or and uh, Capsitabine? I mean, in the in the keynote study, as we saw also in San, in from the San Antonio analysis, where they looked at a little bit more into detail in these subgroups, and the keynote study, uh, there was no combination with other agents. Um, I would not be so worried about the combination with Olaparib, although recognizing that's not that many patients, um, because we also have a study in the metastatic setting called the Keeling study that is doing exactly the same and which is running quite smoothly. Um, with capecitabine, I'm not such a big fan because I, I think, I mean, if a patient has failed four chemotherapies, anthracycline, cyclophosphamide, platinum and taxane, why on earth do we believe that capecitabine will cure these patients? I think um, the Japanese study is interesting. Um, patients probably didn't have carbo in that study, and we're doing this because we don't have anything else. But do we really think that that will make a difference? I think it's it's better to go with PEMBRO as done in the keynote study, and, and these patients have a very good outcome. Uh, Professor Nadi, I have some. Uh, I have one question. What's your opinion regarding adjuvant capsitabine for patients who didn't achieve complete pathological response after new adjuvant? Do you combine it with radiation at the same time, or you will delay the adjuvant capsitabine after radiation, taking in consideration that some patients they might have delay to start adjuvant uh, adjuvant radiation, especially if they have some wound infection. So, what's your recommendation regarding that? I think the um, the study, the um, CreateX study, did uh, started the K, the Cape after radiation. But I think in the patient you're mentioning, if you have some surgical problems and you think it's safe to, for example, to start with CAPE because that doesn't cause such a big immunosuppression and you don't have a PEMBER available, um, then I would start and you could pause during radiotherapy or reduce the dose. I mean, our radiotherapists also take CAPE cytobin in other patients as a radiosensitizer. So yes. it's not forbidden to give this together, but main 
maybe not the full dosage. Uh, so I think we can be a bit flexible there. In general, if you have good wound healing, you start your radiotherapy and then you can uh, start the capecitabine. But in individual cases, you may decide to do this differently. And I think it's a dialogue with the radiotherapist that then lets us find a way for each patient. Okay, thank you. Okay, I would like to thank Dr. Nadia for this nice presentation. We will end uh, the lecture and hopefully we will see you next year face to face. It would be wonderful to come back to your country again. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank لا <laughs> 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 يعني انتوا سامعين انا شو بحكي صار صار اوكي اور اور نيكست ليكشر ويل بي ويذ دكتور هاكوب كانتريجيان سوري دكتور هاكوب اف اي سبيل يور نيم انكوركتلي دكتور هاكوب هاز ا فيري امبرسيف انتريستينج سي في Dr. Hagob is a professor Department of Leukemia Division of Cancer Medicine, the University of Texas, a Department Chair, Department of Leukemia Division of Cancer Medicine, the University of Texas, and uh, Associate Vice uh, President of a Global Academic Program, the University of Texas, Samsung Distinguished uh, University Chair in Cancer Medicine Department of Leukemia Division of Cancer Medicine, the University also of Texas. Uh, Dr. Hakob uh, Education, uh, he graduated from American University of uh, Beirut, uh, Lebanon, uh, and uh, finished his uh, internal medicine from there also. Uh, Dr. Hakob uh, uh, finished his medical oncology, uh, specialty hematology oncology from the University of Texas Anderson Cancer Center, Houston, Texas. Uh, Dr. Hagop uh, got uh, so many awards and honors and uh, has completed many researches, protocols, and around um, uh, 2,291 publications. Very impressive. As well as uh, many articles, uh, abstracts, uh, book chapters, and books. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hagop, uh, and uh, you are welcome uh, uh, with us as our next uh, lecturer, and uh, it will be about the uh, CML update. And the floor is yours, Doctor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor and it's always uh, great to uh, uh, communicate with our Jordanian colleagues. We've had uh, long-term established collaborations. So I'm very happy and honored to present on chronic myeloid leukemia state of the art in 2022. So for people who are um, as old as I am, people over the age of 50, you may be familiar with the past of chronic myeloid leukemia where before 2000, the disease was invariably fatal with a poor prognosis, a 10 year survival of 10% or less and allogeneic transplant was the only potentially curative option. Today, since 2000, the disease has completely changed in terms of the therapy and prognosis. So we know that if the patients are treated properly with the new BCR able tyrosine kinase inhibitors, they have an excellent prognosis. I'll show you that the 20 year survival is over 85%. We have now four frontline therapies, imatinib, desatinib, nilotinib, and uh, recently bosutinib. And now in the salvage therapy, we have added also a new drug, a third generation BCR able TKI, asimineb, uh, which is uh, powerful against the T315I mutation. Uh, so with all these measures, including allogeneic transplantation, most of the patients 
will live their normal life and many of them will be functionally cured and also molecularly cured, meaning that you can stop therapy in some of them. So this is the update uh, of the data from our institutions. So before 1982, the average survival used to be about three years. Uh, in 1982, we introduced interferon therapy, which improved the survival to about six years. Uh, and the top three curves are the data since 2000, where we introduced imatinib therapy and then the second generation TKIs. So the blue curve is the survival if you count only CMR-related deaths. The orange curve is the survival if you count uh, deaths from CML and from transplants. So what you see is that uh, at about 20 years, close to 90% of the patients um, uh, remain alive with the sensoring. And the pink curve are the patients, uh, all the patients uh, accounting for all deaths, uh, whether they are related to CML or not. So many patients uh, just die of old age or, or second cancers. Uh, this is an analysis uh, which we did uh, looking at relative survival. So we matched patients on TKI therapy with older patients. Uh, we matched them by age. And what you see is that the mortality from chronic myeloid leukemia itself uh, is only 0.5% higher uh, than uh, that of a normal population. So actually the patients do extremely well. And this slide shows um, uh, now the approved TKI. So on the left side are imatinib, nilotinib, bisatinib, bosutinib for frontline therapy, ponatinib, uh, and asimenib are the third generation TKIs. And then we have the option of omacitaxine, which is not a VCR able tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And under development are three new TKIs, um, including the one from China, which I'll show you which I'll show you uh, with very good results. Um, so today, the treatment of chronic myeloid leukemia is uh, in the front line with imatinib, bisatinib. Uh, the approved dose of bisatinib is 100 milligrams daily, but I'll show you that 50 milligrams is as effective and less toxic. Nilotinib, 300 twice daily, and bosutinib at 400 milligrams daily. For patients who fail these, we can always consider the um, um, new generation TKIs, including nilotinib, bisatinib, bosatinib, ponatinib, and now asimenib, which is FDA approved, uh, and the option of allogeneic transplant. Now, many people who are older in their 70s, we do not like to do the transplant, even if they do not achieve a cytogenetic CR. Even if they are 100% Philadelphia positive, you can still control them by continuing the TKI and adding something. Uh, we uh, add mostly uh, D-cytabine uh, because now there's an oral formulation, but you can add hydria cytarabine and use combinations of the TKI. I want to show you now um, the uh, data with the lower dose d 50 milligrams daily. So now we have treated a total of uh, 80 patients. Uh, the median age is 47 years. Uh, and uh, I showed the data in terms of the incidence of major molecular response is 81%. Um, um, deep molecular response, 55% by 12 months into therapy. And on the left side, I showed the incidence, the cumulative incidence of uh, the uh, MR4, so this is what you want to achieve uh, to be able to stop therapy, uh, an MR4 or uh, more. Uh, and what you see is that by two years, 60% of the patients have achieved that level. So this is as good as the desatinib 100 milligrams daily. On the right side, I compared the desatinib 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams. And what you see is because we are not interrupting therapy for myelosuppression or pleural effusion, actually the 50 milligrams may be doing as well. Uh, at this ASH meeting, we presented the data uh, on the setting of 50 versus 100 milligrams from our institution. And we've demonstrated that, in fact, the setting of 50 milligrams is as effective. And what you see is the incidence of pleural effusions goes from 20% to 5%. And when you look at the estimated four-year uh, event-free survival, it's in uh, very high, 95 versus 92%. On the, 
On the right side is the propensity score matching, which again demonstrates that the setting of 50 milligrams is as effective, uh, maybe slightly more effective because there are no treatment interruptions. And also it's much less toxic as I showed in terms of pleural effusions, but also because of myelosuppression. In the Lancet hematology, uh, very recently, the Japanese investigators looked at desatinib, 20 milligrams daily in people over the age of 70. So these were patients uh, with a median age of 70 years. And what they show again is that the treatment is quite effective, a cumulative incidence of major molecular response by 12 months of 60%. Uh, they show that no patients discontinued therapy for progression. There were three failures and for plural effusion. So in a patient who is 70 and older, I would certainly consider the setinib 50 or maybe uh, a lower dose if they have side effects. So then we have several questions because now we know that the course of CML is very indolent. The large majority of the patients do extremely well. So people ask, well, what is then the best frontline therapy? Um, if we choose imatinib, is the generic imatinib safe? Uh, what is the endpoint of treatment? The endpoint of treatment to normalize survival is a complete cytogenetic response, so a PCR of less than 1%. But if you want to aim for treatment free remission, uh, then the endpoint of therapy will be a durable deep molecular response. Um, uh, we have also to consider the long term side effects and the cost, and, and also the timing of allergenic transplant. So I'll, di I'll discuss some of those questions. So the first uh, question is the role of imatinib. So you're all familiar with um, uh, the old study, the IRIS trial that looked at imatinib versus interferon plus aracine. That study confirmed imatinib as the first BCR-able generation uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor that uh, transformed the course of CML. So when you look at the outcome of these patients, uh, the estimated 10-year survival is uh, 83%. This is because we did not have as familiarity with the drug in those days. Uh, but as I showed you, if you're familiar with the TKIs, uh, then the patients do quite well. And once the patients are in a complete cytogenetic response, then the risk of transformation becomes close to 0%. In the first two years, we see some patients who transform mostly young people who develop a lymphoid blast crisis. And this shows that the incidence of blastic phase disease uh, becomes very low over uh, time. So once you have the patients tucked in a stable and durable complete cytogenetic response, very few patients will develop a transformation. And this shows the survival of the patients on imatinib therapy. Now, because the patients on the interferon are mostly um, uh, were switched to imatinib therapy nine, nine months into the treatment, the survival is quite similar, but you see that at 10 years, there's about a 5% difference in the 10-year survival, and that is because there was a delay of about nine months. So when we talk about treatment interruptions for pregnancy or, or others, you have to be watchful uh, to the fact that there is a price to pay for treatment interruptions for nine months or more than that. So then the second question is, uh, is the generic imatinib as good as the patented imatinib? And this is a study from China um, that was reported uh, a couple of years ago that shows that in fact, the outcome with generic imatinib, if the source is a good source, is uh, identical to the patented imatinib. So when you look at the estimated uh, four-year survival, it's uh, 96 and 98 percent. Now, another question is, uh, are we obligated to use second-generation TKIs in the frontline therapy as opposed to imatinib? So there were up to 16 studies uh, that compared imatinib to second-generation TKIs. Some of them are well known to you, the INAST nd the Decision, uh, the BILA, uh, and so on. And um, the bottom line is none of these studies show the survival benefit. They all showed higher rates of early uh, surrogate endpoints, such as complete cytogenetic response, MMR, deep molecular response. But at the end of the day, 
uh, if you uh, take the patients, uh, if you monitor them carefully and you change therapy early in the salvage setting, uh, because these uh, the salvage therapies are so effective, we could never demonstrate a survival benefit in any of those studies. And you have to consider that with the second generation TKIs uh, come new toxicities, uh, such as arterial occlusive disease, pancreatitis, pleural effusions with desatinib, uh, and some of uh, the other side effects. And uh, this slide summarizes uh, the main four studies. So the decision is desatinib versus imatinib. Inast ND is venilotinib versus imatinib. The B4 is posutinib versus imatinib. And the TOPS is the higher dose of imatinib compared to the imatinib. Look at the bottom line, which is the survival. There is no survival difference if you treat the patients optimally. So frontline therapy can be with imatinib, 400 milligrams daily. Uh, if you have the patients in a good cytogenetic response, you can reduce the dose. Milotinib is uh, today with 300 milligrams twice daily. But again, if you have side effects and the patients are in a good cytogenetic response or a molecular response, you can reduce the dose to 150 twice daily or maybe even 200 milligrams daily. The desatinib is at 50 milligrams daily, but you can reduce the dose to 20 milligrams daily. And the positive is starting dose is 400 milligrams daily, but I always try to start at the lower dose uh, to avoid the early GI toxicity. Um, uh, so I always start with 200 daily for a week or two, then 300 milligrams daily before I go to the full dose. On the right side are the side effects to watch for. So with imatinib, you can uh, develop renal dysfunction and some neurotoxicities. Uh, with the desatinib, we mentioned the pulmonary hypertension. With the bosutinib, GI toxicity, renal, and liver toxicities. Uh, and with the nilotinib, you have to watch for patients who have prediabetes or diabetes because it can get worse. Now, uh, another question is, well, if I choose a second generation TKI, um, is um, uh, one uh, better than the other? So this is a study, again, from Japan that was in an abstract form a year ago, comparing um, in 450 patients desatinib versus nilotinib. And the desatinib here was at 100 milligrams daily, the nilotinib 300 twice daily. And what you see is that um, the uh, outcome is almost identical. So they had a three-year survival of 99%, a deep molecular response of uh, 40 to 45 percent. So the second generation TKIs are equivalent as frontline therapy. And, and this shows ultimately the incidence of um, complete cytogenetic response. But for the people who are interested in a deep molecular re response MR4, what you see is by three years, over 60 percent of the patients achieve that response. The Germans have uh, continued imatinib in most of the patients. So in the original studies, the aim was not to achieve a deep molecular response for the purpose of discontinuation. And on imatinib, if you continue imatinib, what you notice is that in their studies by uh, seven to eight years, uh, if you look at MR4 or better, so the green and the blue curve and the yellow curve, what you notice is most of the patients achieved the deep molecular response over 70% of the patients. Um, this is in contrast, for example, to the randomized study of nilotinib versus imatinib, where some of the patients on the imatinib were taken off early because of suboptimal response. And uh, so they were censored indefinitely. Uh, so you have to compare the data of the German trials where they continued imatinib and they achieved a deep molecular response in uh, over 60 to 70 percent of the patients to the INAS and the trial where uh, because they took many of the patients of uh, imatinib therapy, uh, they showed that at 10 years you do not get uh, a good deep molecular response. So in 2021, um, uh, I would consider imatinib as effective therapy for most of the patients, uh, particularly the patients with low risk SOCAL and the older patients. Um, but also for all CML patients, if you are um, uh, worried about the um, uh, financial uh, costs of the patients. 
Now we know that some of the second generation TKIs have now become generic. So there's no reason why we cannot use the second generation TKIs, certainly for the high risk SOCAL, but also for all patients if we have a generic second TKI that is at a low cost. Uh, certainly the second generation TKIs are useful in the younger patients, particularly uh, the patients in whom treatment discontinuation earlier on is important. So if the endpoint of therapy in CML is survival or the, all the TKIs are effective, if the endpoint is treatment discontinuation and treatment-free remission, uh, then the second generation TKIs may get you there a little bit earlier. So let's look at deep molecular response and treatment discontinuation. And here for the purpose of uh, the discussion, a deep molecular response is not uh, a complete molecular response. So you do not have the patients to have a PCR of 0%. They can be uh, a deep molecular response with a PCR of less than 0.01%. So a reduction to uh, four log. A durable deep molecular response of two years or more, if you stop therapy, will give you a treatment-free remission of 50%. At MD Anderson, we continue the treatment for a durable deep molecular response, so MR4, for mm -hmm. five years or more, and we stop, and then the treatment free remission goes up to 50%. So let me show you some of the literature data. So this is uh, the German study, which followed the earlier studies where the patients were treated uh, for a deep molecular response, uh, which was defined as MR4, so PCR of 0.01% for a year or more, and then they stop therapy. And what you see is that, um, as expected, um, uh, close to 60% of the patients were relapsed in this analysis. Uh, also, it's important to know that even though uh, in the early experience, people said uh, that all the patients who were relapsed were relapsed in the first two years, we noticed that 15% of the patients will relapse in the third year or more. So it's very important to continue to monitor the patients beyond the second year. Now, I do not do a PCR every month in the first year. I do it every two months, and that's good enough in our studies. Mm -hmm. uh, by the second year, we do it every three months. And by the third year uh, and longer, we do it every four to six months. And we've never had issues with patients progressing and not able to catch them early on. So by multivariate analysis, it is known that the duration of TKI therapy and the duration of deep molecular response affect the long-term treatment free remission rate. So uh, also it's important to know that the success of treatment free remission depends on the discontinuation criteria. So in the Euroski study, they stopped uh, after one year of the deep molecular response defined as MR4. And so this is where uh, over 60% of the patients have relapsed. In the STEM study, uh, they required a two-year um, duration of the deep molecular response less than 0.00032%. Um, uh, and this is where they got a treatment-free remission of um, uh, 50 or 60%. So at MD Anderson, we did uh, things a little bit differently. We said we're going to keep the patients for a deep molecular response of five years or more. And then we compared the outcome to the patients who stopped earlier because of side effects. And we see a big difference in the long-term treatment free remission. And that's why we advocate for uh, continuing the TKIs for a deep molecular response of five years or more. We have updated at the last ASH meeting uh, our data, uh, and we compared the patients who were in deep molecular response for uh, five years or uh, periods of less than that. And what we find is that in the patients who were in deep molecular response for less than five years and in whom we stop therapy, uh, you can still achieve a durable uh, treatment free remission in about 50% of the patients. But among the patients where we continued for five years or more, that goes up to 80%. So this is our practice today. Now, what about the patients who uh, uh, have a molecular uh, relapse and we restart the TKI therapy? So this slide is to reassure you that if the patients relapse molecularly and you restart therapy, 
uh, over 80% of them will regain a complete molecular response. So there's no worry uh, that the patients will not get that. Now, what about allogeneic transplantation? So here I show that um, if you have a patient uh, who receives an allogeneic transplantation, uh, who, who is over the age of 40 and where the transplant was done beyond a year, you can cure 55% of the patients. So a lot of the patients will die from complications of the treatment as opposed to initiating a second generation TPI where the estimated five-year survival is close to 80% with either melotinib or with desatinib. So I do not practice analogenic transplantation um, uh, immediately at salvage one. I go to a second generation TPI. So what about the timing of transplantation? So um, again, I consider allogeneic transplantation for patients who have true resistance to a second generation TPI. So if you have a patient who uh, stops a second generation TPI, imatinib, uh, uh, I'm sorry, nilotinib, desatinib, or bosutinib, um, if they stop for toxicity, I recycle another second generation TPI. If they stop because of resistance to a second generation TPI, there's no point in recycling the second generation TPI. You have to go with a third generation TKI, such as ponatinib or uh, perhaps asiminib, and can consider an allogeneic transplant. So consider a first scenario where a patient has resistance to imatinib. I would do a second generation TKI before the allogeneic transplantation. In scenario two, is a patient with resistance to a second generation TKI. Now, if the mutation is 299 or 317, then you try nilotinib. If there is uh, no guiding um, uh, resistant mutation, then it is quite legitimate to consider allogeneic transplantation in a younger patient. Um, the alternative will be um, uh, to go with the third generation TKI, such as ponatinib. Now, if you have a patient with a T315I mutation, you could try ponatinib, uh, but then you have to consider seriously an allogeneic transplant if the patient is a younger candidate. Now, if you have a patient who is older, so 65, 70 and older, and they relapse, I do not consider transplantation if they have resistance to a second generation TKI. I would add something because most of these patients can continue in their normal life even if they do not achieve a complete cytogenetic response. So a scenario would be a 70 year old man who has a cytogenetic relapse after a second generation TKI, and even after ponatinib, I would keep them on the TKI and add something like oral decytabine, subcutaneous azacitabine, low-dose RAC. Uh, these patients will probably live their normal life, um, and uh, I would prefer this to, uh, to uh, transplant who will, uh, uh, that will uh, worsen the quality of life in these patients. Now let's talk uh, briefly about salvage therapy. So in a patient who fails imatinib frontline therapy, um, uh, particularly for toxicity, but also for resistance, there are multiple options. Now, desatinib is approved in the salvage at 100 milligrams a day, nilotinib 400 twice daily, bosutinib is 500 milligrams daily, and the ponatinib is approved at 45 milligrams daily, but I show you that you need the 45 milligrams only for T315I mutation. If you have resistance without the T315I mutation, you can do the 30 milligrams safely and go to 15 milligrams if the PCR goes less than 1%. And we have to add uh, now the option of the, um, um, of, uh, of the uh, asimenib in this setting, asimenib as salvage therapy in these patients. And I will discuss this a uh, few uh, slides later. So let's look at salvage therapy. So this is salvage therapy in patients um, uh, who failed imatinib and received desatinib. What you see is that um, the majority achieve a complete cytogenetic response and even a major molecular response. And the seven year survival is 65%. So this is better than if the patients undergo an allogeneic transplantation. And this shows uh, the long-term survival, and uh, what you see is that 
um, 100 milligrams daily is as good as the higher doses. So I never use a higher dose of the satinib anymore, even in the accelerated or plastic phase. This is the data with patients um, uh, who fail imatinib and receive a post as second generation TKI. Uh, again, I divide them by imatinib resistance or intolerance. Uh, the incidence of com complete cytogenetic response is 50%. And when you look at the estimated survival rate, uh, now at 10 years, it's quite good. Um, uh, so the green curve are uh, the, the uh, uh, MOVE curve is the overall population. So what you see is that 70% of the patients, even though they are in the salvage setting, are alive at about 10 years. Now, this data contrasts a little bit um, uh, with the data uh, of the randomized trial of asimenib versus bosutinib, which I'll show you next. Now, what about nilotinib as salvage therapy? Again, um, uh, the data looks uh, very good with this. Uh, this is the study of patients who uh, had a suboptimal response of imatinib, and they either were switched to nilotinib or continued on imatinib. And what you see is that early on, the nilotinib improves the incidence of deep molecular response, but ultimately by the third and fourth year, uh, the imatinib catches up with that. So um, uh, suboptimal response may not be an indication to, stop uh, to, to switch therapy. Many people are uh, scared of ponatinib because it's a toxic drug. So uh, the question is, is it as toxic as it has been implied? And what are the long-term outcomes? So this is the data with the early ponatinib experience in 450 patients, 270 of them in chronic phase. Uh, and they receive ponatinib 45 milligrams daily. And what you see is that the large majority of the patients, uh, whether they have a T315I in green or resistance intolerance, do very well uh, with the complete cytogenetic response rate of 60 to 70 percent uh, and the deep molecular response rate uh, or an MMR rate of 40 percent uh, up to 60 percent with the T315I mutation. More importantly is the estimated five-year survival. So these are patients who have failed um, uh, also second generation TKI and what you see is the estimated five-year survival is quite high, uh, 70 percent. Now, what about the dose of imatinib? So this is a study where, uh, what about the dose of ponatinib? So this is a study where the patients were initially randomized to ponatinib 45 milligrams daily or 30 milligrams or 15 milligrams daily. Once they achieved the complete cytogenetic response, all of them went down to 15 milligrams daily. So this is a study which was sponsored by the company and the company um, uh, stated that 45 milligrams daily is the ideal dose. I think it is true for T315I mutation, where uh, compared to other doses, uh, the outcome with T315I mutation uh, with 45 milligrams is better. The incidence of complete cytogenetic response was 60% versus 25 or 10%. So for a patient with a T315I mutation, you start with 45 milligrams daily until you get a complete cytogenetic response. The data is less clear if you have other no mutations or no mutations, because even though numerically the incidence of complete cytogenetic response is higher, 54 versus 41 or 44%, when you look at the survival, it's 90%, 93%, and 94%. So starting with 45 milligrams daily is not uh, necessary for patients without a T315I mutation. And in fact, when you start with the lower dose of 30 milligrams, the incidence of the worrisome vasoocclusive disease becomes much less. It goes down from 5% uh, to lower levels with the 30 uh, milligrams. Now let's talk about asimenib, which is the newcomer uh, on, on the list of third generation TKIs. Uh, so, as you know, uh, the asimenib has been approved by the FDA uh, last year for the treatment of, um, um, uh, of patients with CML who have failed um, uh, frontline and salvage therapy. And the Pufotel trial was a phase three trial in third line comparing asimenib to bosutinib, which is FDA approved for third line therapy. 
And uh, what we, uh, so this is called the assemble trial. So the patients uh, were patients in chronic phase who had failure or intolerance to their more recent TKIs. Uh, they uh, should not have had a T315 or a 299 mutation. Uh, in order to account for uh, the sensitivity to bosutinib, um, and they were randomized to asimenib 40 milligrams twice daily or bosutinib 500 milligrams once daily. Now, note the dose of asimenib is 40 milligrams twice daily because for a T315I mutation, the dose is actually five times higher, 200 milligrams twice daily. So let's look at the results of the assembled trial. So patients were randomized on a two-to-one basis to either asimenib or bosutinib. And that study clearly showed that uh, at six months, which was the endpoint of the study, the incidence of major molecular response was significantly higher with asimenib, as was the incidence of complete cytogenetic response. So this is shown uh, more clearly in the setting, um, a higher rate of major molecular response a higher rate of complete um, uh, cytogenetic response. And that um, incidence of the difference at six months persisted later on. And this led to the FDA approval of Asimenib uh, for salvage therapy. But also the FDA decided to approve the drug for T315I mutation. Now, uh, some of the issues with this study is the fact that treatment discontinuation for uh, any grade toxicity was very high on the bosutinib arm, which is slightly different from uh, the previous studies uh, that I showed you. Um, uh, and the discontinuation for adverse effects was much higher uh, on the bosutinib arm, mostly because of G GI toxicity and liver dysfunction. Now, uh, how about asimenib in T315I mutations? So if you look at the published literature, there have been 32 patients with T315I mutation treated with asimenib. Only 12 of them had resistance to ponatinib. Uh, and when you look at the data, you notice that uh, asimenib is quite effective. So in the patients who were untreated with ponatinib, the incidence of major molecular response was about 60%. In the patients who were ponatinib resistance or intolerance, and these are only 12 patients, the incidence of uh, uh, major molecular response was less so. Uh, and also, um, uh, uh, the note that the asimenib uh, 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 on this study was 200 milligrams twice daily, which uh, would increase the cost significantly. Now, what about other third-generation uh, BCR-ABLE TKI? I want to highlight the Ascentage drug, uh, the HQP1351, because there's quite uh, a bit of data on this one. So this drug is called Ovelarambatinib, uh, a mouthful. Uh, it is a third-generation oral TKI, which is also active against T315I mutation. The drug has been approved in China, but there's no approval of outside of China. But the company has updated recently at the ASH meeting the data in 100 uh, patients in chronic phase CML. Uh, and what they show is that 60% uh, 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 of the patients had the T315I mutation. So, what, uh, so uh, about uh, 50 patients, um, uh, actually about 60 patients had the T315I mutation. So what the investigators have shown is that the drug is effective. The incidence of complete cytogenetic response is 62%. Uh, major molecular response is 51%. And this study has been ongoing in China for quite a while. So they show actually a three to four year survival rate of close to 90, per, uh, close to um, uh, progression free survival of cl close to 96% um, in the chronic phase. Even in the accelerated phase, the drug looks quite effective. So. Uh, this is just to make you aware of the possibility of newer drugs coming along. Now, what about uh, chronic myeloid leukemia and transformation? So patients with accelerated or blastic phase. So many people still use TKIs as single agents. <laughs> I do not think they should be used in this uh, setting. I think in accelerated or blastic phase, we should use the TKIs in combination. In accelerated phase, we add either the cytabine 
or is a cytidine or even low dose RSE. In the lymphoid blast crisis, we do the hyper CVAD with the third generation TPI. In the myeloid blast crisis, it's an AML type therapy uh, with, um, with uh, uh, second or third generation TPI. So here I show that on the left side in accelerated phase, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, salvage therapies are quite effective uh, with an estimated eight year survival of 75%. Now in the plastic phase, we have improved the survival, but still most of the patients uh, since 2000 have done poorly. We have more recent data uh, at MD Anderson that shows in about 500 patients treated uh, that combinations of TKIs by multivariate analysis is important, that lymphoid blast crisis uh, is more favorable because you can use the hyper CVAD with ponatinib, and that it is important to still take the patients to allergenic transplantation. Now, uh, this is to show you that more recently, the uh, um, investigators from uh, England reported in Lancet hematology in 17 patients with myeloid blast crisis on the combination of flag ida with ponatinib. Uh, so they were able to get most of the patients in the chronic phase. Uh, still, what you see is the long-term outcome is not that great. So you have to uh, refer these patients to a blastic phase. If the patients are older, I would do, use the cytabine uh, with, uh, with uh, venetoclax and ponatinib and try to get them to a transplant. So in summary, in 2022, we have excellent frontline therapy. Uh, we have uh, second line options, which are uh, fantastic, including the addition of ponatinib and asimenib uh, to these. And in the third line setting, we have asimenib, which has been FDA approved, and uh, I hope it will be available in Jordan for uh, you to consider it as one of the treatment options. And we have uh, also, three novel exciting third generation TKIs, um, uh, and the one from China is quite, uh, quite advanced, and we hope it will get an FDA approval. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Akub, for the nice presentation. You elaborated the uh, huge difference in treating uh, CML patients in the last few decades uh, with a huge difference in the outcome and the options. The floor is now open for discussion. Ahmed. Thank you, Professor Hakoub, for this uh, comprehensive, updated, and simplified lecture. I am Dr. Talfah from KHCC. Uh, my question was your recommendation regarding first line treatment for a young high risk female, I mean, childbearing agent. Uh, do you recommend to start first line as a standard of care, or do you recommend to do a mutational analysis and to start the treatment accordingly? So I would not recommend doing a mutation analysis at diagnosis because it's not going to guide you. There are no uh, mutations because there's no pressure of a TKI to allow the evolution of the mutations. So you have a young patient, a woman who wants to uh, become pregnant, and this is a uh, catch-22 because uh, if you look at the second generation TKI, there's data on the setting in the setting, the incidence of uh, of uh, uh, fetal malformations is higher than with imatinib. So if a woman decides to get on a second generation TKI uh, to be able to achieve a durable deep molecular response early and become pregnant, you have to make sure that she does not get pregnant on the second generation TKI uh, and that she gets pregnant after discontinuing the second generation TKI in a deep molecular response. So the choices uh, in uh, if a young woman who has lower risk and wants to get pregnant would be imatinib or a second generation TKI, nilotinib or desatinib. Uh, but if they get on the nilotinib or desatinib, you have to be very, very cautious that they do not pre get pregnant on this because the incidence of fetal malformation reported with desatinib is 10% with nilotinib it has not been reported, but the data shows that the incidence of mutations is much less. Now, you added the fact that she has high risk CML. So in a patient with higher risk CML, I would probably use the second generation TKI 
uh, nilotinib or desatinib, uh, and I would watch them very carefully in this setting. Dr. Khaled Halahla. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor Hardum. Uh, uh, very comprehensive talk. Uh, yeah, we're, we're shining away from the allergenic pulmonary transplant, and I looked on the 10 year survival for our series of patients since 2003, and the, the eight year survival was in the range of 55 60 percent. Uh, we're not doing a transplant unless you fail two lines of therapy. We, we, we have a problem getting panatinib sometimes. So uh, it came to my mind uh, with shining away from the aloe probably of, because of lots of toxicities, including uh, probably the risk of secondary malignancies. C can you comment on the risk of secondary malignancies for those relapsing patients uh, getting second and third generation TKIs? Is there any data? C can, can you elaborate on that a little bit, please? Thank you. So I do not know whether patients with CML are predisposed to second cancers at a higher risk than a normal individual and whether the TKI is predisposed to second cancers. Certainly, we have seen patients who develop second cancers, uh, pan pancreatic cancer, uh, GI tumors. These are the ones that uh, I, I recall more vividly because they are uh, in a functional molecular cure, then they develop pancreatic cancer and they are death, dead within six months. We attempted to do an analysis of the SEER data to see whether patients with CML uh, are at a high risk of second cancers, and we could not demonstrate that. So yes, you do see patients with second cancers and they die from second cancers, uh, but there's no data to uh, affirm or to confirm that second uh, that TKIs are contributing to the second cancers. I think it's simply that the patients are living much longer than uh, the, we used to anticipate, and they are developing second cancers as a result of being people who are alive. We'll take the last question of Dr. Mohammed okay. Salam. I cannot hear the question of Dr. Mohammed yes. Salam. So yeah, something... thank you. Thank you very much for such great presentation. Unfortunately, I came late, but regarding the three molecules which you described in your in your uh, talk, uh, I cannot remember them because it's very harsh for me to remember all these three names. But uh, what do you think about two things? One is the cost of all those medication, how much they cost, and the second thing is the incidence of cardiovascular complication in, in comparison to to Ronatani, what do you think about those two important things? So these are both very important questions. For first, the cost of therapy. I personally consider the patented TKIs and the patented cancer drugs are as extremely expensive and not justifiably so. I may be in a minority opinion in this sense. sense. So I, I'm kind of very happy that now we have available imatinib at a low cost. So, in fact, in the United States, we can get imatinib today at $17 per month, which is amazing. So, finally, we got to a point where the cost of the drug is reasonable. There are also second-generation TKIs, uh, which have become uh, available as generics. And that's why I said um, uh, the issue is not that important. Now, you point out uh, the issue of um, um, toxicities with second generation TKI, uh, which are higher than with imatinib. So this is true. The incidence of cardiovascular complications are higher with nilotinib and desatinib compared to imatinib. The drug that is the least cardiovascular is actually bosutinib, but then bosutinib, you have to deal with other toxicities like GI toxicity, renal dysfunction, and liver dysfunction. So there's always um, uh, a risk benefit, including a cost benefit, but I think the cost benefit is uh, much better nowadays. Now, as you point out, the third generation TKIs, which we need, including ponatinib and asimenib, are still patented and at very high cost. Uh, and in some areas, the cost of transplant is only 20,000 or 40,000 or 100,000, which is less than the cost of ponatinib. Uh, or asimilib in the United States for a year. So this is why once the patients fail the second generation TKI, 
in emerging nations, it's very legitimate to consider going with a transplant rather than a third generation TKI because the cost can be prohibitive to an individual or uh, to, to the uh, healthcare system of a particular country. Uh, thank you, Dr. Could I ask a question, please? Dr. Hako, last question, please. Yes. I have a patient, she's pregnant since five months. Her white BC is 100. We cannot control that with interferon. How could you manage this case? So this is a patient who is pregnant and you you decided to treat her with interferon therapy, right? Yeah, she's no case of CML, but she uh, got a pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Aubaydat, just to um, clarify, does she have Philadelphia positive CML or not? Yeah, she's no case of CML. She was in, on imatinib. We stopped the uh, imatinib because she is uh, getting a pregnancy. Okay. Uh, after five months, uh, she, ha uh, she has a rising white BC. She's a white BC is 100. And we uh, uh, start to inter interferon. We cannot control what, what we see. We did the uh, leukophoresis for her. What no, do you think is the next so. step for this? Well, well, when do we safely uh, resume the TKI? So there's no data on safely resuming the TKI during the pregnancy. Uh, that data has to come out from um, uh, countries where somehow the patients discontinued on the TKI. And I, and I know that there are instances where they've continued, but I have not seen the data on the fetal malformation. Now, Dr. Arbaidat, after this first trimester, the incidence of fetal malformations will be less, but I have not used a TKI um, uh, in the second or third trimester. So what I do is in the first trimester, if they need um, cytoreduction, I use leukophoresis. In the second and third trimester, rather than interferon, I have used hydroxyurea because interferon has its own toxicity. So in this patient, I would probably start hydroxyurea, uh, probably one to two grams to control the white cell count to 10,000 because by the time of the delivery, you want the counts to be normal. Otherwise, they are at the higher risk of bleeding and complications. So in this patient, I would start the hydroxyurea until the delivery, and then I would do the TKI. I do not have experience with starting TKIs, uh, including imatinib, during the pregnancy. I know that there's data from other countries where they've done so, and the case reports suggest that there are no fetal malformation, but we do not have 100 patients to look at the incidence of the fetal malformation. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. for uh, the presentation and for his continuous contribution to the uh, our region and to Jordan in particular for hematological malignancy and CML. And uh, I wish we have more time to continue with this nice discussion, but we have to end this session. Thank you so much. and. Uh, Hopefully, hopefully we'll see you next time in person. Thank you for inviting me. Take care. Thank you. بس بدنا نحكي
Professor Sardar? Yes, hello. Uh, you, you are with us? Good. I am, and uh, I hope you see my slides. Uh, we can see. Uh, uh, oh, yes, we can see the first slide. Yes. Okay. Um, we start. I am ready. Uh, okay. Yeah. So now moving on. Now we will be uh, presenting the next session. Uh, I'm very happy to present our next speaker, uh, Professor Sardan uh, Vercio Vsek, who is uh, a professor in the Department of Leukemia, University of Texas, and the Anderson Cancer Center. He's also the director of Hans A. Billings Clinical Research Center, and he also the chief of the section for myeloproliferative neoplasm at the University of Texas in the Anderson Cancer Center. He comes to us with a very remarkable um, uh, profile in the, in, in the field of myelofibrosis. He's, uh, he's got more than 450 publications uh, in the field. He, um, he has edited more than 24 chapters in different books, and he has co-authored another uh, four books. We, we are very, very happy to have you with us, Professor Sardan, today, and we are looking forward to your presentation. And uh, now I will give you a chance now to start, uh, and then we will be very happy also to uh, to have a discussion with you about uh, about myelofibrosis. Uh, we we can start now. Okay. Thank you very much for a kind invitation. It's a real honor and a pleasure to join you today for a talk on a myelofibrosis, which is dear to my heart. I do myelofibrosis 100% in my work life uh, since about 2004. So the topic of interest, as you see on my slide, is how to improve prognosis. I, I see, okay. Okay, so what I'm talking about today is uh, perhaps best presented by the photos. And I'm going to talk about what you can see here. You see uh, on the left side a presentation to my clinic of an older patient in, with advanced myelofibrosis. You can appreciate all the problems uh, with the massive weight loss, cachectic, and uh, not doing well. On the right side is the same person seven years later. I'm not talking about the elimination of the disease. I'm not talking about the transplant as a tool here to make people live longer. I'm just talking about people taking jack inhibitor and controlling the disease signs and symptoms, and that makes them live longer. So what's the evidence of a life prolongation with jack inhibitors in uh, myelofibrosis? And we have to go back to 2014, where Dr. Passamonti, who is uh, one who made uh, a DIPSS scoring system, look at the comparison of outcome between patients on uh, comfort studies, these are the studies that led to ruxolitinib approval, versus uh, this uh, database that he used for uh, making DIPSS uh, prognosis scoring system. And as you can see in this uh, graph from the publication in blood, there was already in 2014, a very good evidence, statistically significant evidence that survival can be prolonged even when the patients are matched between their characteristics in these two databases. So that gave rise to further analysis of uh, survival in many other uh, databases. And, and let's move to some of more recent ones. This is 2020. This is the real world survival in patients with malfibrosis in the United States in the general federal database. And here is very simple question. Exposure to ruxolitinib or no exposure to ruxolitinib? No exposure means maybe patients are too young and not sick enough to get it. Maybe patients are too advanced. I can't really tell you. But just a cursory look at the federal database of myelofibrosis patients and their overall survival based on one factor, exposure to ruxolitinib or not, is showing significant differences. You can appreciate that by looking at the graph here on the right side. Furthermore, this is the Medicare claim database. That's a federal database for older people who uh, also provides the medications and durability and complications of the therapy. So a different view of American population of the patients. Here we have a three curves, as you can see on the left side, on the right side. The green one, this is very interesting to me. The green one is the 
survival of the patients before approval of ruxolitinib. So not exposed to ruxolitinib before approval, that is the up to 2011. Remember, in the United States, the ruxolitinib was approved in 2011. Then the red color is post-approval since 2011, so the last decade. So you have 2000 to 2001 in green, and then 2011 to 2020 in the red color. We make progress as we treat patients earlier with major medications, but what you see in the blue line is extra benefit of exposure to ruxolitinib. So data is being, from a retrospective chart reviews, accu accumulating, suggesting very strongly that treatment with ruxolitinib makes a difference. We look at our own ex uh, experience at MD Anderson, where we have a large number of the patients, and on the left side, it's just a very simple look at the, what I was suggesting on the previous slide, just a looking at the survival patients before 2011 and uh, 2010 to 2020. This is on the left side. So more modern approach, perhaps uh, supportive care, transfusions, better medications in general, is providing that survival benefit. But when you look to the right side, you can see that this is different not only for patients with the lower risk patients, one would say earlier intervention, low risk model of fibrosis patients, that's why your curve is different. Even for advanced patients, this would be higher IPSS, intermediate to and high risk, people live longer. So it's not about the timing of a diagnosis, it's about the care. Now, we are not the only ones that are looking at that, but we are quite interested in why would the people live longer and what are clinical scenarios where that clinical benefit is obvious. So more recent paper just published about six months ago, we look at the question about significance of bone marrow blast percentage uh, as a factor for outcome of the patients. And in the panel A in the upper part of this slide, we see clear distinction between patients who have different percent of blast in bone marrow. The best one, in the dark blue are patients 0 to 1%, green 2 to 4, and so on. The red one is the worst one, 10% or more blast. So we say, okay, blast method. But if you move on from A to B to C and to D, you see the two curves in each of them, and each of them presents the treatment with ruxolitinib. So even with increase in the blasts, which make people live shorter, the addition of ruxolitinib to a treatment regimen have that significant prolongation of life. The only one situation where there is no such a benefit as at the bottom of the slide, these are patients with 10 plus blasts. These are accelerated phase patients. Here, the ruxolitinib exposure does not make a difference on survival. I'll tell you from my own experience, it does make a difference on the quality of life, but not on the survival. We are not only one here in the United States that see that difference on the survival when people are exposed to ruxolitinib. This was just published as a paper. It is the prospective observational study in Europe of patients with MPN, where in this particular analysis, you see two curves. This is matched patients that were treated with hydroxyurea or ruxolitinib in Europe. And you can see that ruxolitinib make a difference. People exposed to ruxolitinib versus hydroxyurea with the same clinical characteristics, 50 on each arm, people treated with ruxolitinib live longer. Now, of course, we know about this possibility of making people live longer from the studies. But I wanted you to first have a glimpse on real-world assessment of that benefit. In the study, this is the combination of the survivals in comfort one and comfort two study, that survival benefit was clearly seen. And I may just remind you that in the United States, this particular data here led to uh, adjustments of the label for use of ruxolitinib in 2014, saying by FDA that yes, the drug improves the survival. Now in orange line here is survival of patients that were given ruxolitinib from the day one of therapy in these randomized studies, comfort one and comfort two. These are all patients with intermediate two and high risk. Remember, intermediate and two high risk patients, average survival two to four years. So the orange is ruxolitinib from the beginning. In a gray in the middle, 
are control patients, placebo or best available therapy, among which majority were treated with ruxolitinib after some delay. Delay appears to be the key for having this difference still present. And in blue color are people through statistical analysis that would not be exposed to ruxolitinib at all. No ruxolitinib at all. So the difference between the blue and the orange is about three years. I feel very comfortable saying that ruxolitinib exposed patients on average may live longer for three years. But when I'm gonna go next, it's a little bit of granularity and see who are these people and when is the best timing for introduction of the therapy to get that survival benefit. And even in the clinical study, these are those in intermediate two and high-risk patients from comfort studies, there were differences. The top two line is survival of the patients, orange versus gray, ruxolitinib treated patients versus control arms with the crossover to remember that fact. There is, these are intermediate two risk patients. There is much more life gained by treating early with intermediate two versus high risk. High risk are the bottom two lines. So that theme became important over the last two years and see, is that really true? The next question was, what exactly is happening in the patients? Why would people live longer? And is there a marker, easy to understand and measure marker that would tell us what's the chance of people living longer? And the first publication that identified degree of a spleen reduction by palpation, spleen reduction by palpation as important factor was from 2012. Here is survival of the 107 patients treated with ruxolitinib in phase one two study. The, the green color, the longest survival, is the patients that have 50% or more spleen reduction by palpation on therapy. The light blue, less than a quarter of the spleen gone. Now, this particular information was confirmed in the clinical studies. On the left side, you see a, a plot here that says how much of the spleen is gone by ruxolitinib therapy. If you look to the left side, 10 to 20%, 25 to 30%, and so on, saying that the greater degree of a spleen reduction, the longer the life of the patients, while on control arm, the progressive increase in splenomegaly, shorter survival. What is known from the clinical practice is on the right side as an example. This is from the uh, Northern Italy, looking at the survival of the patients by palpation, again, uh, degree of a spleen reduction matters. The red color versus green color. This is after six months of therapy, those that have a 50% or more spleen reduction by palpation from clinical practice, they live longer. The correct connection between the dose of ruxolitinib and spleen reduction is very well established. In the left upper corner, this is from clinical study, from comfort studies, you can see clearly the degree of a spleen reduction, that's a spleen volume after six months, correlating with the, the dose used. The smaller the dose, let's say five milligrams twice a day in a dark blue, then the orange is 10 milligrams twice a day, and green is even higher and higher. You can clearly see that the higher the dose, the better spleen reduction. So I'm, I'm getting there to close the loop how to best manage the patients and when the best time is. For the symptomatic control, if we only want to monitor the symptoms and nothing else, then in the left lower corner, you have a total symptom score and co connection with the dosing and 10 milligrams twice a day is the maximum dose needed. But even from the clinical practice in Europe, in the community practice, that dose uh, connection with the spleen reduction was seen as well. This is on the right side. You have a, a ruxolitinib starting dose. The higher the starting dose, the more likelihood is to make the spleen smaller. And the further to the right is titration of the ruxolitinib during the first three months also makes a difference. It's the clean message from all these studies that higher the dose, the better the spleen response. And many studies showed also that this, the uh, smaller the spleen becomes, longer the people live. So when is the best timing to introduce the enruxolitinib, considering everything that I said? Better dose, a smaller spleen, and perhaps information from the Comfort One study earlier in the life of the patient. So 
one obvious uh, study to use to analyze this connection is the JUMP study. It's been now for a few years since we learned about this very large study, 2,200 patients over 26 countries, and what, what happened to them. What I'm showing here is simply the degree of a spleen reduction based on the risk of dying. In the red color are low risk in, and intermediate one risk patients together. In the gray are intermediate two risk patients and the blue is high risk patients. And it is time factor from week four all the way. You can see much further down on the right side how long these people were on therapy. What is easy to see, the red color, the low slash intermediate one risk patients were always had the advantage to get the best uh, out of therapy, the smallest, the spleen. Why would that be? Because they receive higher starting dose. Why do they receive higher starting dose? Because they're not so advanced, they have a, less of anemia and thrombocytopenia, for example. Less of cytopenias at the beginning make it easier to manage and make it easier to get the higher dose. This has been known as uh, shown through a number of studies and this particular table compares intermediate two and high risk patients in comfort studies. Remember, these are only intermediate two and high risk patients. These are the top two lanes in this table. And then bottom three lanes are intermediate one risk patients from three other sources, including JUMP study. You can appreciate if you go from the left to the right that the spleen response is better. The next column is the incidence of anemia, less of anemia, then less of thrombocytopenia, less of infections, and fewer discontinuations. So everything points to the fact that earlier intervention, when we talk about risk of dying, earlier intervention, meaning intermediate one or even intermediate two versus high risk, earlier intervention makes a difference for the outcome of the patients. Now, there are other factors that we learn over time. Question was posed to me not too long ago, how about the bone marrow fibrosis gray? Is it very fibrotic or not very fibrotic? Does it make a difference? This was studied actually. As you can see here, impact of bone marrow fibrosis grain on response in patients with primary malfibrosis treated with ruxolitinib. Perhaps we just look at the lower table here. This is spleen response by fibrosis grade from purple, which is grade three. Then you have reddish, green, and blue. The blue is grade zero. So from the studies, it seems that the grade of fibrosis matters. I'm not surprised, gait of fibrosis has been connected with the worsening in anemia, lower platelets, and high grade of dying. So it all makes sense. Now, one paper, if there is one paper that connects this all together, based on the data in 408 patients is this one from Dr. Palandri in Italy, where she says in the summary of the slide, as you can see in the middle of upper slide of, of this slide, the influence of disease stage on quality of response. Spleen symptom response are lower if patients are much advanced. I think from my perspective, this is obvious from the data that I've showed you. Larger spleen, total symptom score at a higher level, lower platelets, transfusion dependency, all are bad omens and these people don't do well. What I'm gonna focus in the next few slides is the Next underlined text, which I didn't appreciate at that time, but this is also important. The time interval between the diagnosis and the start of ruxolitinib. She said in that paper that if you are delaying the therapy start from the diagnosis, that is another factor. I didn't really catch that at that time. In, over, in a lower part of the slide, it says that early amount of fibrosis may tolerate higher ruxolitinib. Of course, they have a better dose, they have a better spleen response, and the efficacy is better. We kind of resolved that. But let's took a look at this time to therapy. Time to therapy as another factor, not just intermediate one versus intermediate two or intermediate two versus high risk, but the time to therapy. So we asked that question in the comfort studies. You can see, again, pooled analysis of comfort one and two studies. Remember, they're all intermediate two and high risk, they all have platelets above 100, so very advanced group of people. And the goal here was to assess the association of the disease duration from the time of diagnosis to the start of ruxolitinib therapy. Completely different view of uh, the earlier intervention. So here we have on the, in the table 
comparison of the clinical characteristics of the patients that were diagnosed within a year and treated within a year, right? This is less than or equal to 12 months. And that the other group of small fibrosis diagnosed more than a year ago. That is the distinction factor. And the characteristics of the patients are about the same. No major differences. This is very interesting to me. I didn't expect this type of results to happen. The time factor from the diagnosis to therapy. You can see on the left side, thrombocytopenia is much more common, advanced uh, patient, uh, thrombocytopenia, in people who had the disease for a longer period of time. And anemia on the right side, much more pronounced in people who had disease for a longer period of time. Now, what about the degree of response then? Of course, if you have more anemia and thrombocytopenia, the response should be different as well, which is the case. In the, gra in the bars here on the left side, you have a blue color. This is ruxolitinib-treated patients within a year, and a green color, ruxolitinib-treated patients past the one year from diagnosis, and this is the response rate. You can appreciate the differences. Who would say so? It makes a difference. What is the time from the diagnosis to therapy for intermediate to and high-risk patients? The same characteristics, but the time factor is important. And then, of course, durability of such response is better. This is in a graph on the right side. People that were treated within a year, intermediate to and high-risk patients within a year of diagnosis, have a much longer durability of a response. And I would bet that this also is a factor in a survival benefit. So in this group of people, survival benefit for earlier intervention, the top two lines here is obvious. The blue line, people treated within a year. The green uh, line, people treated past one year. Some of this was seen in a control arm as well. Remember, they were also treated with ruxolitinib, great majority of them as well. So. Time to therapy, in terms of the diagnosis to therapy, appears to be another factor. And that brings us, the survival benefit, to a very important question. I'm often asked these days, well, if the survival benefit is real, and you can see it, you take your analysis to your heart and see, is this real or not from your own experience? I believe it, I see it all the time. When is the best time to transplant? And we would typically say, well, you optimize the care of the patients, you make them feel good. Within six months, you get what you get from ruxolitinib. You should go to transplant in best possible shape for the patient. Well, maybe not. This is from Canada, from ASH to 2020. Uh, they look at those patients that received a short course of six months of uh, uh, ruxolitinib or any JAK inhibitor and then went to transplant versus those that just stayed on the JAK inhibitors past one year at least. And this is the survival curve. Look, the blue line is what you get with the JAK inhibitors without, in Canadian experience, without the transplant. In the red line is the transplant. Well, mortality is pretty high at the beginning. And then the catch up after about five years, five, six years. So one can argue that you are losing unnecessarily so much life here by earlier intervention and you can wait because people may live longer with a good control of signs and symptoms and maybe you just need to time the transplant when you see first signs of loss of response. See a first signs of loss of response. Not when you lose the, all the benefit, but when there is a signs of loss of response. Now, there are other factors that may affect the overall outcome of therapy. This is our own analysis where we look at the, these mutation profiles of patients on ruxolitinib. So there are other co-founders here. In our experience, these three mutations on the left side are the one responsible to some degree, as you can see, on a degree or durability of response. Everybody has a chance to respond, but these particular mutations may affect the, the durability and degree of response or even their number. And others, of course, looked at other factors, not just the time or, or a risk of dying. And here is one external paper from Blood Advances in 2017. In their own experience, this is different group of, of investigators, they say that the transfusion dependence is the one of the major factors. Of course, anemia, very bad anemia is a major factor, as I already point pointed this out, in affecting what you can do for the patients. High DIPC score, 
and the mutational profile. They overlap, of course, because the pro prognostic scoring systems include some of these factors, and these factors in this particular experience led to decreased time to treatment failure and decreased survival. In that sense, yes, with knowledge about these particular mutations or having people who are already anemic very much and transfusion requiring, you should get to transplant earlier. But it's not for everybody that they need to go to transplant right away after a few months of ruxolitinib anymore. I think the time is changing. Now, what's the main reason for stopping ruxolitinib? It is anemia. People ask the question, what's the name of the first problem that appears that eventually leads to an interruption of the, of the therapy? Eventually, ruxolitinib is not given. Anemia appears to be number one reason. How we can look at anemia, we can say, first of all, that anemia that develops through the therapy does not affect overall benefit. We probably know that. Uh, this is on the left side, the degree of a spleen reduction in green color, treated, ruxolitinib treated patients with or without anemia, same degree of a spleen reduction, whereas in gray color, the control patients, they get worse, of course. On the right side, the quality of life improvements, again, in the green colors, with or without anemia, on ruxolitinib people get better. Symptoms get better even with development of anemia which is not the case in green colors. So baseline anemia is not contraindications for ruxolitinib use. It certainly can affect the dosing. I'm going to talk about this in a second. But in terms of improvement in quality of life and the spleen, no difference with or without ruxolitinib-induced anemia. I want to move on to that the management of patients that are anemic at the beginning already to get the best out of therapy. And I'm going to tell you about this if you are not familiar with this paper. It was published in uh, spring of last year in journal Leukemia. This is a realized study which provides alternative dosing regimen for patients that are anemic at the start of ruxolitinib therapy, all in the uh, with, all with the goal to get people to benefit the most, and in my view, to get the smallest spleen possible in a safe way. To, to live longer. So starting with 10 milligrams twice a day in people who have hemoglobin less than 10, have a big spleen and don't feel well, and then going up from 10 to 15 to 20 to 25 if you can, and if you need, of course, a need is to get the spleen as small as possible, you will get good response. You can see waterfall here. This is all bipalpation, and Dr. Cervantes said that about 56% of the patients have a, half of the spleen gone by this alternative dosing regimen, which appears to be even safer, of course. This is hemoglobin levels over time in this study. There is no drastic dip in the red blood cell count because you go from low to high instead of high to low. This resembles very well what we do in people with low platelets. So in a way, we are simplifying the management by saying start with low, that's okay, but don't stay low. Low is good for quality of life, 10 milligrams twice a day, but go to higher dose to get the spleen uh, small, as small as possible. That would be next step to get the survival benefit. So here are waterfalls on the recently published study in people with platelets between 50 and 100, two different groups. Bottom line appears that you can start with 10 million twice a day in people with low platelets and then perhaps go up. Now, are there factors that would predict a failure while you are treating patients? There are not too many, and one of them is a significance, uh, as you can see here, of leukocytosis while you treat patients with the ruxolitinib. 217 patients were looked at, and about 20% uh, developed over time leukocytosis, 4, 10, 15% after 1, 3, and 5 years, and that was a prelude to loss of a control. So onset of leukocytosis, uncontrolled increase in white blood cell count is the signs of pending JAK inhibitor failure, perhaps due to underlying clonal evolution. Just one factor to know from your own practice uh, or look at your own practice and, and see who has progressive leukocytosis. It's a not a good sign. Now, why would the ruxolitinib make people live longer? Now, one factor here, usually people ask, how about the JAK2 allele burden? 
it does go down actually it does but it's not going to go away so there is modification of allele burden over time that's shown here in ruxolitinib treated patients in the dark blue and a crossover patient so it does go down now the next one that people usually say is what about and let me show that slide what about the bone marrow fibrosis it can also improve not that i tell people to get the bone marrow biopsies every every year or two but it can improve improvement in bone marrow fibrosis has been seen after four or five years of therapy and of course you need that time factor for fibrosis to slowly go away so you have decrease in allele burden you have improvement in a bone marrow fibrosis in about a, a third of the patients significant uh, decrease over time uh, but you really need to understand what the mechanism action of this drug is one is inhibition of jack one and the other one is inhibition of jack two the two together will be anti-proliferative and anti-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory part appears to me to be actually the leading uh, reason why people feel better and why they live longer the myofibrosis is a very inflammatory condition you see the red colors these are all heat that's a heat map of many of the cytokines that are very high in myofibrosis patients Dr. Deferi published in JCO some years ago that some of them are actually prognostically relevant. So modification of the cytokines and decrease in inflammation may be uh, why people live longer. This is how ruxolitinib works, inhibition of proliferation and inhibition of inflammation as well. So what happens on the therapy as published some years ago, from red to green, and there was a clear correlation between quality of life and improvements in cytokine levels, as is depicted in the lower part of this slide. Selected uh, number of uh, cytokines was tested for that correlation, and it was clearly correlated. I don't have it for overall survival as of yet. But practically, people have higher albumin. You can see this on the left side. They have a higher cholesterol. They have a better body weight, which is on the right side. They walk more. They can sustain disease for much longer, and that's why they live longer. And finally, they also improve the organ function. That may not be known very well. This is improvement in the kidney function on ruxolitinib. You can see on the left side uh, a renal improvement at, at least 10% on ruxolitinib treated patients versus matched control. These are matched patients. And on the right side, correlation between the improvement in the kidney function and failure-free survival. So people walk more, they have a better metabolism, they have better organ function, and that's why they live longer. Now, you can even rechallenge patients with ruxolitinib after initial failure. That has been now published by several groups. There is no acquired resistance to it. In fact, uh, uh, you can rechallenge after washout about a few weeks. You can see here, this is a spleen size response. The blue line are vertical lines. This is the first time spleen response. The green is second line, second challenge, and the yellow is the third time around. So you can keep going with the challenges. And I'm going to close here with the rechallenged patients also live longer. So this was from Italy, Dr. Polandri in blood 2020. Patients that were rechallenged with ruxolitinib versus those that did not. I'm talking about the ruxolitinib failures that are not on ruxolitinib for one or other reasons. They are given ruxolitinib again after some weeks. They have that survival benefit as well. So another evidence of potential to control that inflammation and proliferation in a positive way for making pe people live longer. But it's all about the timing. Earlier intervention in terms of time for diagnosis and therapy and earlier with the risk of dying also having a significant feature as a bad omen for the patients so i want to thank you so much for your uh, time listening to me on myofibrosis and how to actually move from assessing the quality of life to controlling the spleen as much as possible all in order to make people live longer so i thank you so much and looking forward for to a lovely uh, discussion Thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Verchovsek, for this quite uh, quite impressive and a quite great talk on such an interesting topic. And uh, now I think we we have five seven minutes to uh, give some chance for questions. If, um, 
Dr. Mohamed Salam. Thank you very much for such interesting presentation. I want to ask you regarding the COVID era and the COVID era using Jagavi. Fortunately or unfortunately, we have few patients who are having a flare up phenomena because we stop the Jagavi for them either because they are they are not even telling that the patient I am not in Jagavi or because they became on ventilator. How do you approach those patients to prevent such phenomena? This is really an excellent question, and I would hope that uh, there are more information out of uh, Europe or United States in particular on uh, outcome patients with COVID uh, and myeloproliferative neoplasms. What we know so far is that uh, in people who are on therapy with the ruxolitinib and uh, acquire COVID, the number one rule is not to stop the therapy. Not to stop the therapy because Dr. Barbui from Europe published that upon abrupt interruption of therapy, you will get a worse outcome of the patients. There, there is increased risk of dying, increased risk of dying. So it's not trivial. And why would that happen? Remember that even in the people who are otherwise fine, they don't have a COVID. When you stop ruxolitinib in people who are responding, you have this rebound in inflammation and some of them may actually end up in ICU on ventilators. So that's known. And in the COVID, COVID is inflammatory condition in a way. If you stop ruxolitinib, you get people to die more. So we don't stop at all, ever, regardless of the counts or a clinical condition. We try to give them through Dophoff tube or some other way uh, orally, right, through the GI tract uh, ruxolitinib, not to endanger their life, basically. And that uh, gives me the opportunity to tell you about the other side of the coin. We want to optimize the care of all the patients in case they get COVID, because the outcome is much better in people who have very good control of signs and symptoms, being ET, PV, or myofibrosis. Not to say, hey, I'm not going to treat you for now. I'm fine with whatever condition you are because of the COVID. We would actually do the other way around. Let's optimize the care of everybody as much as possible in case there is a COVID so that you don't get a thrombotic event with the COVID, which we, we all know happens in uncontrolled ET or PV patients, for example, which I have seen, right? So I'm trying to optimize the care of everybody. Thank you, Dr. Khaled. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, you know, some patients can progress on, 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 on Jakavi. Yeah. Uh, and and, and uh, I have a patient, young lady, uh, who is who, who received uh, 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 raxalitinib since was approved, uh, and and uh, he progressed like after like seven or eight years, and now he's having I would say accelerating phase with increasing peripheral blast, four or five percent more more blast, and his IPI is is, is at a higher level. Uh, so the question: Would you proceed in such patient for second generation fedratinib, for example? Or would you would you prepare those patients for allogeneic pulmonary transplant? Uh, even if you have if you don't have, I mean, match related, you may go for haplo. So so the question is for those failing raxalitinib and the progressing, yes. uh, would you would you prefer to go with the second generation or uh, or you proceed with allogeneic pulmonary transplant? Thank you very much. Clear, clear answer, and I can elaborate. Transplant, transplant as soon as possible not to get to the blastic phase. Uh, the first or second generation JAK inhibitors, ruxolitinib or fedratinib, they do not prevent the progression, as you pointed out in your question. People may progress and they will not lower the blast. They may be ha uh, helping with the signs and symptoms, spleen and quality of life, but they have no influence on the blast. So in this patient, if the donor is ready right away, that's the way to go. If there is a need to control the further progression while you are looking for a donor, we would do the hypomethylation agents on top of ruxolitinib. Vides our dacogen to prevent progression to blastic phase to hopefully decrease the blast because the lower the blast in some studies suggest the better transplant outcome. In fact, my own transplanters here at MD Anderson would say if the blasts are above 10%, which we can argue about, but they say if it's above 10, the transplant outcome is not so good, 
let's decrease those bloods with hypomethylation agents first. Let's try to do that before we go to transplant. So in this accelerated progressive situation, no role for other JAK inhibitors, hypomethylation agents and transplant. And by the way, you also do look for IDH mutations. IDH mutations may be seen in about 20, 25% of the patients as acquired mutation, and then try to use IDH inhibitors. They are very effective. Uh, in these situations, if you have access to those IDH inhibitors. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 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 may I ask two questions, Prof, please? Um, so, one thing that I were always wondered about is the starting dose for roxolitinib when it comes to the platelet count. And knowing that now that the higher the dose is, the more likelihood to getting a, a response in the spleen size and, and maybe the outcome. So, what, why, the, how, how these uh, cutoffs were put and based on what? We know that patients differ uh, when it comes to complications from thrombocytopenia based on multiple factors, their bleeding risk, their age, etc. So, do you go by, by these recommendations to, to hold roxolotinib when the platelet count, for example, crosses or gets below 50,000? Do, do, do you go with these recommendations uh, regardless of the risk factors for the patients? That's the first question. Second question, a quick one. What about uh, the new data emerging about adding balbocyclib to roxolotinib? And do you think this would be a promising um, uh, thing to do, adding the, both agents to maybe achieve, like, well, as, as it said, uh, a better cyto, uh, better uh, response in the in the full blood count and maybe the bone marrow fibrosis. Thank you. Let me answer the very quickly the later question. Yes, there are combinations that are being studied. You mentioned one. There are others uh, where we add another agent to ruxolitinib in, in order to get better response. More of the spleen, more of improvements, and some of them even say maybe even less of a mild suppression and maybe even improvement in anemia. So very active area of combinations to improve the outcome of the patients. Very good point that you made. I didn't talk about it. It's very timely. Include patients in the studies if possible. In terms of the platelets, now the platelets uh, guidelines, and this is how I get them, they are guidelines, were developed, first of all, for safety reasons. Uh, in the phase uh, uh, three studies, as you know, everybody had to have platelets above 100. Why? just to be safe. And then later on, there were those papers, and I showed you one of the slides on that, one of those papers. There are uh, experiences in people uh, that have a lower platelets with ruxolitinib. So, bottom line, if I have a patient who has 60,000 platelets versus 40,000, do I treat the one with 60 and not with 40? Not really. These are only the guidelines. So, I feel comfortable as a hematologist to treat the patients that have 40,000 platelets because I consider those uh, what the guidelines there for me to understand uh, what the community or regulatory body feels about it. But, you know, when I have a patient that needs help, I am less restrictive. I follow this uh, uh, in, in, in a way to help my patients. So we are limited in the dosing, however. These people don't do well. But that does not preclude me to try to help to the patients and bridge the patients to the transplant as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ferchovsek, for this wonderful talk. We, will, we are looking forward to having you again and again, and hopefully live the next few years here in Jordan. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Pleasure.
this is Hope Rugo. Uh, do you still want me to uh, participate? I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Can anyone hear me? I guess I'm not hearing you. That's the problem. No one introduces, right? Uh, uh, yeah, shall we repeat it again? Yeah. It's really my now great. You. Did you hear now me now? I can hear you. Nothing happened on my end. Now I can hear you. <laughs> it's really my great pleasure and honor to introduce for you uh, Professor Hope Rogu. Professor Rogu completed her team on training at UCSF in addition in immunology, in immunology fellowship at Stanford. She joined UCSF and became the director of the breast oncology and the clinical in, at, and clinical trials at UCSF Helen Diller Family Cancer Center. She is a principal investigator for more than uh, uh, many for many clinical trials. And when I saw her CV, there is more than 480 something uh, 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 trials focusing on the novel therapy. Also, she is the co-chair of the safety committee for many randomized clinical trials. In addition, she is still active clinician and she is committed with education. And we saw her almost about three years ago when she visited Jordan and she teaches us a lot about the role of the CD4K inhibitor. Today, she will talk about improving outcome for patients with hormone positive metastatic breast cancer, the role of CD4 CDK inhibitors. Dr. Rugo, the floor for you. Thank you very much for that kind invitation. Presumably you can hear me. Um, okay, so uh, I was asked to talk about, uh, let's see if I can make this work. I don't actually use this WebEx much. We're so Zoom focused, so I'm just trying to make it work. Um, the, uh, I was asked to talk about pelvisiclib and real world data, but we'll start just with a brief overview of CDK46 inhibitors, and hopefully we'll have time to uh, talk. Our, our discussion today is really focusing on real world data and pelvisiclib in this area where we've made uh, remarkable advances. These are my disclosures, and I don't take any compensation for this talk uh, as it's sponsored, uh, a sponsored talk. So, luminal breast cancer, it's the most common subset of breast cancer that we see actually in both early and late stage disease, even in younger women, although uh, certainly we see a lot of triple negative and HER2 positive breast cancer in younger women, still endocrine uh, receptor positive disease predominates. Um, and uh, most of hormone receptor positive disease, as you can see here, are uh, luminal A and B as the light and uh, darker blue colors, uh, but there are subsets that are HER2 enriched, basal like, and normal. There's a lot of interest in trying to understand how those subsets respond to different therapies and potentially to individualized treatment in the future based on these subsets, but we don't really have any data right now to help us with that. There's been some suggestion in retrospective analyses that potentially uh, one uh, targeted therapy may be even more effective in specific subsets versus another subset, but we don't. Uh, we just don't know the truth to that. So there are actually uh, planned now prospective trials looking at different treatments for luminal A versus luminal B metastatic disease. And I think uh, also a trial looking specifically at HER2 enriched. And I think those will be very, very interesting uh, studies. What we do know is that a tiny percentage of tumors are basal-like. And this shows you the metastatic disease about 4% and 13.8% in this early stage. This is a fascinating group. The, these are the normal-like, and then here's the, the basal-like here. It doesn't actually go up. I mean, what you see here is that when you go from early to metastatic disease, what's interesting is this dark blue, which is luminal A, decreases. So you're seeing that you have relatively more increase in luminal B. 
So the tumors actually do shift subtypes as they become metastatic. But what what you're not seeing is a shift in the basal like. You do see less of the normal like, and it may be the normal like is also uh, becoming more HER2 enriched um, or basal like. But you do see this basal like here. Now these basal like tumors don't respond to endocrine therapy at all. And uh, there's another, I think, uh, clinical trial effort trying to understand whether or not we should be separating out those patients initially. That's all beyond the scope of our uh, additional discussion in this uh, in this uh, time slot, but I think it's a fascinating area and one where just in the last couple of years, we've started to understand how further uh, profiling metastatic disease and early stage disease will help us individualize therapy in the future. So CDK4-6 inhibitors have certainly revolutionized the treatment of hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer and now also early stage disease uh, with the Monarch E trial. We're going to focus on metastatic disease and uh, real world data after I just show you these uh, these summaries. And uh, recently, uh, in the last um, now a little more than six months, we've seen further updates from some of the uh, first line trials. The first trial to show a survival benefit was Mona Lisa 7, which treated the high risk group of patients who were pre and perimenopausal at diagnosis of metastatic disease. Um, and then we saw Mona Lisa 2 with a survival benefit uh, seen at uh, ESMO this year uh, with the longest overall survival that's been shown in 63.9 months um, in uh, patients with uh, metastatic disease. These patients had to have a disease-free interval uh, greater than 12 months. Um, so they did uh, represent an endocrine sensitive group of patients. We're waiting for overall survival data from Paloma 2 and Monarch 3, but what's striking is how similar the hazard ratios are for progression free survival in the first line setting in these patients, despite the fact that there are differences in the eligibility. And then in patients who progressed on a prior non steroidal aromatase inhibitor, uh, we have uh, two trials with uh, um, fulvestrant that. Uh, treated patients um, in the second, clearly second line setting, uh, both of which showed an improvement in progression free survival um, and a numerical difference in Paloma 3 that seemed to be confined to the group of patients who hadn't received prior chemotherapy for metastatic disease. Uh, and then in the population who hadn't received any prior chemotherapy in Monarch 2, a statistically significant improvement in uh, overall survival. Mona Lisa 3 is an interesting, unique trial. It looked at patients in the first and second line setting in combination with fulvestrant and ribocyclob versus placebo and showed an overall survival benefit and then a survival benefit in the second line setting um, as well. We've seen in these trials that quality of life is maintained across uh, time, which is nice. Um, there's a little bit of overlap here, which I apologize for. Um, there's no difference in quality of life. In some individual areas, you can see an improvement in quality of life where you've improved, for example, pain or something like that, but it's complicated because the patients are on aromatase inhibitors. The main issue of these, the main goal of these trials was adding a targeted agent often adds toxicity, so those patients then have a deterioration in quality of life. But what's really nice is that across all of the agents and different settings, we see maintenance of quality of life when we add in the CDK4-6 inhibitors, uh, which is great because patients tend to stay on therapy for a long period of time. So, you know, we've seen these randomized trials, but what I showed you there was that there are some differences between the different trials. So you can't really make cross-trial comparisons because the the um, eligibility differs uh, when you enroll the patients differs so that crossover uh, may differ significantly between the different uh, trials when you're following patients um, prior chemo or not, disease-free interval, all of these things impact um, the uh, final results of a trial. So very hard to compare. Real world evidence is interesting because uh, this allows us to look at a real world population, not a specific population of patients who were uh, put on a clinical trial and had to meet a lot of entry criteria. Um, so it gives us not only a better idea across different characteristics, how a drug works, but it also tells us some um, about how it will work in our patient populations. So the difference between randomized clinical trials and real world evidence is one is, does the drug work at all? Can the drug work? So you select a strict inclusion and exclusion criteria, patient population, ideal setting. There's a lot of, um, as I think anybody who does clinical trials knows, a lot of queries and monitoring and fixing different words. And the comparator and placebo may not reflect what your clinical practice is by the time you see the data. 
And then the intervention is standardized, so you can't start at a lower dose or increase or decrease the dose at whim. But in real world evidence, you have a diverse and unselected population. It's routine clinical practice. Intervention is at your discretion and the comparator of interest. So when you look at a real world database, what the control population is reflects those that are used in clinical practice, not ones that the FDA, for example, decides should be used. Um, so this shows you the pros and cons. Randomized clinical trials are, of course, really important, but they cost a lot of money and uh, it can be difficult to do and take a long time delaying the delivery of drugs to a clinical population. So there's a lot of uh, interest in trying to use real world evidence as a control population in certain settings to try and improve the speed of analysis of novel agents. In this setting, of course, we already have approval. So we're using this to try and validate some of the information and understand effectiveness in specific populations. You can look at a broad set of measures and outcomes as long as they were collected by the real world database um, and uh, look at questions. For example, when patients get therapy that are not per guidelines, what happens to those patients as well? The cons are, of course, bias and confounding factors and fewer standards around design leads as well as the databases. And also, you may not have much availability of a database. The uh, randomized clinical trials don't represent the clinic patients we treat mostly in, in clinic who aren't eligible for clinical trials, and uh, it may not be bias-free as well. You also have a specific period of time when you're monitoring patients for adverse events, so you may not see longer-term events. Real-world data are playing a role in expanding use of approved medications. So although the FDA, I think, is venturing into the idea that you might be able to use real-world data in some settings as a control population, as opposed to randomizing patients, that hasn't yet been validated or even set as a standard by the FDA. However, taking drugs that are already approved and trying to expand different uh, the role of the drug into different populations has been used. So this is the FDA approved of palbociclib and endocrine therapy in men who have hormone receptor positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. And this was based on electronic health records uh, from an insurance database, the Pfizer Global Safety Database, and the Flatiron Health Breast Cancer Database that I'll talk to you a little bit more about. So we've also seen other uh, drugs and other devices that have been approved from real world data. So this is very encouraging and you know, shows the important role of these analyses. And then real world data tells us about changes in treatment patterns. And this is really important because this tells us a lot about what our controls should be in clinical trials and what's going on. This is online medical record extraction. And here you can look at endocrine therapy versus chemotherapy in healthcare claims data uh, from 2002 to 2012. And then now the CDK46 era 2017, CDK46 regimens predominate, chemotherapy now down to 13% as people became more convinced that endocrine, uh, sequential endocrine therapy was the appropriate treatment for patients, even with visceral metastases. And then this shows you in the European market, the EU5 market, a real world study uh, that looked at uh, changes in treatment. So the blue is CDK46 uh, inhibitor based, and you can see it goes from 7% in 2017 to 42% in 2020, AI monotherapy correspondingly decreases and other therapies also decrease, which is really encouraging. And then as we've had more and more data in the early, in the first line setting, you can see the expanding uh, orange category here in the first line setting, just over three years uh, with many more patients receiving CDK4-6 inhibitors. The same is true when you look at CDK inhibitors and aromatase inhibitors versus fulvestrant. We're really moving these drugs into the earlier first line setting. And of course we had data uh, from the Parsifal trial showing us that if you used palbociclib, the choice of the endocrine therapy didn't matter. So let's learn a little bit more about the Flatiron Electronic Health Records Database. Uh, this includes 2.5 million actively treated cancer patients. It's in the United States, it's major downside, 800 uh, geographically diverse sites of care, 280 plus cancer clinics, and 94% treated in the community setting. So we, for example, at the university don't submit data to Flatiron. Uh, there's a single common data set. They have a systematic approach to data extraction um, and the electronic health record allows them to extract this data through a, a computer uh, program technology uh, that augments human expertise. So you don't actually have to have a person pulling out all of this data. 
and you get structured and unstructured data and you can pay them and say what you want to get out of this database. They, for example, can tell you patients who have pic 3 ca mutations or not who had testing. So this shows you the structured and unstructured electronic health database. Um, so these are or the structured, of course, is organized, the drop down fields in the electronic health record that are harmonized, like diagnosis, visits, demographics, labs, and therapies. But then the unstructured are not organized, though they're free text, like discharge notes, your physician notes, radiology and pathology. Um, so those are the unstructured data that you can get. So let's talk about some real world studies with Palvo Ciclip. I'm gonna show you the published comparative first line study that we're updating at ESMO Breast. Um, and then a recent study presented at ASCO Palomage, looking at safety in older women in France. So this study, which uh, was published in Breast Cancer Research last year, uh, the objective was to describe the patients and the effectiveness of uh, Palvo Ciclip plus letrozole versus letrozole alone in the first line setting in clinical practice in the United States. And we wanted specifically to look at progression free and overall survival uh, and uh, see whether or not that mimicked what we expected for survival and had seen for progression free survival. And the way we did that was a retrospective analysis of the data collected in the Flatiron database from electronic health records. Um, as the eligibility are listed here, so patients had to have their first line therapy from February of 2015 to February of 2019 to allow enough two years of follow-up. Uh, patients had to have at least three years of follow-up from the index date to the study cutoff date, and here's May of 2019. Um, and then patients, uh, we found records for 772 patients with Palvo and Letrozole that met, met these criteria and 658 with Letrozole. And then the outcomes I mentioned to you earlier, and I'll talk more about these statistical analyses in just a moment, because I think that's really confusing. The main statistical analysis is stabilized inverse probability of treatment weighting or SIPTW. And this is an approach that's being used in many retrospective real world studies where you're not randomizing, but comparing and what it allows you to do is to weigh patients differently in the sample and create the 2 cohorts. So treatment versus treatment plus uh, whatever your experimental agent is, in this case, palbociclib, and then you balance the two cohorts so that you can compare them across the two arms. If you start looking at the stabilized IPTW, uh, then you are using a propensity score, um, and that's the probability that a subject is being assigned to a particular treatment given their key covariates. So, Covariates include age, performance status, visceral disease, for example. Um, you can put in the covariates that you want into a specific analysis. So in this flat iron comparative data analysis, uh, we used SIPTW to ba balance the baseline demographics um, and uh, then match patients in the two cohorts by this inverse probability treatment weighing method. Um, and I mentioned the patients altogether 1,430 patients. The median follow up was, as I mentioned, we wanted 2 years, 24.2 months for Palbo and 23 months for letrozole. So, I've actually listed here the inverse probability treatment weighting and the uh, IPTW because it's so hard to remember what that stands for if you don't use it all the time. This shows you the real world progression free survival and you can see it went from if you looked overall, this is the unadjusted analysis. It went from uh, a median of 11.9 to 19.7 months. Um, if you look at the patients who had the adjusted analysis, it goes from 13.7 to 21.9. And then here is the after the probability treatment weighting. Um, so you're seeing really a big medians here, 11.9 to 20.2, um, corresponding to what we see in the clinical trials, which I think makes us more confident about the overall survival data, which is shown here. And again, regardless of the way we analyzed it unadjusted, looking at the IPTW and then after probability treatment weighing, which is important, you go from 43 uh, months to not reached in the treatment group. So really encouraging. And then we looked at uh, subset analyses to try and see what impacted uh, the overall survival. And it's actually interesting. There are some that aren't documented, uh, but overall the little circles line up to the left of one. There's a lot of uh, the confidence intervals crossing one just because there isn't enough power in specific group. For example, brain mets not so common in the first line setting in this group of patients. So 19 and 42, no, no brain mets, a much bigger population, just to give you an example. <clears throat> but there's no real difference between visceral disease and no visceral disease, which is encouraging. 
Um, and then uh, we also use the same database to try and <clears throat> look at a minority population in the United States. And I think this is really helpful um, if you're looking at different patient groups, for example, you could use the same uh, idea to look at different minorities and different populations or different, for example, weights or whether somebody smoked, for example. Here we looked at a small Hispanic population, kind of a sad uh, commentary on how many patients go on trials who are Hispanic in the US, 37. But African American, we had 114 patients. When we combine them, you can see that the efficacy looks very similar for progression free and overall survival for the population that I showed you before. And then if you look at the patients who were just African American, we wanted to separate them out as a larger population. You can see that you also maintain the benefits. So this is very encouraging. And we looked at safety. We didn't see any additional discontinuation, shorter exposure to drug or difference in exposure to specific uh, drug dosages, which you can look at uh, by looking at insurance claims. Uh, and then lastly, just to mention Palomage, uh, of course, they're using this cute age at the end. And specifically, this uh, trial was a prospective, non-interventional real-world cohort study. So I'm just showing this because it's a whole other way to look at real-world analyses. You can do this prospectively as long as you have a database to query. So these patients were 70 years or greater, and they were getting palbociclib, and they got 807 patients. And you can see they divided it into two cohorts. One was endocrine sensitive and first line treatment. And then the second was endocrine resistant using the ESMO guidelines or patients who were getting this in the second or greater line setting. And they had various months of follow up prospectively um, in this database. So basically, sites that were treating patients, no eligibility criteria, just needed to fill out paperwork um, every three months and then uh, and the longer time periods here follow up in terms of saying how patients were doing. And basically, they wanted to look at a safety endpoint. So the primary objective was the patients who stopped treatment altogether at six months for cohort B and 18 months for cohort A for any reason. Um, and they basically looked at this interim analysis at ASCO for baseline characteristics and safety. So here you can see the patients, the median age was 78, uh, the median uh, ECOG status was one, um, and quite a number of patients, interestingly, had visceral metastases, more lung than liver. Um, in the first line population, it was more than I would have expected. Um, bone metastases were dominant in about 70% of the patients, and about a third only had bone-only disease. Also very interesting. About 50% of the patients had de novo metastatic breast cancer. Here you can see about 65% had treatment in the first line setting in the total population. Um, and then that varied based on cohort A and cohort B, as you would expect. Most patients received an aromatase inhibitor in cohort A and fulvestrant in cohort B. And then if you look at this little words down here in the light gray, 68% of patients had this G8 score less than or equal to 14 means that they could be more frail. It's a geriatric assessment um, and it was not different between the cohorts, but these were older women who weren't in perfect health. Um, this shows you the dose initiation, and I thought this was really interesting because this does sort of follow along what I do in clinical practice. So here's the total patients uh, about three quarters of the patients started at the full dose. Uh, but then uh, you can see that a percentage of patients started at 100. Some people even started at 75. Generally for my older patients um, who are over the age of 75, certainly, or who have more frailty, I will start at 100 milligrams rather than 125. And I actually did a little study looking at that um, and uh, doing skin biopsies. And you do get good inhibition of the cyclin-dependent kinase. It's using 100 milligrams in those patients. And you can always go up on the dose. This shows you ECOG. The G8 score, Charleston, and uh, then age here in patients who were 80 or older, 30% of the patients started at 100. And if you look at this altogether, 40% almost started below 125 milligrams. Uh, but that was kind of encouraging. And then if you look at safety, it's even more encouraging here. Uh, you can see that the number of patients uh, who had grade 3, 4 AEs was about 40%, uh, but only a quarter of the patients had a dose reduction, somewhere between a fifth to a quarter, and only 5% discontinued 6% due to adverse events. And most of these grade 3, 4 AEs were neutropenia. Uh, they didn't really have uh, much of the other uh, uh, toxicities. Thrombocytopenia is a little bit more common in older patients, particularly over the age of 80. Febrile neutropenia was only seen in 1% in uh, interstitial lung disease in 0.3%. And the frailty factors didn't impact uh, safety. 
And uh, patients who started at a lower dose, so remember that more patients who are 80 or older started at a lower dose, they actually had less grade 3, 4 adverse events, which was encouraging. So I thought this data was really helpful and it was a novel way of doing a study. It's something that you can do in any country as long as you have a database that you can collect. For example, you can collect a database from a single hospital population over time and just have everybody fill in a form when they come in or have the physicians uh, or advanced practice providers fill in a form. And you can get a lot of really important and interesting data. But clearly it shows that we can use uh, the CDK46 inhibitor palbociclib with endocrine therapy in our older patients even over the age of 80. So I think I've shown you that men, some outcomes can be assessed through real-world analyses, but there are many humanistic, so patient-reported endpoints, clinical, we talked about. You can also look at hospital stays, et cetera, depending on the, the uh, specific factor you're looking at. Um, you can look at economic resource utilization. So if you're using a drug, do people have, you know, how often do they have scans? Are they admitted to the hospital differently, et cetera? You can look at indirect costs to patient lives outside of cancer. Um, and then the types of studies are listed here as well, and I'm happy to make these slides available if people are interested in looking at this in more detail. This is actually, there's also a website where you can look at this. Um, and then I'm just ending with our updated ASCO guidelines, there's of course many guidelines out there, ESMO and the Advanced Breast Cancer Consensus uh, Group, uh, but these uh, we updated in the JCO last year on behalf of ASCO, and we recommended that patients receive a CDK4-6 inhibitor as first-line therapy where feasible. In the, I'll show you in just a moment, the Advanced Breast Cancer Consensus Guidelines also take into account that some patients may not have access or may not be able to afford drug. Uh, patients who have germline BRCA mutations, we do actually still recommend the CDK4-6 inhibitor when there's a survival benefit, but a PARP inhibitor can also be considered in the first or second line setting. And then, of course, we go on to other therapies in the um, uh, sequentially. If a patient has had an AI and relapses, we recommend fulvastrant with the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And then this shows you the last ABC clinical practice guidelines. There will be an updated meeting in person in November this year because we did a virtual meeting uh, for uh, last year. So we're really hopeful that uh, we'll be able to meet in person in our sort of mini update in November and I encourage you to consider attending. It's a great meeting, uh, but very similar. And it shows that patients who are not available, you would use a single agent endocrine therapy and then go on to the CDK46 inhibitor in this second line setting. So here's the disclaimer uh, and iBrand's abbreviated prescribing information. Um, I certainly have talked about areas that are on and off label in this presentation. So my disclaimer um, and uh, this information, of course, is available online as well. And with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention. You can see our fog here, but um, I'm, it's actually sunny this morning. So that's why I have sun coming in my window. So very nice to talk to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for such interesting presentation. You have sunny day, but we have always at the same time, we have a rainy day today. So <laughs> it's even very cold in Jordan today. Possible we may have some ice uh, snowing coming on this night, possibly. We actually yes. had, uh, since you mentioned the weather, we had hail that lasted for a whole day um, outside of San Francisco for the first time in a decade. And it's about, you know, it's below freezing today. So very unusual weather. And the floor for discussion for any questions, please. Any question? Yes, Adir. Uh, thank you, doctor, for this nice presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding the overall survival data that are between different CDK46 inhibitors. Do you think there are difference between the, the three drugs, although Pfizer might not like this question? Do you think it based on the overall survival data that reaches more than five years in one of the trials. What do you think? You know, I think it's complicated by the fact that the trials were designed differently. And I think uh, when we see the first line survival data from the other two trials, it will be very interesting. I mean, I was interested that a third of the patients in uh, Paloma 2 have a disease-free interval of less than a year. Uh, whereas in that was not allowed at all in the Mona Lisa trial. So the populations are different and they were incredibly different in the second and greater line setting with chemotherapy playing such a huge role. But I do think that whatever we see on those survival uh, curves is gonna influence our use of drug. Um, I have to say that, you know, like the, I think the first four or five patients that I put on Paloma 2 are still on therapy. Uh, so clearly we're seeing 
uh, tremendous efficacy and the hazard ratios for progression free survival are so similar that I think if there are differences in survival, it's going to be due to differing patient populations rather than true differences in efficacy of the drug. I will say, though, that uh, we've brought there's been real discussion about efficacy of a drug in uh, the early stage studies where Palace didn't show a difference in event free survival, but the abemaciclib did in the Monarch E trial. And, you know, if you look at the efficacy on CDK, uh, cyclin dependent kinases, abemaciclib is a much dirtier uh, drug. Um, and it shows, you know, all this uh, inhibition and maybe uh, that plus the continuous exposure made a difference. We, of course, are waiting to see the ribociclib Natalie trial and in the metastatic setting, you know, ribociclib so far has uh, 3 trials that show survival differences. So it is, uh, you know, <laughs> you think about the checkpoint inhibitors, you know, a tezolizumab is probably just as effective as pembrolizumab because the differences in survival are identical, but the. So, uh, statistical plan did not allow them to claim statistical significance based on that seven month survival difference, numerical difference. And so a tezolizumab approval was withdrawn in the US because they couldn't confirm the benefit and they didn't have enough data to confirm it. So, you know, we know that the trial population and the, um, and the statistical designs play a big role in how we uh, see data. So, I think it remains to be seen right now. The hazard ratios are the same in the metastatic setting. So I feel very comfortable with all 3 agents, uh, depending on the setting and the patient population. But it's a great question. Any, question. any more questions? I want to ask you 2 questions. Really? 1 of them is a complication of the CD4 CTK inhibitors. Uh, regarding pneumonitis over the last 2 years. I, I noticed there are 2 patients who develop pneumonitis. After two months of starting therapy, rather than six months or eight months, which which, which we really see, is there an explanation behind such phenomena? Uh, 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 can you please? This is the first question. So, can you mention the question again? Regarding the pneumonitis that developed early after initiating the CD4 care inhibitors. I, I'm just not. I'm so so sorry. Um, regarding regarding the pneumonitis, I'm I'm talking you about know, the pneumonitis. The, but the pneumonitis. what's the question about that? So you're saying is there? Well, I'll give you my global take on it then. The um, joining soon. Sorry, I just have to answer a quick patient thing. The um, so the pneumonitis is a fascinating question because you know we're seeing this with the antibody drug conjugates, and when it's really funny because I kept seeing scattered ground glass opacities when we were doing the randomized trials in the metastatic setting. So we clearly are seeing grade one ILD, but it's really different from what we're seeing with say trastuzumab drexican. It doesn't progress in the majority of patients. And so ILD may be diagnosed, but in general, we don't see symptomatic ILD. So there are reported symptomatic cases. Um, there are more in Asian patients than in non-Asian patients. And there may be some risks based on factors that we don't understand very well. But I think overall, the risks have been reported to be 0.3 to 0.2%. Have you seen more ILD? Yeah, I, I, over the last two years, I saw two patients really, and I tried to figure out whether they have uh, uh, lymphangiitis, uh, whether they have right. lymphangiitis cinematosis, and all of them they are just failed to to find this. The only thing just they have some lung infiltrate, bilateral lung infiltrate, and sometimes they are easy difficult to, to treat because. To tell you frankly, at the beginning, we, we don't ignore that this is an immunity second of this medication. And after that, we realize that this is the main thing. And we, when we stop the medication, they start to become, they feel, they feel much better after we steroid them. So this is really my observation. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that there must be some individual susceptibility in my all of my treatments. I have one patient who had some lung process. And in the end, I decided that I couldn't rule out a potential toxicity. Uh, from uh, the uh, the CDK46 inhibitor, she was on a bamaciclib just by chance and of Russian origin, uh, but um, you know, sort of a mixed uh, Asian Russian origin, and I have no idea. So I think that um, I stopped her bamaciclib. We put her on steroids. She also had asthma, and we switched her over, and she's doing fine now and can actually breathe, which is really good. So I think we do see it. The agents are different enough that I feel comfortable as long as somebody didn't have life threatening ILD and retesting with another agent when somebody um, has improved symptoms. But it's a great question. And I think, 
you know, as we're using this more and in more diverse populations, we need to see it's just a rare event and you're just lucky that you saw two patients. <laughs> yeah, and my second question to you regarding patient who developed brain metastasis while he was on on, on uh, Balbo, for example, uh, what what can we do? Shall we change to a bimacyclic or shall we omit all the CD4 can inhibitors and start another role of, th of therapy or another mode of therapy? I think a lot of it depends on the individual patient situation. So if a patient has a single brain metastasis and it can be easily treated with a stereotactic radiation, I usually continue on and monitor. Um, if a patient has multiple brain metastases or progression systemically along with it, then of course we change therapy. I think it, it is not unreasonable to use if a patient still has uh, endocrine sensitivity and not a you know, pic 3 ca mutation that would suggest you should change the targeted agent. It's not unreasonable to change to abemaciclib in that situation just to see. I haven't seen responses with abemaciclib um, in patients with active brain metastases, uh, but usually there are a number of other things going on in these patients with systemic progression as well. Thank you very much for such great presentation and thanks to Weiser who sponsored this event. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. So Take care. Be well, and hopefully we'll all get to see each other in person in the next year. Thank you for Inshallah. including me. Inshallah. Inshallah. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our uh, conference. It, uh, it gave me a great pleasure and honor to present uh, a well-known figure in, the, in lymphoma all over the world, Prof. Pierre Luigi uh, Zanzani, who is um, um, a professor, a full professor of hematology at the University of Bologna. Uh, he is associated professor at the Institute of Hematology and Medical Oncology at uh, uh, Sora Gnoli, University of Bologna since 2002. He is a member of the Italian Society of Hematology, uh, Italian Society of Experimental Hematology, American Society of Hematology, and the American Society of Clinical Oncology since uh, the 80s. He served as a principal investigator on more than 200 clinical trials, including phase one, two, and expansion cohorts in patients with Hodgkin lymphoma, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and CLL, including national and international uh, multicenter studies. He is the president of the Italian Foundation of Lymphoma from 2013 uh, until November 2015, and he is now uh, a member of the Board of Directors. He's the Associate Editor of the Annals of Oncology from January 14 until December 17, and he acts now as a reviewer in journals such as Lancet Oncology, Journal of Clinical Oncology, Blood Clinical Cancer Research, Cancer Hematologica, Leukemia and Lymphoma, Leukemia, uh, CLL myeloma, blood advanced lancet hematology. He presented his research at more than 400, 460 national and international meetings. He has authored over 650 peer review journals, papers in uh, well known uh, journals in hematology and oncology, like New England Journal of Medicine, Annals of Oncology, Oncologists, Journal of Hematology. He, his current research interest includes clinical trials, methodology, prognostic factors in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, CLL leukemia, new drug development, and hair cell leukemia. Please join me to welcome Professor Zinzani, who, who will talk about uh, how I treat mediastinal uh, lymphoma, which is a very interesting topic. Good afternoon. Dr. Akram will. Uh, Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much uh, for this kind of introduction. And uh, it's very my pleasure and honor to be 
I'm sorry, only virtually, but uh, I hope the next year in person to this uh, wonderful meeting. So my title is how I'll treat primary mediastinal lymphoma today. And uh, as you know, uh, primary mediastinal lymphoma is a rare uh, lymphoma, less than 3% of non-Hodgkin lymphoma of the young adults uh, with a median age uh, ranging between 30 to 40 years with the high incidence in females. It's represented by rapid going and uh, with the isolated and bulky mediastinal involvement, uh, sometimes could be considered a real uh, hematological emergency. There are possible involvement uh, uh, of extranodal cycle, disease relapse, uh, uh, such as kidneys, adrenals, ovaries, liver, and CNS. And globally, uh, at the presentation, there is a compression of nerve mediastinal structures with dyspnea, dysphagia, thoracic pain, edema of face and neck, and superior carotid syndrome in at least 30% of the cases, and also pleural and pericardial effusion in at least 30-40% of the cases. Uh, first of all, I will present uh, uh, the news on frontline treatment. Next uh, will be the PET-guided approach in the management of primary mediastinal, and uh, the last issue will be the problem of relapsed and refractory disease. Use of frontline treatment, uh, as you know in this picture, there are three different uh, options of conventional chemo immunotherapy in frontline. The classical CHOP, uh, uh, rituximab, uh, in this case is fundamental to use 14 and not 21 schedule. Uh, the Maco B or Vaco B plus rituximab and also the uh, Diapoch uh, plus uh, rituximab. Globally, when you compare CHOPAR14 and uh, uh, MACOB plus rituximab, the results in terms of CR rate and those in terms of progression to survive at more than five years are quite similar. Uh, there are some difference uh, when you uh, use uh, ARDAIPOCH according to the uh, first data published by the uh, Dunleavy group uh, at least uh, uh, eight years ago where the data were really impressive, but at the end of the day, with several uh, uh, further um, real-life publication, uh, the data are quite similar to the other two chemoimmunotherapy treatment, like uh, Marco B plus Reflucium or CHOP-14. In fact, here we can see uh, one of our publication uh, in, from our institution uh, concerning the role of uh, the weekly Marco B plus Rituximab, and uh, you can see here that the progression free survival at 15 years was uh, roughly 70%. Disease free survival at 15 years was more than 80%. And also the overall survival at uh, 20 years is roughly 80%. At the same time, uh, the historical uh, cues from the Livia co-workers concerning the role of Daigos plus Rituximab, you can see the event free survival was really high, more than 90%. And in this trial was excluded the, the, uh, the use of uh, uh, local radiotherapy on the mediastinum. Anyway, if you compare this data published a few years later uh, by Julino Roth, uh, in the real life, uh, the result, the clinical response of uh, Taipos plus Rituxima are quite similar to, to Marco B plus Rituxima or RIPRCHOP14. In fact, in this case, the three year event free survival is 86%, and there are, uh, the relapse are at least 12%. And also, there are some primary uh, refractory. This you can see here the cues of Giulino Roth uh, publication and also. There was a, a further publication by Melinda Co-Workers two years ago with the same situation. So when you use the EPOCH are in the real life, the data are quite similar to our CHOP, in this case, 21. In terms of news uh, in the frontline treatment at the last Lugano meeting, uh, the last uh, uh, June, uh, there was uh, the first presentation of the uh, International Astronautal Lymphoma Study Group, uh, the trial number 37, concerning the, um, the role of uh, different uh, frontline treatment in terms of the chemoimmunotherapy in primary mediastinal lymphoma. And you can see here in this uh, event survival curve, uh, 
uh, there is a, a, a statistically significant difference when you compare Archop 14, Macobi plus Rituxima or Vacobi plus Rituxima and Daipos plus Rituxima versus Archop 21. So, of course, uh, in the first uh, three chemoimmunotherapy regimen, uh, the event free survival at two years and at five years is quite similar. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in the RCHOP21, the event free survival uh, at two years and five years is only 75% uh, versus uh, more than 85% in the other uh, three uh, chemoimmunotherapy uh, regimens. The same situation when you compare progression free survival. Uh, for the three chemo immunotherapy regimen versus CHOP R21. There is an advantage for the first three in terms of progression of free survival at two years, five years, and those in terms of overall survival at two years and five years. In terms of a pet guided approach in the management of primary medicinal lymphoma, as you know, PET is usable in a the identification of active disease after frontline treatment and also in primary uh, mediastinal abyssal lymphoma is uh, uh, possible to apply the Deville five point scale like in the, in the fusible abyssal lymphoma. And there are uh, several functional PET parameters evaluated at baseline like submax, metabolic tumor volume, total lesion glycolysis that can play an important role in assessing long-term prognosis in patients with primary mediastinal lymphoma. But finally, I think the most important concept is a negative end of treatment PET scan may help select those patients in whom uh, consolidation with radiotherapy can be safely omitted. Concerning these issues, there are two publications. The first one is from our group, published uh, on hematological oncology in 2015. Uh, this is a retrospective analysis on uh, 74 patients. Uh, you can see here the baseline characteristic. And uh, we used, of course, uh, MECOB plus Rituxim in our institution. And for the patients during this uh, uh, period who had the PED negativity after the frontline treatment, uh, there was, we, we didn't uh, use the radiotherapy. And for the patient, 51 patient with PET positivity at the end of the uh, MACB plus Rituxima induction treatment, we uh, treated this patient with the local radiotherapy. So at the end of the day, you can see here that the progression of pre survival is absolutely the same when you compare a uh, patient. Uh, uh, with PET negative uh, without any kind of radiotherapy and patient who received uh, radiotherapy. The same situation is from uh, uh, Vancouver, from British Columbia. Uh, this is publication by Hyden and co-workers uh, two years ago. Uh, they used the uh, RCHOP uh, with uh, a, 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 an analysis uh, in terms of patients who had uh, a negativity of PET at the end of treatment. There was only observation for patients uh, who were uh, uh, positive, there was a local radiotherapy at the dose of 30, 40 grade. And uh, uh, this is the disposition of the patient. And at the same time here, you can see that uh, uh, the comparison uh, between PET negative uh, at five years in terms of time to progression versus PET positivity treated with uh, a local radiotherapy in terms of time to uh, uh, progression, there is a real difference, 90% versus 74%. And uh, also here, you can see that uh, when you use uh, in Dovisco 1, 2, 3, no radiotherapy after the treatment versus D4 with radiotherapy after the treatment with induction, there is no statistical significant difference. The second uh, uh, point uh, of the International Astronautal Lymphoma Study Group uh, trial number 37 uh, was uh, the evaluation in uh, patients uh, uh, with PET negativity at the end of the induction treatment uh, in terms of uh, uh, random one-to-one -one, uh, observation versus local radiotherapy at, uh, with a dose of 30 gray. So this final data uh, will be presented probably at the next uh, ARSH meeting and probably we, at that point we can put uh, the, the the word end of concerning uh, this uh, uh, issue about uh, what to do for the patient who are PET negative at the, at the end of uh, 
give immunotherapy treatment in terms of low gradient therapy or not. The last issue is the problem, uh, the real important problem of uh, elapsed refractory patients uh, uh, with primary mediastin. And as you know, uh, right now it's possible to cure at least 80% of the patient. Uh, the remaining 20 patients are represented by few patients with primary refractory and uh, at least 10-12% uh, uh, of uh, relapse. And the relapse uh, are, uh, the majority of the patients are observed uh, in the first 12-15 months from the end of the induction treatment. Uh, in terms of conventional uh, chemo immunotherapy salvage treatment for uh, in, in first relapse, uh, the data published by uh, Dr. Kuruvilla several years ago showed that uh, it's more difficult to obtain uh, some result uh, in this setting of primary mediation than when you compare uh, with patient with diffuse epicellar lymphoma. So, I mean, uh, the conventional chemotherapy uh, salvage treatment uh, in uh, uh, patients uh, uh, primary refractory or relapse with primary mediastin uh, are really uh, bad. And uh, on the basis of that, a uh, few years ago, we moved uh, uh, to find, uh, if it's possible, uh, a, a new uh, salvage treatment uh, in terms of new option uh, with the uh, uh, other agents outside the conventional chemotherapy. The first step uh, was with brentuximab vedatin. As you know, uh, the, all the patients with primary mediastin are CD30 positive. The expression of CD30 positive uh, range between uh, 50 to 75 percent. It depends by the series. Anyway, uh, I think there, there was uh, an important uh, uh, proof of concept, uh, important rationale to try to use. Uh, in this patient, the uh, brain tuximab editing. We did uh, a phase two study. We published this data on blood uh, five years ago. And uh, you can see here, we included only 15 patients, but uh, uh, only two patients out of 15 obtained uh, a very brief uh, partial response. Uh, we didn't observe any kind of complete response. So at the end of the day, brain tuximab editing as a single agent is really not active uh, in the setting of a relapsed refractory patient with primary media. The second step was uh, to uh, focus on uh, the potential role of checkpoint inhibitors, uh, I mean, uh, pembrolizumab and nivolumab in the treatment of this setting of patients, because as you know, the situation in terms of uh, potential activity of uh, checkpoint inhibitors uh, in primary media is absolutely similar to Hodgkin disease. And uh, uh, we started with the trial, a phase one study, uh, followed by the phase two study using pembrolism as a single agent in the setting of patient. The uh, phase one study was the K note 0 13, the uh, phase two study was the K note 170. We included uh, 21 patients in the phase one and 53 patients in the uh, phase two study. You, here you can see the, the two different uh, baseline characteristics of the patient, 21 and 53 patients. The, the median number of prior treatment was three, range between 2 to 9 or 2 to 8, and uh, uh, at least uh, uh, more than 30% of the patient uh, received uh, two or more than two uh, prior uh, treatment. At least uh, um, 50% of the patients received prior local radiotherapy, and also uh, some patients uh, received also uh, prior transplant, I mean, uh, out of percent transplant, in at least uh, uh, 40% of the patient. In terms of uh, clinical response, uh, in the phase one, uh, the overall response rate was 48%, the CR rate was 33%, and in the phase two, the K note 170, the overall response rate was the, the same of phase one, 45%, the, the complete response rate was 13%. So, and the data are really interesting when you compare with the poor data of the conventional chemoimmunotherapy uh, salvage treatment. So uh, at the end of the day, concerning the phase two study, the 53 patient, we did an update uh, with the follow-up more than three years. There, there were 11 patients who obtained a complete metabolic response. I mean, the PET was negative. And for all these patients, there was, uh, uh, the, we continued the treatment for two years with PEMBO. 
and uh, uh, then we stop uh, without any kind of consolidation with allogenic uh, stem cell transplantation. And all these patients are in continuous complete response after more than three years. You can see here the median duration response is roughly 81% at five years. The progression is about 33% uh, uh, at four years. Uh, the median progression is roughly four months. The, overall, the median overall survival is close to two years, uh, and at four years is 45%. So on the basis of this data, there was the, there was the official indication by FDA concerning the role of pembolism in relapse of refractory uh, primary mediastinal lymphoma. The second step was uh, to combine another checkpoint inhibitor, nivolumab, with brentuximab. We did this trial, phase two study, checkmate 46. Here you can see here the study schema. And uh, we use the schedule uh, with the new volume, the conventional dose 240 milligram uh, flat dose every three weeks instead of uh, two weeks uh, because it was important to use at the same time of rentuximab velutin with a dose of 1.8 milligram per kilogram every three weeks. And the primary point uh, was the uh, overall response rate uh, according to the investigator assessment. Uh, we can see here the baseline characteristic of 30 patients. Again, the median number of prior treatment was two range between the two to five, and uh, uh, at least uh, uh, four patients received open prior out of stem cell transplant, and at least one third of the patient received uh, local uh, radiotherapy. Here you can see here the clinical response, the overall response rate uh, was uh, uh, 73% according to the investigator assessment, 70% according to the central independent review. And the complete metabolic response uh, was really similar for both evaluation, 37% for investigative assessment uh, and 43% for the independent center review. So the data, when you compare with pain by the single data, are really impressive because the CR rate in terms of complete metabolic response is close to 40%. And the overall response rate is more than 70%. You can see here the uh, uh, water flow plot. And uh, uh, also, in terms of uh, duration of the response, uh, we have uh, four patients uh, who, who obtain a complete metabolic response uh, and, uh, uh, and they didn't receive any kind of uh, consolidation with allo transplant. Uh, and the follow up uh, is uh, really huge. Uh, one, uh, uh, 137 days, 273 days, uh, uh, more than one year, and close to two years uh, in continuous complete response without any kind of, of uh, uh, consolidation with uh, uh, allotransplant. Uh, some patients who obtain only a partial response uh, uh, receive those consolidation with auto or allogenic cell transplant, uh, transplant, and uh, some patients had a conversion from PR to CR. And uh, with the update that I did at the last Lugano meeting, uh, the median progression of pre survival is more than two years, uh, exactly 26 months, uh, and the progression of pre survival rate was uh, 56 uh, years at two years, 56% at two years. The overall survival, you can see the median overall survival was not reached, uh, and the overall survival rate was close to 80% at uh, two years. Also, uh, in this case, uh, like uh, with pembolism, uh, potentially we can cure with pembo or with nevo plus nivolumab, uh, um, nivo uh, uh, plus, I'm uh, sorry, reduximab, edotin. We can cure a subset of primary mediastinum because uh, when you have a patient who, re who obtain a complete metabolic response and maintain this uh, complete metabolic response without any kind of uh, consolidation with ALO with support, more than three years, I think we, can, we really can consider this patient cure. The last uh, few uh, slides is related uh, to the, another potential opportunity in terms of a therapeutic approach uh, for the setting of relapsed refractory patients with primary mediastin and abyssal lymphoma, and that course is uh, CAR-T. And this uh, is a, a recent publication a few months ago, the last year by Columbia co Walker, concerning real life data, the first real life data about the role of CAR-T-cell in relapsed refractory primary mediastinal lymphoma. 
and they reached uh, 33 patients. Uh, the median number of prior treatment was three, range between one to nine, and uh, uh, at least 40% uh, uh, of the patients presented bulk disease before to start with CAR T cell, and uh, also at least two thirds of the patients received prior uh, local radiotherapy, and at least one third of the patients received prior autotransfer. At the end of the day, the clinical response, uh, which um, overall response rate was at uh, 76%, and the complete metabolic response uh, was close to 70%. So the data are really impressive, a little bit better than, uh, of course, uh, pembolizumab or, in particular, nivoplas reduximab. And these are the last slide concerning the uh, progression of pre-survival for patients who uh, underwent to uh, car T cell and the data are really uh, good. Uh, the cure are quite similar to uh, the role of car T cell in uh, relapse and refractory and inclusive descending form. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Zanzani, for this nice and thorough uh, approach. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Yes. Dr. Mohammed. Thank you very much. It seems that you are really a Jordanian oncologist now because you are you, you have the passport from us as a Jordanian person. Uh, regarding uh, your uh, experience, how much you will find double head, uh, double head, or even triple head lymphomas in primary medicine lymphoma? Primary medicine lymphoma, and if so, how will you approach them initially? So uh, I didn't know, I don't hear very well. Do you mean double hit in front line? Double hit. Double hit in primary medicinal lymphoma. So uh, is it is no so common uh, uh, double hit in primary medicinal lymphoma so far uh, retrospectively in these uh, two trials there were three patients uh, and at the end of the day one of these patients uh, after Nivo plus brentuximab edotin is one of the patients in continuous complete response after more than three years without any kind of consolidation. Uh, concerning the CAR T cell publication from the real life, there are no data concerning the double it. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zanzani. Uh, for this nice presentation. Always, always we're, we're, we're thinking how to consolidate those patients for getting immune therapy. Uh, and even the publication regarding the pembrolizumab and nivolumab even in relapsed Hodgkin. Also, the, the PFS is like short and, and the recommendation is like most of those patients should be consolidated by some sort of cellular therapy. So the data that you showed in the pembrolizumab is, is reassuring, but most of those patients can relapse. Yes, I agree, PFS is like approaching more than 12 to 18 months but uh, i mean uh, uh, probably most of those patients are gonna relapse so how you would advise uh, uh, to go with those who uh, will uh, uh, who, who received immune therapy uh, taking into account the risk of a graft versus disease in those patients who got immune therapy so you mean you mean uh, what you th what I think about the role of allotransfer? I didn't hear very well. So yeah, so yes, because of no, I don't uh, see, I don't see. So I mean, no, I mean, so for globally, if uh, the, I, I start from the my experience in Hodgkin lymphoma uh, with pembolizumab or nivolumab. So the situation is the same. If I treat a patient with uh, Hodgkin or a primary mediastinal with pembolizumab, and I obtain a, a complete metabolic response within the first eight, 10 administration of checkpoint inhibitors. I prefer to continue the treatment with the pembro or nevo for at least two years without any kind of uh, consolidation with that. At the same time, if it's impossible to obtain a, a complete metabolic response after more than 10, 15 administration of checkpoint inhibitors, and I obtain only PR, I moved to consolidation 
I mean consolidation treatment with other stem cell drugs. For, for primary mediastin is a little bit different because uh, when I treat patient with pembolizumab or nevo plus brentuximab allergy, if I obtain a complete metabolic response, perfect. I continue for two years without any kind of consolidation. If there is only a PR or a stable disease, I, of, of course, at this point, I move uh, to CAR T-cell. Anyway, normally, for both Hodgkin lymphoma and primary mediastin are treated with checkpoint inhibitor who obtain a complete metabolic response, I prefer to continue for two years uh, with checkpoint inhibitors without any kind of uh, consolidation with other. Yeah. So, Thank you. Uh, Zanzani, I have just one uh, question. Do you see checkpoint inhibitors moving to front lines in the treatment of primary mediastinal and uh, lymphomas? So, there are uh, two ongoing uh, phase one, phase two studies in the United States, and also now uh, I'm discussing uh, with uh, the company if it's possible. Uh, to move from the, from, the, from the right to the left, I mean in front line, and uh, could be very interesting uh, for how our patients uh, to use like Pembro or Nevo uh, as, a main, as a consolidation or maintenance treatment after a, a short uh, induction treatment with conventional chemotherapy. So I think uh, there is a, a good rationale to do that, uh, to increase uh, the, the rate, uh, the complete metabolic response rate, uh, uh, at the end of the induction treatment, reducing uh, for sure the, the, the number of patients considered right now primary refractory of patients that potentially could uh, have a, a relapse. Thank you very much. Now, uh, my you, discussion with Thank you. virtually, Dr. Akram El Ibrahim. Thank you, Professor Zanzani. Just uh, two uh, short questions. First, do you still use the CT scan in the staging or the assessment of response to treatment, or you depend totally on the bit CT? And the second question, do you see any value for the interim bit or all data now generated? It is in the end of the treatment bit scan results. Thank you. So, uh, for primary mediation, I think that uh, um, the best uh, uh, imaging techniques is uh, PET scan. Absolutely. And uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, I, I do also a CT scan in terms of baseline, but uh, during the treatment uh, uh, to evaluate if there is a real uh, a complete metabolic response, uh, I use only PET scan. I don't have the second questions. The second question was regarding the interim bit in mediastinal lymphoma versus end of the treatment. Most of the data. Oh, I mean, generated... I mean yeah. Um, interim PET, yes, yes. Uh, in our experience, uh, uh, we treated more than 220 patients in our institution with uh, Marco B plus Rituximab. So, as you know, Marco B is uh, uh, 12 uh, uh, administ weekly administration, so the duration is uh, uh, no more than three months. Uh, and uh, the, the, the interim PET. Uh, is uh, really important uh, because uh, in the majority of the cases uh, is uh, negative. So because the, the majority of the patients, uh, there is a negativization of the disease uh, after the first uh, five, six cycle of uh, Marco B plus reduction. But the same situation is possible to, uh, to achieve also when you use CHOP uh, R14 and also in particular when you use uh, Diposar. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I may introduce our second speaker now for this session. Yes. Okay. The second talk will be on the uh, paradigm shift of treatment of lymphoma based on the bit scan, and this will be presented by Professor Andrea Gallimini. Uh, Professor Gallimini is a consultant hematologist at the Lacazon Cancer Center in Nice, France. He was trained in clinical research on lymphoma in the St. Rose Hospital in Equino, Italy, the Sophia Antipolis University of Nice, and the Oncohematology Department of the Legacy Cancer Center. His major interests include the clinical application of imaging in lymphoma, 
and pathobiology and prognostication of Hodgkin lymphomas. He has been responsible for education, education and programs for imaging in lymphoma at several annual meetings of the European Hematology Association and the American Society of Hematology. He has authored over 170 scientific publications and has been the editor of books on Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Please, Professor Gadamini, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, before to get started, let me thank the, uh, the Hematology Society of the Jordanian for this kind of invitation. It's really a pity I could not present such data in presence as a number of burning questions, as you will see, are coming up, are popping up from, uh, from my presentation, but I hope that there will be chance to do it in the future. <clears throat> so these are my disclosures. Well, as you can see from this cartoon, um, um, sorry, just to try to, uh, as you can see from this cartoon, um, uh, there is definite role in uh, uh, PET, uh, in PET CT do, for during overall management of Hodgkin lymphoma bef uh, before interim and after first line treatment, before and after second line treatment, before and after uh, consolidation radiotherapy, before and after autologous uh, stem cell transplant. As a consequence, uh, PET-driven uh, treatment of Hodgkin lymphoma has become a new standard of care in several Western and, uh, <coughs> and American countries. As you can see on the right, there is no role at all for a, a PET-CT during patient follow-up with the possible exception, and you will see that in a moment, of uh, uh, treatment monitoring after immune checkpoint uh, administration. Here you can see the consequence of PET-CT staging in a large cohort of 1,100 patients enrolled in British Rattle trial, in which staging was done according to clinical parameters and uh, contrast enhanced CT scan. As a matter of fact, one-fifth of the patients had their, their stage changed, uh, 14 were upstaged, 14% were upstaged, and 6% were downstaged. And the most uh, frequent reason for uh, upstaging was, uh, was uh, extranodal sites in three quarter of the patients or nodal sites for nodal, for nodes showing normal dimension, but uh, uh, active FDG concentration. And the most frequent uh, uh, extranodal site detected, as you will see, in a moment, is the bone, bone marrow, which accounted for more than uh, for nearly 78% of the detected extranodal sites. And here, you can see here a classical example of uh, uh, disease spread to bone, which could not be detected uh, by CT scan on the, uh, on, the, on the center, but which was detected by PET, on the left, a fused images on the right. But uh, a, 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 a question could arise now, what is the interpretation key for, uh, bone, for disease spread to bone, bone marrow? Here you can see the results of a large retrospective study among Italian, the Danish and Polish advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, on the top, you can see patients having a no FDG uptake or a diffuse uh, uptake at the bone bone marrow. The three-year progression free survival was 82.5%. On the, on, the, on the bottom, you can see here the, 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 the treatment outcome of patients showing focal FDG uptake, which was defined as a spot of FDG uptake with, with an intensity higher than liver visible in at least two slices. And the three-year progression free survival was only 66%. The, uh, we concluded that only focal uptake could be considered a henar binger of Hodgkin lymphoma in the bone bone marrow. Here you can see a classical diffuse pattern on the left, right, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, the, which can be seen as a consequence of cytokine activation. 
And you can see here on the bottom right, a typical focal lesion in the lumbar vertebra. Another parameter which uh, which uh, is, is going is going uh, uh, is, is is going uh, uh, studied in this moment is a con derives from a semi quantitative reading of PET CT scan at baseline. This is for the so called metabolic tumor volume. Briefly, all the masses belonging to lymphoma could be manually, but now more frequently automatically. Uh, contoured by a dedicated software, software which is Fiji software. This uh, procedure is, 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 is called tumor delineation. After tumor delineation, a lag an algorithm starts uh, automatically to compute all the voxel uh, uh, um, detected in the three spatial space uh, inside every uh, contoured mass. This procedure is called segmentation. Of course, not all the voxel uh, on, on, could be uh, could be measured uh, belonging uh, or belonging to those mass because uh, thresholding is necessary to count only voxel in, uh, included between the SUV max and the SUV threshold, which should be should be set because uh, to correct for the so-called partial uh, volume effect, which accounts as a penumbra of photons uh, uh, um, uh, irradiating from, the, from a, a tumor. The threshold could be a fixed percentage of SUV, for instance, SUV max, sorry, for instance, 41%, or an absolute value as SUV max higher than 2.5 or higher than 4. Physiological site of FDG uptake, such as brain, myocardium, kidneys, bladder, bowel, are manually removed, and the counted voxels are transformed in volume unit, and the sum of all the computed voxels in the, all the um, uh, metabolic tumor volume is called the total metabolic tumor volume. Total metabolic tumor volume could be uh, could be uh, transformed in total lesion glycolysis by multiplying a total MTV by SUV mean of the lesions. Another very interesting parameter, which has uh, been uh, on the, which is on the stage uh, in the last two years, is so-called tumor distance. Briefly, uh, tumor distance, which is the acronym is DMAX, is defined as the longest distance in centimeters measured between pixels belonging to any couple of sites, nodal or extranodal, detected upon tumor segmentation among all the paired lesion, nodal or extranodal, of lymphoma spread. So it's just a, a distance in centimeters. Uh, we had the chance to present uh, the last ASH meeting the, the pre predictive prognostic value of the max in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma, briefly 331 advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma patients with a negative interim PET scan enrolled in HD or 607 trial and treated with six courses of VBVD, in which PET images were available for review. Uh, a single nuclear medicine physician calculated TMTV and DMAX. Median and average DMAX values were 12.5 centimeters and 15.3. In multivariate analysis, including all the demographics and clinical parameters of the enrolled patients, as well as total metabolic tumor volume and DMAX, only DMAX turned out significant in predicting relapse with a cutoff value of 16.2 centimeters and another ratio of 1.46. Upon combining DMAX and IPS, DMAX higher or lower than 16 centimeters and IPX01 versus two or more in a two-factor predictive model, three categories of patients with statistical different outcome with a P uh, uh, less than one for, uh, to, to the mean minus four have been identified. Both low DMAX and low IPS, 9%, three-year progression free survival, 100%, Either high to max and low IPS or low DMAX and high IPS, the year progression of free survival 88%, 60% of the patient. And finally, a, a considerable fraction of the patient who are third, 31%, showing both high DMAX and IPS with a three year progression of free survival of only 72%.
And as a matter of fact, you can see here the deceivingly low treatment outcome of advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma patient showing a negative interim PET scan and treated with uh, 6 ABVD at five years. The progression of free survival was only 76 in the American SWOG all, all 816. On the other hand, we were able to single out three cohort of patients with a negative interpret scan, as I mentioned to you before, and one third of them having both high DMAX and, and high IPS, two or more, had a three year progression free survival of only 72%, two deserving a very a much high, much more aggressive treatment from the baseline. Well, uh, and, PET scan, as I mentioned before, is a is a is a key of uh, of treatment uh, intensity modulation in all stages of Hodgkin lymphoma. As far as early favorable disease is concerned, you will know some uh, clinical and the demographic parameters which till now have allowed alloid to stratify the patients in favorable disease, no factor, or early unfavorable disease. Any, any, just one of those among those factors. Large mediastinal mass with, with classical bulky, age higher than 15, 50 uh, years, extranodal disease, uh, erythrocyte sedimentation ratio higher than 50 or 40 according to different uh, criteria, and three or four, uh, more, more than three or four uh, involved in nodal region. And here you have an example of the first, which was tri uh, trial, which was launched seven years, which was published, uh, sorry, seven, seven years ago, in which early stage one, two, eight, non-bulky Hodgkin lymphoma without extra nodal sites were enrolled. Briefly, six, uh, two hundreds were enrolled for uh, 420. And 20 had the negative interim PET scan after three ABVD. Those patients were randomly assigned to involved free radiotherapy or nofarter therapy, while patients with a positive interim PET scan kept straight on with ABVD for one more cycle and then underwent uh, involved free radiotherapy to a 30 gray. The trial was powered for uh, to show a, a non inferiority of patients treated with chemo alone with an inferiority margin of minus 7% compared to the result obtained after combined modality treatment. In this trial, the combined modality treatment achieved 94.6%, and three year progression free survival was 87.6%, which fell a stride the, 90, the, 90, the 95 percent confidence intervals of patients treated with uh, uh, chemo alone. So the end point was not met. The chemo alone was not in was could not uh, uh, define it as non-inferior to combined modality. On the other hand, survival was was much higher for patient treated with chemo alone. To the raising the question whether uh, all the patients should be treated with combined modality from the beginning. Another example is the H10 trial. You know that you know it very well, which was published again uh, five years ago. Uh, briefly, patients in a favorable subgroup were treated with a standard approach, three cycle of chemotherapy uh, plus uh, involved nodal radiotherapy, whatever was the results of interim PET scan after two ABVD. And the, in, in experimental arm, patients were treated with two ABVD and interim PET scan was performed afterward. Patients with a negative PET scan had entered the non inferiority design we, we combine, compared to combined modality and were treated with two more ABVD, while patients with uh, uh, positive interim PET scan entered a superiority design and were treated with two BCOP escalated plus involved in other radiotherapy. And uh, the results, uh, the, the trial was powered for, to show a non-inferiority of a uh, margin of 10% for patients treated with chemo alone versus combined modality. The end point was not reached. And uh, the superiority of BCO plus involved nodal radiotherapy could be claimed compared to standard ABVD plus involved nodal. Here, more recently, a different approach uh, by the German Hodge Lymphoma Study Group, briefly, uh, 100, uh, uh, sorry, 1,000 patients with early favorable disease, 1 to A, 2A without, uh, without uh, 
or poor uh, adverse prognostic factors. They were uh, randomly allocated to standard modality of treatment to a BVD plus involved nodal versus a pet driven modality in which uh, after uh, two cycles of chemotherapy where patients were addressed to no further therapy if interim PET was negative or involved nodal radiotherapy. Again, uh, the, if the, if the non inferiority was set at uh, 10 points less than combined modality treatment. And here again, the end point was not reached as the uh, results 86 uh, the point, uh, point one percent uh, had 95 percent confidence intervals falling astride the difference on, on the on the end point. So the, the primary end point was not met. More recently, uh, the metabolic tumor volume was proposed as the, the pre important predictive uh, prognostic factor in early stage favorable Hodgkin lymphoma. You can see here the breakdown of 249 patients with stage 1 to 2B enrolled in the H H10 trial. And you can see here how interim PET scan was able to single out to two cohort of patients the two upper curves showing a negative interim PET scan versus the two lower curves shows a positive interim PET scan. So interim PET scan turned out the most significant predictive factor. However, metabolic tumor volume was able to single out two different categories of patients, both in PET2 negative strata and in PET2 positive strata with a different outcome. And the authors concluded that low risk patients had low metabolic tumor volume and an interim negative PET and interim PET negative after two cycles of a BVD, while the other, other three categories had a high risk, a high risk um, uh, outcome. The, the low risk had the 95%, while the high risk had the much lower outcome. Based on this observation, the, the trial, uh, the, the, the rafting trial, radiotherapy free in, uh, in good prognosis Hodgkin lymphoma, was launched to be among Poland, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, chaired by myself. And the patients in early stage 1 and 2A non bulky were stratified according to the chemotherapy, treated according to uh, treated to chemothera uh, chemotherapy alone according to the following criteria modified URTC criteria. MTV value at baseline and interim PET after two ABVD. Low risk, favorable according to the modified URTC criteria, low metabolic tumor volume, negative interim PET scan, high risk, PET2 positive, uh, either PET2 positive or high metabolic, uh, meta metabolic tumor volume. And intermediate risk, like low risk patient, but with unfavorable modified ORTC criteria. Besides, another group, their patients relapsed after ABVD alone. Those patients will uh, uh, showing a disease recurrence with limited relapse will be uh, are addressed to involve another radiotherapy on demand, followed by nivolumab for 24 doses. Here you can see briefly that the trial patients are treated with two ABVD and, uh, uh, and an interim PET scan is performed. Patients with a negative interim PET scan and low metabolic tumor volume, if they are early favorable, stop here the treatment. If they are early unfavorable, continue with two more ABVD. And then they are addressed to the stringent follow up with cell free DNA assay every, every three months for three years. On the other hand, uh, patients with poor prognosis uh, with a, show, a positive interim PET scan or negative interim PET scan, high metabolic tumor volume, continue with tumor ABVD, go to involve another radiotherapy, and uh, continue with full nivolumab maintenance for 24 doses. Those patients are treated with a triple association of chemo, uh, radio, and immunotherapy. Patients are addressed to street monitoring with by cell-free DNA. If cell-free DNA reappears or, or increases, patients undergo PET scan. And if a PET scan is positive, they are addressed to involve a nodal followed by nivolumab. 
And here you can see the frequency of monitoring of cell-free DNA every three months for the first year, every six months for the second year. In case of cell-free DNA reappearance of increased patients are addressed to radiotherapy followed by nivolumab. What about early unfavorable patients? Here again, the H10 trial. You can see here again, here in a standard arm, patients are treated with four ABVD plus involved in other radiotherapy. Patients with a negative interim PET scan are addressed to a non inferiority design to, uh, com compared to uh, standard treatment. Patients with a positive interim PET scan escalated to BCOP escalated, followed by an involved nodal. And here you see PET2 negative versus standard uh, arm treated with came alone. There was a, a slightly inferiority, but uh, not non -inf but the non inferiority uh, uh, endpoint was met. On the other hand, patients with a positive interim PET scan switching to BCOP escalated had, had a much higher um, uh, chance of cure compared to standard BVD plus involved node. A more modern approach has now been uh, proposed by the German Hodgkin Lymphoma Study Group in H1017 for early unfavorable patients. Briefly, our 1,100 patients were randomly assigned to two BCOP escalated and ABVD followed by involved free radiotherapy, standard arm, versus an experimental arm in which after the same chemotherapy and end of therapy PET scan that, that drove the treatment. Patients with a negative uh, end of treatment PET scan were addressed to randomly addressed to no further therapy or involved in other radiotherapy. And you can see here the comparison between, uh, no, sorry, this was not a random, a patient with an end of therapy PET scan showing a negative PET scan were addressed to no further therapy, while patients with a positive end of therapy PET scan were addressed to involved in node radiotherapy. And you can see here no difference at all between the, the arm, the standard arm, and the experimental arm. And this was a great achievement, as the German colleagues concluded that after two big of escalated, the two ABVD radiotherapy was no longer necessary in those kind of patients. But uh, advanced stage disease. Here you can see again the PET-driven approach in uh, in the patient 2B to 4B in the upper study, Italian GTL field of six. Sorry, in the upper study, uh, the the British Rattle trial patient from stage 2A to A with with unfavorable criteria prognostic factors to to 4B. And in the bottom, the Italian study, GTL filler 6 or 7, in, in which patients to, to B to 4B were enrolled. Briefly, patients with a, interim, a positive interim PET scan after two ABVD were addressed to, to uh, uh, four cycles of BCO, BCOP, uh, BCO21 or BCOP14, and, uh, uh, and end of therapy PET. While in the Italian study, the patients were randomly addressed to four uh, BCOP escalated plus four BCOP baseline or the same regimen supplemented with rituximab. On the other hand, patients with a negative interim PET scan continued with four ABVD or four AVD in the British trial or four ABVD in the, in the Italian trial and then went randomly uh, allocated to radiotherapy or nofarter therapy. Uh, and here you can see on the right uh, that, uh, um, um, sorry, try to eliminate this. Okay, just to put here. Uh, you can see here that uh, patients with a treated uh, with a negative interpret scan who continued with a BVD at the three year progression free survival around 85 to 87 percent, while patients with a negative uh, with a positive interpret scan switching to BCOP escalated had a three year progression free survival ranging between 60 and 70, 67. When, when, when you compare the, those results, results with the Echelon 1 phase 3 trial enrolling 1,300 patients all around the world in, two, in 280 institutions, 
uh, uh, comparing standard ABVD for six courses versus A plus AVD, in which uh, bleomycin was taken over by Atsetris, 1.2 uh, milligrams by kilo every 15 days. You can see, uh, you can try to compare the results of pet adapted strategy versus non pet adapted strategies. And you can see here that patients enrolled in the, in the, in the experimental arm of the echelon one trial treated with A plus AVD showing a negative interim PET scan here have a three year progression free, had a three year progression free survival quite superimposable to patients continuing with ABVD. Uh, while on the other hand, patient showing a positive interim PET scan seemed to try to, to get some benefit from uh, the uh, bleomycin substitution with Atsetris in terms of three year progression free survival. 69, uh, Per, uh, percent versus uh, uh, versus uh, um, 67 or 60% in the uh, English and Italian trial. In the German uh, study group, on the other hand, concentrated in the issue of downgrading treatment after in, in CH in the, after a start of treatment with two B cop B cop escalated. So the, in the HT18 trial, they both proposed a treatment escalation in PET to positive and treatment downgrading in PET to negative. But if we concentrate on the PET to negative arm, we, uh, the, the, we can show the results in terms of three year and five year estimate of uh, progression free survival. And you can see here uh, that uh, patient treated with six, eight or six big of escalate had the, uh, the same, even if not inferior outcome compared to patient treated with four sequels alone. And the authors concluded that uh, 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 abbreviated treatment could be offered for patients with a negative interim PET scan after two big of escalate. Uh, similar to the German study, the French HL to, uh, 2000, uh, 2011, which uh, was updated quite recently at ASH, uh, con, uh, con, uh, who, uh, in which uh, a standard approach with BCOP escalated was compared to a PET-driven treatment in which after two BCOP escalated cycles, patients showing a negative entry in PESCAN downgraded the treatment with four more ABVD. And you can see here on the left that no difference at all in terms of uh, progression free survival at three years was noted between patients treated with a standard BCOP regimen versus standard uh, versus BCOP followed by downgrading to ABVD impact to negative patients. What about the role of PET in guiding consolidation radiotherapy in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma? And I want to present a case, a clinical case, a male aged 30 year, uh, 38 year was admitted for B symptoms and cough and the PET CT showed enlarged cervical and supracravular nodes and the mediastinal bulky of 13 for 11 centimeter. Bone marrow traffic biopsy was negative and the patient was staged to be bulky and IPS2. The patient uh, was in complete metabolic response after six ABVD, and both interim and PET and, and, and end of therapy PET were negative. He was randomized in the, in the nofarter therapy arm of the HD or 607 trial that demonstrated no benefit for consolidation radiotherapy in patients showing a negative and a final. And uh, sorry, a negative, a negative interim and final PET. You can see here this uh, uh, large nodal mass, uh, uh, large bulky mediastinal mass in the fused images and in the PET images. And if you consider all the 296 patients enrolled in this uh, trial, no difference at all for observers in terms of six year progression free survival and overall survival. 
And the same held true if you consider different size of, uh, um, of, of mass detected at baseline, 5 to 7 centimeters, 7 to 10, and plus than 10 centimeters, no difference at all between patients addressed to consolidation radiotherapy or no further therapy. And the same was, uh, was observed by the German uh, colleagues in the HD15 trial. Briefly, advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma patients were treated with different regimens of BCOP escalated. They underwent restaging with CT scan in presence of uh, uh, residual disease uh, um, and uh, uh, higher or equal to uh, um, uh, five centimeters, and uh, they, um, they uh, underwent end of therapy PET CT. If the PET CT was negative, patients were addressed only to follow up as they did the patients showing no residual mass at the end of therapy, while patients showing a positive end of therapy PET scan were addressed to consolidation radiotherapy. You can see here that one third of the patient had a residual mass and one and a three quarter of this third had a positive PET scan, uh, sorry, a three quarter of this third had a negative PET, PET end of therapy PET, while one quarter had a positive end of therapy PET, which means then well, one quarter, one quarter to one of one third, only 12% of the patient uh, were exposed to consolidation radiotherapy thanks to the, the help, thanks to the contribution of end of therapy PET CT. Finally, I want to address the issue of the of the immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, treatment and the role of PET during this treatment. Here you can see another case of a patient which was admitted for uh, uh, advanced stage heart lymphoma. He was treated with two ABVD cycles and interim PETs was performed. Uh, the, the question was whether this patient could be classified as a, a Deauville 4 or 5. Uh, the the PET2 was scored 4 and the patient switched to BCOP escalated four cycles to BCOP baseline two cycles in HD or 6 or 7 trial. A third PET uh, at the end of therapy showed a complete metabolic response. Patient remained in continuous complete remission for eight months till July 2015, when the first of launch series of relapses was recorded. The first relapse was again in the cervical and right, and the right mediastinal nodes. Patient was treated with brentaximab vedotin, 1.8 mg by kilo every 15 days, followed by conditioning with FIM and autologous cells and transplant. PET CT showed the partial metabolic response. The patient, as soon as donor was available, the patient went straight to allo stem cell transplant from an HLA matched sibling, and PET CT showed the complete metabolic response. One month later, uh, uh, the, the patient experienced a second relapse again in supraclavear and right cervical nodes. He was treated with four cycles of brentaximab vedotin, in an interim PET scan after four cycles showed a complete metabolic response. The patient consolidated the, 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 the response with more 12, 12 more cycles. In stayed in remission for eight months. When the third relapse, he exactly in the same patient of the sec in the same sites of the second relapse were noted, and he was treated with consolidation radiotherapy and of therapy PET end of after radiotherapy showed complete metabolic response. And five months later, he, uh, the patient experienced the fourth relapse, but in the opposite site of the of the of the chest in the left paraortic mediastinal node and in the pylorus region. Uh, and he started therapy with immune checkpoint inhibitors, nivolumab, 240 milligrams every 15 days. A three PET scans were performed during the first 14 months of treatment, which were negative. 
a PET CT on months plus 19 of development treatment showed the reappearance of a mild focal FDG attack in the left paraortic mediastinal nodes pre previously recorded. I, I think you, you see if you can see those focal uptake here. The latter persists in the following four scans with waxing and waning FTG avidity. You see here the SUE uh, picked up to eight and then declined again to four as it was at the beginning. Uh, and uh, the last observation uh, which was made in September 2020 in the patient was in complete metabolic response. Those, this pattern of uh, waxing and waning in a single node, it corresponds to Leary criteria IR3, in which uh, an FTG uptake in one or more lesion at any time during treatment without a concomitant increase in lesion size or number could be recorded and is compatible with uh, treatment response. In conclusion, the introduction of PET-CT for Hodgkin lymphoma stage allowed to drop the last invasive staging tool, the bone marrow trephine biopsy, and improved the overall accuracy in detecting tumor spread compared to contrast enhanced CT scan. MTV and DMAX are promising tools to portray tumor burden and spread in baseline PET. PET adapted strategy in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma during frontline ABVD or BCOP escalated are now a standard of care in some countries all around the world. Consolidation radiotherapy could be safely omitted in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma and the negative end of therapy PET after BCOP escalated or ABVD. And standard Lugano 2014 criteria for lymphoma staging are not applicable for response assessment in Hodgkin lymphoma treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And I want to uh, thank all of you for your kind attention. And I will be happy to take questions. Thank you, Professor Galamini, for this insightful uh, presentation and uh, updated uh, talk on the beta-driven uh, management of Hodgkin lymphomas. Now we open the floor for questions from the audience. If there is any question. This is... Can you hear me? Yes, 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 I can. Yeah. And the disease distance. How do you take the dimension between the two maximum intensity or any intensity or SUV? You, you may take it in consideration. No, uh, uh, before measuring the, the, the tumor distance, you have to segment to delineate and segment the, 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 the sites of PET-CT uh, positive FTG uptake. So in other words, you have to make the same procedure for metabolic tumor volume computing, and then the software uh, applicated measures all the, 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 the pairs of lesion in all the bodies. And, uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, there, are, there is a, a, a reference level, which is the median of the all the distance in the in the patients and, uh, and in this case as i showed you it was 16.2 centimeters and then patients having a higher a higher uh, value than this cutoff had a worse outcome which is uh, uh, and uh, which is uh, remarkable because this was the only parameters able to predict uh, treatment outcome in PET to negative patients. And uh, if this data will be confirmed, uh, tumor distance will be ready to take over classical anarbo staging for first line uh, treatment planning in advanced stage Hodgkin lymphoma. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Galamini, I have. Yes. Just a question or a comment now in most of these trials, uh, I believe that it was uh, the devil, devil score one, two and three was negative, maybe apart from the German trial when they considered the negative, it was devil score one and two. Uh, now, how do you 
deal with this in the real life practice? Do you consider the Let's call it three as negative bit. Yeah, yes, this is the, the according to, to the Lugano 2014. This is the star standard criteria for a negative PET scan interim uh, uh, interim and end of therapy score one, two and three. And uh, as far as end of therapy is concerned, I have to say that uh, patients showing a single residual mass and showing a score four, in some cases, uh, do uh, do uh, show a decrease in FDG intensity of uptake as time goes by, and there was a study in which sixty percent of patients showing a single residual mass scored quatre, uh, scored four had a negative biopsy. So, in other words, patients with an end of therapy PET uh, scored four in which the FDG uptake concentrate in a single mass should be taken very cautiously because this could be a false positive result. Totally agree with you, thank you. And uh, you mentioned this in your summary slide, but just would like to stress this point again. Outside of a clinical trial, and in most of the, I would say, the state of the institutions in the Western world, I think now the bit driven management of lymphoma is the real life there, yes? Yes, yes, this is now the, the standard of care uh, in, in several uh, European and uh, not only uh, also uh, American countries as uh, patients with a positive PET scan switched from 20, uh, three year progression free survival range between 20 and 30 to 60, 67. So this was a major advance for uh, PET to positive patient. Uh, I, 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 I am personally a little bit proud, if I can say, to having proposed for this parameter, and uh, I received several questions why you haven't never planned a randomized study in which patients with a positive interim PET scan continued with ABVD, while other uh, uh, could sh swift switch switch to be escalated because this was considered unethical. So, from the standard point of view, there is no proof that uh, there is a, 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 this is an imp this, this is a steady steady uh, improvement of the treatment. But if you if you consider the progression free survival of all all the patients together, this was superior to the, the, the one of patients treated with standard ABVD for six cycles in a non-interim pet adapted strategy. Uh, thanks a lot. From my side, I don't see any more questions and I put then the floor to Dr. Rola to conclude on this session. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Andrea. I think we conclude our session for uh, tonight and our day. Uh, thank you very much for attending our lectures and see you tomorrow. Good night. Okay, good night. Good night to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.